chief guest, Dr. Rapi Balachandran, Assistant Director General, Nursing at Government of India, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, India. Good morning, Madam. Guest of Honor, Dr. L. Gupichandran, President, TNAI, TNAI, Delhi Branch, Associate Professor, College of Nursing, AIIMS, New Delhi, India. Our eminent keynote speakers, Dr. Kandasami M., Principal of Dharan Nursing College, India. Dr. Joy Decatoria, the Regional Director of Nursing, Abir, Medical Group, Saudi Arabia. Dr. Vimala Ramu, Senior Lecturer, University of Malaysia. Aspi Pospitarini, Program Director, ATCN, Indonesia. Welcome all for joining even during the pandemic situation and imparting your expertise with us. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all our presenters from across the globe who have spared their valuable time in, in, in enlightening us with their latest research studies. Now I would like to welcome all our attendees in joining us today. Let us welcome Mrs. Ruchi Singh Chohan, Chancellor at IDM University, India, and Dr. Dolat Singh Chohan, Pro-Chancellor, ITM University, India, to inaugurate the conference. Let us welcome Professor Dr. Sher Singh Bakar, Vice Chancellor ITM University India, to deliver the opening message for this conference. Professor? Professor Dr. Sher Singh Bakar. Right, and I would like to invite our honorable dignitaries to light right. the lamp. Huh? Oh, hi, hi, Professor. Yes. Video bande. No, bande. Please allow the video to be switched on of Professor Bakar. Oh, okay. Hold on. Go ahead, Professor. You can now share your screen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, unmuting me after a long time. Uh, you know, uh, announcing 10 times and uh, not unmuting is not right. But anyway, uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, Honorable Chancellor, Mrs. Ruchi Singh Chohanji. Honorable Pro Chancellor Dr. Dolat Singh Chohanji, the Honorable Chief Guest Dr. Rati Balachundran, Assistant Director General Nursing at Government of India, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare India, Guest of Honor Dr. Al Gop Gopichandran, President TNAI Associate 
Professor, College of Nursing, Ames, New Delhi. Uh, conference Chair, Professor Umila Bhadwaj, Dean, School of Nursing Sciences and Research, Sada University, India. And Ms. Uh, Veena Swema, Principal Rufeda, College of Nursing, Jamia Hamdard University, New Delhi. Mr. Rudra Bhanu Satpati, CEO, BioLeague Technocrat Group India. Dr. Kandap Swami, Principal, Dharan College of Nursing India. Our Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Ashun Keed Kursi. Registrar ITM University, Dr. Omvir Singhji. And all the deans, HODs, participants in the conference, I welcome you all in the inaugural session of the International Conference on Nursing Science in Healthcare, being jointly organized by SN, SFNP, Nursing Science uh, uh, and Healthcare Conference, being or jointly organized by SFNP and uh, School of Nursing Science, ITM University, Gwalior. As we all know, uh, please don't play with the uh, my mute uh, uh, muting and muting. <clears throat> you can do all of this. Please leave the speaker unmuted. Right. Uh, as we all know, nursing plays an important role in healthcare through identification of disease, prevention of disease, treatment of disease, post-treatment rehabilitation, and restoration to good health. These are important areas for uh, uh, good health for everyone, and uh, not only uh, for ones who are actually getting admitted in the hospitals, et cetera, but also uh, when the nurses help people uh, in their day-to-day -day activities, when they are called upon uh, to nurse elderly people and so on. So, the total gamut of activities in which the uh, nursing in uh, the world actually associate are diverse and large. The contribution of Indian researchers in overall research has, has been pretty low in, in uh, international journals. Uh, if we look at overall, uh, we've been contributing uh, about 1.5% to 2% in different areas of uh, uh, research, wherein our population uh, is about 17.5% of the world population. Only recently, la in last two years, two to three years, the contribution has increased uh, to about 6% in last two years, which is quite significant and uh, is laudable. But if you look at uh, contribution of nursing science in this overall uh, total publications, it is still abysmal. So therefore, in that context, conferences such as this, that uh, for in which we are the part today, play a major role in promoting research in the area of nursing science. The conference uh, helps participants in network with others, understand what kind of research is going on, what kind of areas every researcher can pick up for further research, collaborate with others on different research areas, and get opportunity to publish in journals that are associated with such conferences, which become slightly easier 
then getting published in open uh, source journals. Uh, generally, we find that the uh, journals that are called open source are generally paid journals. That means the researcher has to pay uh, for uploading uh, the research or for getting the research published. And uh, uh, looking at the uh, pay packages in India the, of the nursing practitioners, uh, it becomes extremely difficult for them to uh, actually uh, pay and then get published. So uh, the only area which actually remains uh, you know, uh, suitable for them uh, would be such conferences wherein the uh, journals are also associated or the journals that actually publish free. So in that context, this uh, conference, which is number of journals associated with it is going to contribute a long way uh, by providing a opportunity to the uh, researchers to publish their research in good journals. The paradigm of health research have been constantly evolving, shifting and changing over the years with the implications for nursing research. Nurse academics in India need to critically analyze and get engaged in research and develop strategies to contribute towards an evidence-based that is contextually relevant for nursing practice. Education and management through collaborative research. The opportunities for health research are varied and multifaceted today, ranging from infectious disease to multimorbidity with significant scope for practitioners and nurse academics to become an integral part of research team, both nationally and internationally to make meaningful contributions. Researchers are required to navigate new frontiers such as interdisciplinary, patient public involvement and co-production in their research to demonstrate impact of the academic societal levels and beyond. The current digital age requires researchers to upskill their digital literacy to be able to fully exploit the potential that it offers towards global connectivity for interdisciplinary research engagement and knowledge exchange. In fact, what has uh, happened in recent years is that healthcare research, which was uh, basically dependent on uh, data analysis uh, uh, through uh, the data analysis that was collected through uh, the experiments has moved on and uh, a lot of uh, behavioral issues are uh, being added to uh, the research that is being carried out in healthcare. Uh, in, uh, with that, that this uh, conference will uh, uh, provide a platform to uh, researchers, not only to present their work, but also get an opportunity to publish in good journals. Uh, with that, wishing uh, this conference great success. And uh, uh, we would also like to take this, I would like to take this opportunity to thank SFNP to consider School of Nursing, ITM University Gwalior for hosting this uh, annual conference. Thank you very much. It's our pleasure, I, I, Professor. Thank you, Jojo. Thank you so much. All right, and now um, I'd like to welcome our conference convener, Professor Mini Anil, the Dean, School of Nursing, Nursing Sciences, ITM University, Gwalior, India, to deliver the welcome address. Professor? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Honorable, good morning. Honorable Founder Chancellor, Sri Ramashankar Singh Ji, Chancellor, Madam, Mrs. Rushi Ching Chauhan, Pro Chancellor, Dr. Jola Singh Chauhan Ji, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Shea Singh Bhakar Ji, Prof, uh, Pro Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, Narayan Khetkar Ji, Registrar, Dr. Omvi Singh Ji, Honorable Chief Guest, Dr. Radit Balachandran, 
eminent speaker from various countries, faculties, delegates, and dear students. I, Professor Mini Anil, Dean SONS, also the convener for this conference, welcome you all on the behalf of ITM University. I hope you all are doing well. Today, we have gathered here for the third international conference on nursing science and health, uh, health, which is associated with society of nursing practice in virtual mode. This theme of the conference, the theme of the conference is reforming healthcare system, transition of clinical research into clinical practice. On this occasion, I especially welcome our chief guest, Dr. Radhi Balachandran, who is the Assistant Director General in Government of India, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare India. Nursing conferences enable nurses to learn about a wide range of educational advancement in one location. These conferences are considered as one step opportunity to, to be updated with most recent innovations and procedures in the field of nursing. This today conference will focus majorly on research and development in the field of nursing healthcare. This conference provides a platform for the exchange of expertise and experience in the area of nursing and healthcare. I am sure that this conference will provide ample opportunities to network with, with and meet nursing professionals from all over the world. The conference will eminent speaker from the diverse background who will share and dissect the cutting edge research efforts used in betterment of mankind and healthcare system. You also shall have the opportunity to share your ideas and experience and present research work by presentations. This conference also helps in establishing new collaborations and widening uh, professional contacts. Our university always encourages all such kinds of conferences and workshops for the welfare of the students as well as for the faculty. Okay, right. Conference. I hope this conference turns out to be enlightening and fruitful for all. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Professor. And now let's proceed with the lighting of the lamp for our dignitaries. Right, thank you. Now let's uh, welcome our honorable dignitary, Professor Dr. Santosh Kishan Narayan Kedkar, Pro Vice Chancellor, ITM University, India, to deliver the opening message for this conference. Professor? Yeah, am I audible? <clears throat> yes, you are. Nahi jnane na sadrusham pavitrami ha vidyate tat swayam yoga sam siddha kale natmani vindati. Bhagavad Gita chapter 4, verse 38. In this world, wisdom is the great purifier. A person who has controlled his senses and thus perfected himself in yoga 
will realize this truth within himself in course of time very good morning to you all thank you jojo meho for your kind introduction chief guest dr rathi balchandran guest of honor dr l gopi chandran honorable chairs keynote speakers from india and abroad honorable honorable singh chavan honorable pro chancellor dr daulat singh chavan honorable vice chancellor dr s s bakar registrar dr omvir singh dean sons conference convener professor mini conference organizing secretary professor sudarani all the deans heads faculty members staff members and my dear students before we start on behalf of university i extend love care and support to all the delegates of the international conference on nursing <laughs> and healthcare with team reforming healthcare systems transition of clinical research into clinical practice please accept my regards and respect to all the nursing team throughout the world for working and serving at the cost of their own life and health of their family during the covid last year so yeah 2020 till day azadi ka amrit mahotsav ki aap sabhi ko hardik shubhkamnaein i congratulate school of nursing science itm university and society for nursing practices sfnf np for jointly organizing this third international conference at itm university gwalior warm welcome from itm university which is known for celebrating dreams and converting them into reality utilizing the opportunities and facility beautiful campuses full of nature including the national bird peacock on the campus chirping and dancing makes learning a pleasure the paintings and sculptures in the campus helps boost the innovation among the students and faculty itm university gwalior was born out of innate passion to develop unique scholastic ecosystem to celebrate dreams with a touch of difference the mhrd ugc have recognized itm for innovative pedagogy called abca activity based continuous learning assessment and idea pad incubation center which rolled out more than two dozen startups with annual turnover of more than several crores university initiated abca and pbl project based learning implemented as part of cbcs curriculum reforms to drive the students towards the out of box thinking ability outcome based education and competency based learning makes the students say i want to go to university than saying i have to go to university with 14 schools on campus we have golden opportunity for collaborative research and experience the magic of synergy interdisciplinary research is encouraged for solar drones autonomous electric vehicles iot 5g ai ml robotics and industry 4.0 related projects the end product of education should be a free creative man who can battle against historical circumstances and adversities of nature let us focus on these words of dr sarvapalli radhakrishnan remember knowledge has to be improved challenged and increased constantly or it vanishes as stated by dr peter drucker the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity the optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty winston churchill when you want something from heart all the universe conspires to 
helping you in, to achieve it. Polo Coelho, author of the Alchemist, translated in Hindi, कहते हैं अगर किसी चीज को दिल से चाहो तो पूरी कायनात उसे तुम्हें मिलाने की कोशिश में लग जाती है I am confident that this conference will give a platform for understanding and sharing of the ideas for reforming healthcare system, transition of clinical research into clinical practice. I congratulate all of you for fighting pandemic COVID-19 and emerging victorious. Stay safe and take care of yourself. Follow all the COVID norms. Take care of your health because Zindagi na mile dobara. Thank you very much for your time. Let me conclude with the famous quote of Robert Frost. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. God bless. Love you all. Jai Hind, Jai IPM. Thank you. This is from my side. Thank you so much, Professor. Next, I just welcome our honorable dignitary, Professor Dr. Santosh Kishan Narayan. Oh, sorry. Professor Dr. Sudarani Banapagudar. Professor School of Nursing, ITM University, India, to address this gathering. Good morning. Yes, yes. Yes, Professor. Namaste and Jai Bharat. On the behalf of School of Nursing Sciences, ITM University, welcome you all to the third international conference on nursing science and healthcare, which is organized in association with Society for Nursing Practices. It is an indeed and a pleasure and an honor to organize the conference of such a great magnitude in our ITM University School of Nursing Sciences, Gallia. Our university is a top ranked university in the country and as well as in our state, Madhya Pradesh. I'm indeed grateful for responding faith in us. I thank our co-founder, Ramashankar uh, Sir, and our chancellor, ma'am, Ruchi Singh Chawan, for making me the part of this ITM University family. The organization of this conference has been made possible by the continuous effort by our founder, um, our sir, uh, Dr. Dalat Singh Chawan, pro-chancellor, sir. It is a great effort and the support and a continuous guidance of our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sir, Dr. Shea Singh Bakar, Sir, and Pro Vice Chancellor, Sir, Dr. Narayan Singh Kedkar, Sir, Registrar, Dr. Omri Singh Kedkar, Sir, ITM University. Thank you so much, Sir, for providing me an opportunity. Under the continuous effort and the guidance from our School of Nursing Science Dean, Professor Mini Anil, cooperation from all my esteemed faculty members led me to stand before you today for this successful event. While Gwalior is known for its place of temples, the royal charm of the Gwalior, it is reflected through its striking architecture. Excuse me, ma'am, please unmute. Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. <laughs> for sparing the time and guiding us. We will abide by your guiding principles, ma'am. We are honored by the presence of Dr. L. Gopi Chandran, sir, President, Trained Nurses Association of India, Delhi branch, Associate Professor, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi, who is today one among us. We are fortunate to have the academic partners from the various universities from the country. I hope the conference hopefully giving you a memorable event during the third international conference 2021. Thank you. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat.
Thank you, Professor. And now let us welcome our normal chief guest, Dr. Ra Ravi Balachandran, Assistant Director General Nursing at the Government of India, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, India, to address this gathering. Doctor, oh, doctor. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Namaskar. This is Ruchi Singh Chauhan, Dr. Daulat Singh Chauhan, Professor Mini Anil, Professor Dr. Shur Singh Bakkar, Professor Dr. Santosh Kishan, Professor Dr. Sudharani, Dr. L. Gopi Chantra, Professor Urmil Bharatwaj, Professor Veena Sharma, Professor Kanteswami, and um, Mr. Rudra Banu, the speakers and all the participants. First of all, let me congratulate all the nurses for the year of nursing and midwifery 2020, as well as for the victory over the pandemic COVID-19. I also salute the sacrifice made by the family members of these nurses in making this victory. We are proud of the nurses and the other healthcare providers in their contribution in controlling COVID-19 pandemic. I congratulate the organizers for tailoring such a good program involving the experts all across the world uh, to have an international conference. And the third one is hosted in India. So I congratulate the organizers for that. As we all know that nursing is the backbone or the pillar and the largest healthcare professionals in the team who has a pivotal role to achieve the health for all as well as universal health coverage. For that, nurses has to take the lead in the core areas that is promoting health, prevention of illness, restoration of health, and alleviate suffering, which we have very well experienced during the last pandemic. This requires more and more empowered nurses and the independent roles of the nurses by competent, confident nurses. So such conferences give us the opportunity for bringing the evidences and come out with more and more nursing knowledge which contributes towards promoting health and alleviate suffering. So I wish all the participants a great learning experience, interact well, have good, in, good networking, and effectively sharpen your competencies so that together we can achieve universal health coverage. Government of India is very much convinced about the role nurses can do to achieve this goal, at the same time to make India a healthy place. So the, there are opportunities to work as community health officers under Ayushman Bharat in all health and wellness centers. There are opportunities to work as to run midwife-led units and also nurse-led units to control non-communicable disease, non -communicable diseases. This, this pandemic also has shown that there is a great responsibility in us to control the spread of infection. And another area which has emerged is infection control prevention practices and patient safety as a lead in, by the nurses. So I wish all the participants to contribute effectively by, by good interaction and also bring those evidences to
put those evidences into practice and best practices be shared through these conferences so that the nursing practice can be improved and transformed for the safety of the public. I congratulate all the organizers for bringing this event during the pandemic through a blended program so that you can have both the emphasis of presence of conference as well as virtually you can connect with the experts all across the country and the world. So I wish this conference a great success. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sucker. I would like to welcome our guest of honor, Dr. Al Gupichandran, the president of CNAI Delhi Branch, Associate Professor, College of Nursing, AIIMS, New Delhi, India, to unveil the conference theme and conference proceedings book. Doctor? Uh, thank you. Uh, today, our chief guest, Dr. Radhi Balachandran, Madam, the Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, ITM University, CEO, MD, for Society for Nursing Practice, all dignitaries, organizing team members, chair from various academic institutions, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to congratulate for organizing such a wonderful conference that is third international conference on nursing science and practice. And thanking you for inviting me for unfolding the conference theme. That's a wonderful theme. The theme of the conference is, as I already mentioned, that the reforming the healthcare system and transition of the clinical research into clinical practice. As Radhi Madam already mentioned that all know that COVID made us to suffer a lot physically, mentally. But still, today, government of India realized that achieving equity, accessible, and affordability of the health of every citizen during crisis situation, not possible to then without contribution of nurses. That is, nurses are today more visible in terms of their contribution at all level of care in healthcare delivery system. Currently, Government of India has taken a lot of initiative to strengthen our healthcare system, which was tested more during the, especially in the second wave of the COVID. And for the Government of India today, investing a lot on healthcare resources, especially the capacity building for nurses and also the healthcare, all personnel, for especially for preparing and training of nurses at all level, primary and secondary and tertiary level. Other side, Nurses are providing quality initiative and improve the patient care outcome through standard of care or evidence-based nursing care with engagement of quality research work by nurses today. And uh, you see that in conference today, happy to see that many oral presentation in the conference on various clinical problem addressed by young nurse researcher. The same problem and the area will be further explored by the research in future. That will be applied into the practice to overcome the gap between the clinical research and the clinical practice, which is existing today, what India is facing, especially in the healthcare system. That's called only, we can say that transitional clinical research. And I strongly believe that with the leadership of Mr. Rudra, CEO in Society for Nursing Practice, with partnering with the many institutions, how he is doing across the globe, even he is coming up the many conference for conducting and initiating also, is initiating quality nursing journals with indexed, with the mini database. That is going to be the, it's empower the nurses and nurses come up with a very quality research work and be able to practice to improve the patient care outcome. Once again, I congratulate the organizing team and from the SNV, also from ITM University and all academic partners for coming out the best conference and in the future too. Thanking you once again. Thank you so much, doctor. 
Now I would like to welcome our conference chair, Professor Ormila Barawaj, Dean, School of Nursing Sciences and Research, Sharda University, India, to address the gathering. Professor Ermila Barawaj. All right, and let us welcome our conference chair, Ms. Veena Sharma, Principal Rufaida College of Nursing, Jaima Hamdard Dean TV University, New Delhi, India. To address the gathering, Good morning to all eminent nursing colleagues here for the conference, Dr. Bala Chandran. I'm delighted to be part of this third international conference on nursing science and healthcare being organized by ITN University Gwalior, Society for Nursing Practice, BioLeaks, Jamia Hamdard, and other academic research and media partners. The theme of the conference is Reforming Healthcare Systems Transition of Clinical Research into Clinical Practice. And that is a very aptly chosen theme. Clinical nursing search is a systematic inquiry for the problems encountered in nursing practice and in modalities of patient care. Nursing care rendered to patients should be based on the best available evidence. Knowledge and evidence derived from robust and systematic research should drive nursing practice decisions and change to improve the way we deliver nursing care. Translating research evidence to clinical practice is essential to safe, cost-effective, and efficient healthcare services and meeting the expectations of the patients, families, and society. However, translating nursing research into nursing practice is challenging. There are well-established barriers to conduct and translation of research evidence planning and strategies to address the complexity of healthcare systems. I hope these two days international conference today and tomorrow delineates practical evidence-based informed suggestions to overcome the barriers and facilitate enablers of knowledge transition. Uh, knowledge translation is the process through which research knowledge is created, circulated and adopted into clinical practice. If we were to bring about reforms in the current, we will have to reduce this gap between researchers and knowledge users. I wish all the organizers and delegates of the conference the very best and hope that by the end of the conference, we would be able to develop understandings about the multifaceted process of knowledge translation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Ms. Sharma. And now I would like to welcome our very own Mr. Rudra Banu Satpathy, the CEO of the Technic Group, India, to deliver and welcome and provide a welcome message for the conference. Sir, good morning. Good morning, Joseph. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a warm welcome to one and all uh, the delegates, speakers, and all elite professionals, as well as the leaders of nursing professions, as well as all our dignitaries, ladies, gentlemen, and my beloved colleagues and students, those who have added sugar to this conference. Third International Conference on Nursing Science and Healthcare is not only a conference, but it has become our responsibility and to partner with institutions and universities to make this conference a productive one, a contributing one, 
and one one which helps to promulgate the vision of knowledge sharing and promulgate the ideas of developing a well connected network of nursing professionals and midwife institutions all across the globe <clears throat> the previous series the second international conference on nursing sciences and healthcare was organized by society for nursing practices in association with and at srm university chennai and we are also in search of responsible universities those who are ready to take the leadership towards the upcoming conference series of nursing sciences and healthcare and the third series was uh, organized is being organized by itm university gwalior india i express my hearty gratitude to the management uh, and the esteemed faculties of itm university gwalior for their uh, support and uh, for their faith and uh, believe and uh, trust on society for nursing practices and thus giving us the privilege to host this esteemed conference <clears throat> at this elite university so itm university is one of the leader in central and northern part of india that is bringing academic and scientific revolution and providing quality professionals and academic services knowledge and technical skills i am really grateful to uh, the faculties and the uh, students as well as the management of itm university for their determination in contributing towards academics and especially the institution for the nursing science is a budding one and i believe will be the epicenter of knowledge in upcoming days i also <coughs> express my hearty gratitude to sarda university chitkara university and jamia hamdard islamic university for their support and partnering the conference as academic partners i express my gratitude to all the academic partners research partners scientific partners and media partners for making this conference worth of attending <coughs> respected uh, mrs ruchi singh chauhan chancellor itm university india dr daulat singh chauhan sir pro chancellor itm university india uh, professor mini anil conference convener dean school of nursing itm university india professor dr sir uh, singh baskar sir vice uh, vice chancellor itm university india dr santos uh, krishan sir pro vice chancellor itm university dr sudharani uh, uh, for uh, professor nursing uh, school of nursing itm university the organizing secretary of the conference and our esteemed chief guest uh, dr rati balachandran assistant director uh, general nursing government of india and uh, my most beloved uh, dr l gopichandran honorable uh, guest of honor president dni delhi associate professor college of nursing all in institute of medical sciences ems and most respected professor urmila bharadwaj uh, uh, the dean school of nursing from sarda university mrs vina sharma ma'am uh, principal zamia hamdard university dr kanna sami sir the keynote speakers dr joy victoria dr vimala ramu uh, asit uh, asti uh, puspita reni director at cn indonesia and uh, other keynote speakers dr punchitra r professor and vice principal dr rajini sharma dr manisha nandakumar power dr sharmila j principal college of nursing school of health science dhanan sagar dr shalwa e. sayed professor from uh, foyom university egypt and all dignitaries uh, we have uh, our esteemed uh, faculties my beloved colleague mem uh, colleagues from society for nursing practices bioleaks so uh, this year was uh, the most uh, effective year and most challenging year for all the health science professionals today uh, india is combating still combating with covid-19 pandemic and the biggest strength of the country were the nurses we realized how important the profession is and the most important thing is we have to realize how we'll streamline the knowledge sharing processes to make this profession strong and better integrated so we are uh, committed towards this as we know technoarid group is a interdisciplinary professional association we are working in field of cancer science uh, nursing neuroscience dental as well as all other all uh, healthcare sectors and allied healthcare sectors and we are reaching up the professionals with a vision of creating a proper network a proper strong interconnected interdisciplinary uh, network among health science professionals all across the globe the main vision is to connect the universities all across the globe and academic institutions 
especially nursing schools of nursing and nursing colleges all across the globe so with a vision of collaborating all these universities all these academic institutions we are rapidly partnering with uh, uh, educational institutions and nursing colleges and hospitals all across the globe so so that a integrated platform could be built up and knowledge sharing could be a easy process and we could uh, come to know about uh, the technical know hows and infrastructure and the resources of knowledge available there so i insist uh, everyone uh, uh, um, uh, to take the best out of this conference uh, we have more than 50 uh, scientific presentations by our students and faculties of different colleges and universities and we have uh, more than uh, um, uh, i think uh, nine presentations uh, uh, keynote uh, uh, talks uh, those who are going to add value to these conferences and we have more than 250 plus registrations in this conference and uh, this conference is being streamed uh, all across the globe online in our forums and platforms at this point of time when there is a demand of the ratio of 1 is to 1000 uh, ratio of uh, nurses to the total uh, population per thousand we must have at least one nurse uh, according to the norms of uh, unesco and united nation organization currently india is having the ratio of 1 is to 658 and uh, even though uh, because even though we have uh, about more than 30 lakhs nursing professionals uh, 21 lakhs uh, rn and rms and 9 lakhs auxiliary nurses even the strength is big but india is the second largest democracy and uh, uh, having 135 crores of population so this is a challenge to bring these professions and i believe uh, more and more interest of uh, health science professionals towards nursing domain should be diverted and we must create better platforms and uh, this uh, should be uh, created with better job opportunity with infrastructures and we are trying to build up the platforms and forums for research by this uh, conferences organizing this conferences we are building up the forums where we can create opportunity for industrial collaboration clinical partnership and provide better opportunity of engagement and recruitment as well as uh, implementation of the knowledge and research we do in our fields so i see nhs series will be continuing and we are also partnering uh, for our upcoming universities and we are also uh, open uh, for uh, collaborations and esteem and uh, elite university can choose uh, i see nhs conference series to be hosted in their campus and uh, i also uh, insist um, everyone uh, to uh, make the conference a valuable one and uh, uh, we have more than 956 nursing colleges and uh, we are also building a potential nursing institutions and school of nursing and uh, we are about to cross the number in 1000 in upcoming days and uh, thus uh, making india one of the potential power source of skills knowledge uh, and uh, research works and publications in field of nursing we are up, uh, coming up uh, with uh, good journals uh, with high impact factors and better indexing i will insist our uh, members of society for nursing practices uh, with uh, their expertise uh, to be a part of our editorial board a review and committee and keep themselves engaged and uh, so that we can provide uh, better publications and uh, contribute to international repositories from india and uh, moreover we are also insisting the professionals and faculties and uh, practitioners of different hospitals and uh, clinical and academic institutions to be a part of society for nursing practices uh, by opting the student membership by opting the professional membership and premium membership we have some elite benefits out of it uh, that uh, we we believe in uh, active engagement of professionals associated with us members associated with us we are collaborating with institutions as i said by for establishment of institutional chapters faculty chapters student chapters and we are building up uh, potential student hubs student resources and uh, we are trying to uh, groom them we are trying to develop students uh, to understand the real opportunities real scopes uh, real ways real skills towards research and how the works could be developed trial implemented we are also collaborating with government agencies at rapid rate so that we can uh, apply for uh, our research proposals of the conferences and uh, the research proposals of articles published in our journals towards fundings uh, government fundings and uh, private fundings from private sectors also so i wish everyone uh, a very good life a, a healthy life in fact and uh, i wish everyone uh, to have uh, make the best out of this conference i express my hearty gratitude to organizing committee members our 
uh, student chapters members, faculty chapter members, all ambassadors, national and international ambassadors, state ambassadors, uh, committee members, everyone, all my beloved colleagues um, from Society for Nursing Practices, BioLeaks and Technology Group, and my lovely faculties from uh, uh, ITM University School of Nursing. Uh, thank you very much for your support and thank you very much uh, for your uh, uh, dedication and uh, sincerity to make this conference worth of attending. And I believe this con conference will be contributing some knowledges and uh, scientific uh, sources towards uh, the up publications in upcoming days. Uh, thank you very much. We see you all the best. Thank you, sir. All right, um, before we proceed, I would like to, of course, get my souvenir. All right, guys, I would like to request everyone to please open their cameras and we will have a group photo. I want to see your big smile there. And I would like to please, I request you guys to hold your smile because I have nine pages. I'm going to. I'm going to capture nine pages, so please. All right? Come on, open your cameras. More. All right. Three, one, two, five. All right, second page. Ready, one, two. Right, third page, third page. Ready, one, two. All right, fourth page. Ready, one, two. Uh, fifth page. Ready, one, two. Right, six page. One, two. Seven page, one, two. Eight page. Ready? One, two, and the last page. Ready? One, two, all right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, All right, thank you so much, everyone. And now I would like to welcome our keynote speaker. He is currently holding a position as a professor cum pr principal in Duran Nursing College, Salem, Tamil Nadu. He has over 20 years of experience in nursing education and clinical nursing practice, including international experience as program coordinator and faculty member of Gulf Medical University, UAE. He has completed his PhD in community health nursing from National PhD Consortium run by Indian Nursing Council. He has many national and international publications and paper presentations to his credit. He is an examiner of PhD and MSc and programs in various universities and member of editorial board for national level nursing journals. Let us welcome Dr. Kandasami Mutgunder. Thank you very much for your nice introduction. Good morning, uh, one and all present here. Respected dignitaries of this conference, organizers, keynote speakers, and my dear delegates, a very good morning and congratulations for attending and organizing such a good international conference. 
it's my pleasure to address on the keynote matter with the topic health cats compassion crisis caring makes the difference this topic is the need of the hour as we are all going through the terrible pandemic still we are combating with the pandemic not only the healthcare providers but also the general public are witnessing every day the illness suffering death loss of loved ones and also many financial and economical crises which has given to the healthcare providers and also to the general public a compassion fatigue we are losing our compassion so there is a compassion crisis which is more prevalent all over india among with all of us so my presentation will be outlined on compassion meaning health care's compassion crisis compassion model and developing compassionate care in nursing and how the compassionate care makes a difference to introduce the topic compassion is frequently referenced as a hallmark of quality care by patients health care providers health care administrators and policy makers and also the patient and family members are very well aware of the quality care nowadays they consistently identify components of compassion such as receiving care that is person centered not the illness center and it's supposed to be responsive and dialoguing this is what they are thinking as an indicator of a quality care in any healthcare setting compassion is considered and and evaluated as a core competency of healthcare provider especially for the nurses it's one of the core competency what nurses has to exhibit while they are providing care to the patients and community compassionate care is characterized by nurses establishing a special bond with the patients what is compassion it is a feeling of deep sympathy for other person who is stricken by misfortune it can be an illness it can be an suffering or it can be an a uh, physical or mental health problem whatever it is accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering in the world of nursing compassionate care is not simply about just relieving the suffering but also entering into a patient's experience that means a nurses or healthcare workers has to share the experience of the patients and enabling them to retain their independence and dignity as i said uh, when our, uh, while i was talking about the title slide we are all having compassion crisis nowadays amidst of this pandemic there are studies conducted in different parts of india reveals more than 75% of nurses have compassion fatigue what is compassion fatigue it is a condition characterized by emotional and physical exhaustion leading to a diminished ability to empathize or feel compassion for others actually this compassion fatigue is a stress which is resulting from exposure to the traumatized individual for a longer period especially the nurses and healthcare professionals who are regularly exposed to the traumatic experience of the people they witness death they witness suffering they witness illness they witness terminally ill patients especially in the areas like intensive care units emergency room palliative care setting oncology wing in many other areas like end of the life care units so there they witness traumas there they witness sufferings which make them to develop a compassion fatigue this compassion fatigue leads to compassion crisis that means this compassion fatigue make the nurses and healthcare providers unable to provide compassion which causes compassion crisis not only in india even in united states a study conducted uh, which reported that half of the population in america believe that healthcare providers are not compassionate what's the reason for this compassion crisis there are two factors 
one is work environment factor another one is individual factor so the work environment factors which causes compassion crisis are insufficient personnel the nurses are taking care of huge number of patients in a shift even i can tell yes being and i was a nurse working in the government setup i have taken care of 40 or 50 patient in acute care setting in one shift alone so this gives a very high work very high workload and uh, which causes compassion fatigue and also there is insufficient time the nurses not only providing a nursing related work and also they have to take care of non nursing works so more, more than giving a direct nursing care the nurses are involved in indirect nursing care and non nursing cares like more of documents or taking care of other health professionals work so this causes insufficient time and there is workload High, high workload, hard protocols and procedures, which are very rigid, not flexible, aggressive and rude families, very, very difficult to handle those families and significant others. Inadequate leadership and poor institutional support, not having peer support. These are all some of the work environment factors which cause this compassion crisis. What are the individual factors? The individual factors that are from the nurses and healthcare provider themselves, which includes poor communication skill. Communication is a very important tool for providing compassionate care and managing the patients and family members. So the nurses and the healthcare providers from their side, the communication skill need to be developed. And there is compassion fatigue and being prejudiced not being accessible because they are very busy, heavy workload. And most of the time they are in the records or documentations, not being accessible for the patients or the significant others. Be, and having physical pedic, this is of course true, nurses and healthcare providers works without break or even without food and lack of experience, knowledge and skill. These are all certain individual factors which causes compassion crisis. I would like to present a compassion model. This is called compassion in clinical practice model. This model describes the process of giving compassionate care. And also this prescribes what all the action the nurses has to take in order to provide compassionate care. You can see there are two circles. The left side circle denotes healthcare provider. The right side circle denotes the patient. Healthcare providers, are uh, having certain virtues. Virtues are actually a good and noble characteristic a person should possess. And others say patients who are suffering and who are having illness. When these healthcare providers and patients are coming to interact or when they are interacting together in healthcare setups, especially in hospitals and community, that takes place which were, which was response. This virtuous response are actually uh, genuineness, love, openness, honest, authenticity, care, understanding, tolerance, kindness, and acceptance from the nurse's part. So this virtual response will be take place, will take place in relational space. The relational space is actually a context or environment where the virtual response and the compassionate care takes place. In this relational space, the patients are becoming aware and uh, they have an intuition about the capacity of the nurses or healthcare providers' compassion. Based on, uh, in, in this context, when the nurses exhibit a, a virtuous response, there will be three types of action taken place, or the nurses carry out three types of actions. The first one is seeking to understand. Seeking to understand means understanding the person and person needs. The second action is relational communication, or relational communicating, which include nurses and healthcare provider demeanor, that is their nonverbal communication, their tone, their outlook, and their intent and the affect, which includes the nurse's attitude and the feeling towards the patient. Behaviors. Behaviors are the physical displays of caring and listening and supportive words given to the patient and the family member and showing respect to the patient and the family member. 
and engaging with the patient. That is being with the patient, being available always for the patients and the family members. So these are all certain strategy by which a nurse and healthcare provider can achieve a relational communication. And the third one is very much important, which is done always by all of us is attending to the needs. When attending to the needs, we have to give a compassion related needs, especially like giving physical comfort, spiritual comfort, emotional comfort, attending to the illness and suffering, and also attending family needs. Apart from that, the nurses and healthcare providers must act as an advocate for all other problem which is they are encountering during the period of hospital stay or during the period of care. When all these goes well, you can ex expect an outcome. That outcome is a patient reported outcome. To specify some of the patient reported outcome, which indicate a good or comp compassionate care or patients reported relief from suffering or illness. Patients reported enhanced well-being and patients reported enhanced quality care. When all these, uh, when, when you are uh, getting this type of report from the patient, that, that shows that your care is compassionate and your care is a quality care. How a nurse can develop a compassionate care? There are many strategies. I would like to list a few. The first one is team mentality. I would like to say giving compassionate care is not only the nurse's duty, it is the duty of the healthcare team. Each and everyone who are in the healthcare team must uh, show a compassionate compassion. They must deliver a compassionate care to uh, have a successful compassionate care in a healthcare setting. So that should be a team mentality and there should be a compassionate working environment. This compassionate working environment creates a positive effect on the healthcare professionals. Um, and also it, uh, it gives them a good commitment to their institutions and their ability to cope with the workplace difficulties and discomfort. This uh, compassionate work environment being a supportive, supportive of peers. And the third one is knowing who the patient and what is his or her priority. Working with patient, learn what is important to them and use this information during the care is very important. You must know the patient, who they are and what is their problem and use those information while you are giving care. That means a lot to the patient. And the feedback is another very important one. So getting feedback from the patients and the family member helps to understand how care can be made better when the patient says if they are not feeling good about the care or they want an improvement in the care. So that feedback help you to uh, give more better care in future. And also this offers opportunity to celebrate success when the patient gives you a good feedback and also reinforces the practices that lead to positive outcomes. The next one is engaging in caring conversation. The conversation may be a small act, but it means a lot that have uh, a very big um, effect on the patient care. Just having small conversation and caring conversation help to gain insight regarding the patient and to understand what is important to the patient and their, their preferences. And patient also feel very happy when you have a caring conversation. I have given some examples uh, of certain caring conversa conversations. That is, what is important to you right now? Can you help me understand how to help you? What else can we do for you? Are you comfortable? Had your lunch? Had your food? How was the last night? Did you sleep well? This type of a compassionate conversation or can be caring conversation is very much important. And giving good communication and teamwork. So that, is, uh, that is another aspect where nurses has to develop much more. A supportive leadership and collaborative team is important for creating a good environment for a provision of compassionate care. The last one is self-awareness practice. We must be aware of our own compassion, whether we are compassionate or not. And we should be unprejudiced. 
there are certain practices to have a self awareness which can be practiced every day that will help you to overcome compassionate fatigue and compassion crisis begin the day with awareness exercises like silence yoga meditation or breathing exercise be aware of the events in your life that make you say thankfully i am a nurse and this is my job whenever you feel compassion fatigue whenever you feel burnout whenever you feel down please uh, recall the uh, events which make you tell thankfully i am a nurse and this is my job that will help you to overcome the compassion fatigue and compassion crisis remember you are not responsible for your patient's illness and suffering if the treatment does not go as anticipated your primary mission will again be compassionate helping and just being there you need not worry and leave work at work don't carry your work to your home and don't carry your home to your work that is very important learn to distinguish your leisure time and professional life when leaving one patient for another please don't carry the effect of previous patient to the next patient focus all your attention and compassion on the new patient simply breathe or walk which can help you to renew your compassion emotion and focus your interest when switching to the next patient so this is how we are nurse and healthcare provider can develop a compassionate care how the compassionate care makes difference or what difference the compassionate care makes in the patient care actually many patient reported that the compassionate care brings success to the treatment in a study conducted with 800 patient in united states all the patients said that compassionate care was important for the success of their treatment and also this compassionate care has positive effects on patient care and it brings employee satisfaction it removes the burnout and gives job satisfaction and professional satisfaction this compassionate care facilitate patients and families decision making and which involves the patient and family into the care so we can get the active participation of the patient and significant others in our care enhancing the patient and family's perceived quality quality of care is another important uh, area of the difference what the compassionate care makes so as i said in the introduction it improve a lot of the quality of care it improves the nurses ability to de to determine the patients and families needs and also helps the nurses to use appropriate approach as i said the patients are each patients are unique there will be rude family members there will be a aggressive family member there will be very humble and polite family members we can witness a different type of personalities so this compassionate care help you to use appropriate approaches to the different personalities and lastly this compassionate care makes a difference uh, in definitely in your care particularly a quality of care and also this brings out the uh, brings down the nurses burnout to conclude no single individual or professionals can ensure the delivery of compassionate care it is a team or as i said before we all must have a team mentality nurses do have enormous experience to call on in shaping the empathetic resilient organization in which compassionate care will continue to be the norm but they cannot do it alone if the burden of providing compassionate care is placed at the center of one particular professional identity that of nurses it will cause compassion fatigue and compassion crisis hence the provision of compassionate care is the responsibility of multidisciplinary health team member when we involve every team member of the health in the compassionate care definitely we can overcome the compassion crisis and compassion fatigue with this i would like to end my presentation these are some of the references i have gone through thank you very much
Thank you, Dr. Kansami, for your amazing keynote session. Thank you so much for joining. So next, we will quickly move on and I'll welcome our next keynote speaker, that is Dr. Joy Dictoria, the Regional Director of Nursing from Abir Medical Group from Saudi Arabia. Dr. Joy graduated with a degree of Bachelor of Science in Nursing in St. Louis University. She's a nurse by profession with various and diverse work experience in the healthcare arena in the government and private sectors in the Philippines and abroad. Her passion to education led her acquisition of several postgraduate degrees. Master of Arts in Nursing and Master of Arts in Education, both major in administration and supervision. Master in Hospital Administration, Doctor of Philosophy in Development Administration from a business university in the Philippines. With her longing to lifelong learning and continuous development, she joined several trainings and seminars in the country and abroad. She was a Philippine delegate for the Life Education Certification in Nanhan University in Taiwan, where she acquired knowledge, skills, and attitude in logotherapy, finding the meaning of life, understanding the whole brain, mindfulness, power of meditation, and the like. Being a rose from the rank employee, she is equipped with clinical, managerial, and administrative knowledge, skills, and attitude. She was the Director of Nursing Service and Total Quality Management Officer of St. Jude Hospital and Medical Center and a faculty member of Graduate School of St. Jude College. She holds consultancy positions in strategic planning, policy analysis and development in different hospitals and in the curriculum development of educational institutions across the Philippines. She is currently the Regional Director of Nursing and the Chairman of Nursing Professional Development Committee of a prime and private medical group in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Thank you, ma'am. We welcome you to the third international conference on nursing and healthcare. Thank you, Jazila, for that um, very uh, warm introduction. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my, my knowledge um, and uh, to partake in this very worthy cause that ensures continuous education, learning, and development to our nurses and our colleagues in the healthcare industry. I had my uh, recording previously because I want to make sure that the presentation will be continuous because of some issues in internet connection. As you know, I am in uh, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I am from Jeddah, uh, which is a two and a half hour um, um, behind the time of India. So they gonna be record, uh, they gonna be playing the, uh, the recording of my presentation. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, everyone can, can learn from, from it. I would like to request the um, organizers to kindly play uh, the video. We cannot see the video. My apologies. Yeah, we cannot see the video. All right, I was yeah, just asked, a moment. We we'll uh, just play, ma'am. All right. Okay. I'll make sure when you share your screen, um, after clicking on the share screen button, you will see another window and you will be provided with choices there to choose the window. Make sure to please choose the entire window before you click on share so that we will not have a white screen and it will not stop. Thank 
you. It's not allowed. Gisela? Um, I'm sorry, but uh, the uh, the sound yeah, cannot um, be heard. Yeah, I will, I, will, I will share that Perfect. video on my end. Hold up, hold on. Is it not audible? It's too low, so I'll try it on my end. Yeah, yes, yes. Internet sometimes here is um, unpredictable, so um. <laughs> Uh, I, I that's why I chose to, to to record the video but if if uh, you think that my line is okay then I can and I can go on with the presentation yes ma'am you may proceed if you, with the presentation then oh yeah go ahead yeah uh, so you cannot do something uh, on your end for the video oh yeah we uh, are actually yeah I'm I'm going to share it <laughs> Good morning, my dear colleagues in the nursing profession and in the healthcare industry. My name is Dr. Teresita Joy Decatoria, and I am the a director of nursing and director of learning and development of Alabir Medical Group in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Today, I am tasked to um, discuss to you or give some presentation about COVID-19 and its impact on the execution of future clinical trials. So um, let me just uh, walk through with you on the contents of this um, presentation. Can you hear it, guys? It is loud and clear. Okay. So we will gonna be discussing about clinical trial the definition, what are the types of clinical trials, and what are the phases of clinical trial, and uh, uh, what are the impacts of uh, COVID-19 on the existing clinical trials, and what are the challenges on clinical trial um, during COVID-19 pandemic. Because as we all know, even during pandemic, the clinical trial should not stop. Although there were some um, existing clinical trials that had stopped during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, many clinical trials had emerged and which mostly focused on uh, COVID-19. And with these challenges, we will walk through the new approaches on clinical trials during pandemic, which we can see um, giving uh, positive impact on clinical trials. 
at the end of this presentation, I would um, hope that our participants will have a better understanding on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic in clinical trials and uh, would understand the new approaches learned for the improvement of future clinical trial executions. First, let us um, discuss about clinical trial. So clinical trials are investigation in human subjects intended to discover or verify the clinical, pharmacological, and or pharmacodynamic effects of investigational product. So as you can see in the definition, human subjects. So human became uh, the subject of um, the investigation or the experimentation in order to discover the um, uh, and verify the, the effect, the clinical, pharmacological, and pharmacodynamic effects of a certain product, one of which is a vaccine. So um, the term clinical trial is used to describe many different types of research studies on people. So people are known as human subjects in research terms. There are five main types of clinical trials. Uh, we have treatment trials, of course, uh, this um, intends to study um, a certain drug or um, um, like a vaccine on how to uh, treat a certain disease. And then uh, prevention trials is also another type, diagnostic trials. There is also what we call as natural history trial, wherein they study the natural course of disease to a certain human. And there is also quality of life trials, which is the study of uh, ways to improve aspects of life of uh, people living with illnesses. There are phases of clinical trial. By the way, um, in this slide, you can see the, uh, the process of developing a certain product from preclinical testing up to the approvals of, uh, of regulatory agencies. So even before the, uh, the actual clinical trial will happen, there is a preclinical testing, which is done in the laboratory of the manufacturer. So they will do um, um, some laboratory testings and they will test it also on the animals. And during this process, they will also determine the research protocol. And after this preclinical testing um, ha has been uh, satisfied, they can now go to clinical trial, wherein they will now uh, try it to human uh, beings. So there are phases of clinical trial. Phase one, phase two, and phase three. And uh, there is also phase four of uh, clinical trial. So phase one is... Um, is um, the um, period wherein they have to check the safety of the drug. Is the drug safe is the main uh, question to be answered in this, in this uh, phase. And the safety of the drug is also established for an optimal dose to be used. Normally it is uh, done in less than a hundred number of patients. And after passing the, the phase one, they can now move to phase two, wherein the question uh, to be answered is, is the drug effective? So the efficacy and safety of the drug is established. So the test uh, thing of, of beneficial effects and checking of undesirable effects is done on phase two. And normally it is done um, for... Um, a larger number of people, which is like 100 to 1,000 uh, number of patients. And uh, after um, satisfying the phase one and phase two, now go to phase three, wherein the primary question to be answered is that, is the drug safe and effective in larger groups of people for a longer period of time. So there is a comparative study also on the efficacy of, of this drug uh, to, the, um, to the current standard of care. So trials are randomized to investigate treatment, safety, and efficacy compared to the current standard of care. 
it is done in a much larger number of participants, like more than thousands of participants. So um, it is also conducted in a multiple locations throughout the world because it should be conducted in, in different settings and in different kinds of, uh, of um, nationalities uh, in order to, to really come up with a comparative study on the efficacy. And uh, once the drug has successfully completed the phase three clinical trials, the manufacturer will you know, do some final data analysis and do some biostatistical analysis to determine um, medically compelling and statistically significant results. And then they will submit a new drug of application to the Food and Drug Authority or the FDA. So the FDA will study the submitted statistics and data. Uh, the FDA will either approve or disapprove the drug or product. And you know, there were like approximately 85% only are approved uh, by the FDA of all those uh, submitted um, um, drugs or products for approval. So after the approval of uh, the FDA, the manufacturer is now ready to distribute or to sell, to market uh, the product. So after marketing or after selling, there is also what we call as phase four of the clinical trial. So um, it will check the long-term result of using this uh, product. And it is done after the drug has been approved for sale and um, a post-marketing surveillance and assessment of therapeutic value or treatment strategies is done. It is a continuous surveillance of the effectivity and efficiency of the drug or vaccine or product. Let me show you uh, this is like uh, this is the vaccine development timeline. This is the traditional vaccine development timeline. So normally um, a vaccine uh, will take 10 years of development before it is even it can be said that it is safe to distribute for uh, mass production or and for uh, use of uh, people for selling it will take 10 years um in this slide you can see the number of clinical uh, trials that are being registered in clinical trials that go from 2000 year 2000 up to 2001 and we can see that there is a um, gradual and steady increase in the number of registered clinical trials but it is surprising to see um, um, a real exponential elevation from 2020 to 2021 so um, these clinical trials um, includes uh, non-COVID-19 um, trials like uh, uh, diseases for the cardiovascular system, for endocrine, um, for uh, drugs, for oncology. So this um, uh, registry includes all kinds of clinical trials. So what happened to COVID-19? So there are uh, clinical trials. Uh, there are like 1,157 trials in the global clinical pipeline addressing the source SARS-CoV infection or the COVID-19. And at least 100 vaccines are in development. COVID-19 has um, an obvious impact on the existing clinical trials. So as per clinical trials that go, uh, from December 2019 to May 2020, a total of 2,500 um, trials were stopped and 45% of it reports that COVID-19 uh, uh, is the reason. And according to Medidata, there was like a 65% decrease in patient enrollment to clinical trial on the same period. And some pharmaceutical companies has postponed non-COVID-19 clinical trials and around 80% of non-COVID-19 trials were being stopped or interrupted. And these non-COVID-19 clinical trials are includes those for endocrine, cardiovascular, oncology, or infectious diseases. 
as you can see here, um, the interruptions or disruptions of, uh, of clinical trials happened due to um, 70, almost 70% 70 of which is due to suspended enrollment, wherein um, the participants or patients um, uh, stopped enrolling to be um, subjects for the clinical trial. And there is also um, a slow uh, enrollment process, and there is a delayed initiation of a clinical trial. So these are the main reasons why clinical trials were disrupted. COVID-19 has uh, undeniably brought with us profound global impact. Strength through adversity is commonly used aphorism and one which is true of people and industries alike. When confronted with challenges, human inventiveness knows no limits. And COVID-19 has been both the mother of innovation, but also the catalyst for the widespread adoption of current, current technologies. So we did not stop doing the clinical trials uh, during COVID-19. Um, but there are many challenges uh, from uh, that our uh, manufacturers or labora laboratories had uh, faced during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this includes uh, like uh, the concern about the safety of patients as well as with the reallocation uh, due to lack of staff or resources to house these patients, which have resulted in the reduction and delay of uh, enrollment of patients. There is also, of course, a massive disruption of the supply chain because of the closure of borders, which also affected the shipment of clinical trial samples to, the, to be tested on clinical or central laboratory. Um, extension of the duration of the trial also happened because the study was either slowed down or interrupted during recruitment. And um, the initiation of new studies were kept on hold by either the manufacturer themselves or forced by the lockdowns, uh, which prevented patients from entering trials and visiting hospitals. There is also a congestion over, or overstretched hospitals, resources, and system because they, uh, it was um, the resources, the hospitals, and the system was Focus on treating patients with COVID-19. Um, the conversion of physical visits into virtual visits also happened, which also a little um, challenging for all of our um, laboratories because uh, a sudden change on the original plan can um, dis disrupt the, the implementation of clinical trial. Um, the recruited patients also are leaving from the trials. So there is also a reprioritization of new tests application to only those that treat, diagnose, or prevent COVID-19. And clinics are allowing only these essential or critical visits and refusing to make part in um, trials. So the risk of compromised data in integrity is uh, of new procedures are debating from the uh, original plan also happened. And then vendors and contractors are not able to meet the, their obligations on the distribution, such as the delivery of the drugs to the site. So these are all the uh, challenges during the pandemic. But as human as we are, um, we know that uh, we always know how to deal with situations. Um, in this, in this uh, slide, you can you see uh, the, the reasons or the, bigger, the biggest barrier to patients joining the trial is because of their fear of exposure. Of course, everyone um, during the pandemic um, has a fear of exposing themselves um, to, to COVID-19. So they might as well just stay home. And also site visits is one of the reasons. There is a restriction on site visits and there is also a challenge, big challenge on the transport. So these are the biggest barriers uh, to patients joining the trial. But, you know, um, human, when confronted with challenges, 
human inventiveness knows no limit. Um, and uh, um, COVID-19 has became the mother of innovation and uh, it has um, um, led us to a widespread adoption of uh, current technologies. And hence, um, new approaches had created positive impacts of, uh, on COVID-19 clinical trials, one of which is that the regulatory body, which is uh, famously um, known as the Food and Drug Authority, uh, issues guidance on conducting clinical trials during um, COVID-19. So the regulatory guidelines in the conduct of clinical trials became flexible while maintaining safety and efficiency. So uh, according to Brooke Wilson of the Trials Intelligence at Global Data, the methods outlined by the FDA to help trials proceed during the pandemic, including using alternative contact methods such as virtual visits and phone calls, as well as the use of self-administration and remote monitoring will help with the issues of quarantine, travel limitations, clinical site closures, and disrupted supply chains. So the FDA had um, given some kind of leeway or flexibility when it comes to uh, the ruling on uh, virtual visits and phone calls and self-administration and remote monitoring, which um, um, helped this laboratory um, finish or um, um, continue the, the, the processes in their clinical trials. This is one of the example of the new FDA guidelines, which um, um, requires that sponsors should describe in appropriate sections of the clinical study report, their contingency measures and the listings of all participants affected by the COVID-19, and then their analysis and corresponding discussions that address the impact of implemented contingency measures. Another um, positive impact of COVID-19 on clinical trial is the fast tracking of phase two and phase three trials. And uh, you know, the standard eight year development track from preclinical to the end of phase three uh, was reduced to two years and enabled a vaccine to reach the market in only three years. This really happened guys. And it is, uh, it is one of the break through of clinical trials, which um, which um, brought by which uh, which was brought by COVID nineteen. So the pandemic is really an opportunity of improvement of traditional design of clinical trials. COVID nineteen pandemic has demonstrated how a standard eight year development track from pre clinical phase to end of phase three can uh, be reduced into two years and enable a vaccine to reach the market in only three years or even less than three years. So the kind of development a speed is really record breaking. It is really amazing. It is the reason now that we have millions of vaccines distributed all around the globe and millions of people are vaccinated. And uh, with this slide, uh, let me show you a comparison between the traditional vaccine development timeline and the accelerated vaccine development timeline. As you can see, there is a real dramatic change from 10 years trials to two years of phase one to phase three clinical trial and to the um, distribution of the product and this was a real breakthrough in medicine and in the healthcare industry that um, if COVID-19 did not happen maybe we uh, efforts to to come up with this accelerated vaccine development would not have been uh, done or would not have happened so um, this is a real positive um, impact of COVID-19 on not only on clinical, clinical trials, but on the healthcare uh, as a whole. 
um, one good thing that happened is that there is a, there, there was an accelerated pathway to emergency use authorization or the EUA. What is this EUA? EUA is a mechanism to facilitate the av availability and use of medical countermeasures, including vaccines during public health emergencies. The EUA is um, is an um, like an approval of to use a certain product after uh, all the vaccine benefits at, uh, is has been proven that it outweighs uh, its risk based on data from at least one well-designed phase three trial that demonstrates the vaccine's efficacy and safety in a clear and compelling manner. So the EUA is, um, uh, is an approval that is uh, provided by the FDA or the World Health Organization that a product is now safe to be used uh, and for, for um, public and mass production and distribution. You see, even, um, even with the COVID-19 pandemic, we're in, there is a real dire need of um, uh, getting solutions or getting um, cure or vaccine, a constant balance between safety, effic efficacy, and quality was obvious during the whole process. The regulatory authorities around the globe offer accelerated pathways to scientific advice and emergency use authorization. And at the same time, they have emphasized that the investigational data must be sufficient in both quantity and quality to obtain a regulatory green light. So there's no go if there's no approval if they have not given a sufficient quantity and qual quantitative and qualitative qualitative data. So this itself is a manifestation of improving speed and maintaining quality. One good thing that happened also is that um, there was a leverage of technological solutions. So there was a switch from centralized to decentralized that had enhanced data collection on clinical trials. Uh, use of um, artificial algorithms or the AI uh, to extract historical virtual data has reduced the number of participants in the control group. You see, there was a concern of uh, early in our earlier discussion. One of the uh, the issues why um, clinical trial trials were disrupted is because of the decrease in the enrollment of participants. Right. So uh, with this. With the use of AI algorithms, they don't need uh, to, to put so much um, people or participants in the control group because they would use the information or the data taken from the AI algorithms for the control group. So those participants who enrolled mostly were used on the experimental group. And telemedicine, telepharmacy has been widely implemented. So the clinical trial uh, market really had um, uh, shiftly and swiftly adjusted to the new paradigm circumscribed by restrictions on social interaction by looking to leverage on technological solutions. Another uh, very important um, um, breakthrough or um, development uh, that happened during the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is that uh, there was an obvious strengthening of collaboration among stakeholders. So global, global readers have recognized that collaboration and open science are essential to the medical technological fight against COVID-19. Collaboration is central for initiatives and efforts in the race to fight COVID-19 with particular focus on fostering rapid, uh, rapid development of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines. So policies promoting fair and effective collaboration and knowledge sharing are key for uh, public health to avoid stumbling blocks for vaccine and medicine development, um, deployment and equitable access both for COVID-19 and expected future global health 
emergencies. So these policymakers, the academe, the industry, the patients organizations, they worked together, um, they collaborated together in order to come up with a common goal to find cure, to find a vaccine. And um, which uh, leads also to industry shift from competition to collaboration. So like, for example, those um, uh, manufacturing companies who are before competitors, they, they shifted into a collaborative relationship like the Pfizer and BioNTech, AstraZeneca and the University of Oxford. And then uh, one thing is the Glasgow, Smithline and Sanofi, two of the world's largest vaccine manufacturers and long-term rivals. So the Glasgow Smith line has granted Sanofi access to its uh, adjuvant technology, which in combination with Sanofi's vaccine candidate can enhance the immune response and reduce the necessary quantity of vaccine per dose. So international efforts across industry regulators, governments, and health organizations prompt a push for a faster execution. And using the, you know, the World Health Organization list of COVID-19 vaccine developments, um, we found that nearly one third of all vaccine candidates were developed by partnerships, which tended to use uh, next-gen vaccine platforms more than solo efforts. So most of these vaccines that was produced for COVID-19 um, was produced through uh, collaborations of the previously rival um, companies, which is uh, really amazing, right? So in this, you know, human um, humanism is also tested during COVID-19. Technology as at uh, its best is also um, uh, widespread and obvious during the COVID-19. The virtual clinical trials was um, uh, obviously used during this um, pandemic, wherein pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer, Astra, had adopted virtual trials via remote monitoring and teleconferencing for the collection of digital data. So what are the benefits of this uh, virtual clinical trials? Um, well, remote patient monitoring will help the participant or will give the participant the freedom and the peace of mind that they won't be exposed to unnecessary risk. Of course, one of the uh, many reasons why um, COVID-19 um, um, enrollees, or I mean the clinical trial enrollees, um, did not enroll or did not participate or back out or leave the clinical trial is because of their fear of fear of exposure. So the virtual visits also enable the inclusion of a larger population of patients and will enhance patient recruitment, engagement, and retention. As you can see here, so um, there was a um, um, a research uh, that happened uh, during this COVID-19 and the sites or the clinical trial sites were asked if they're going to be using telemedicine for trial participants or did they use it before. So before COVID-19, 72% of them never or rarely used the telemedicine or the, the virtual, um, um, virtual clinical trials. But during COVID-19, there was now a shift, okay, where in 64% sometimes or often use the telemedicine or the virtual clinical trial platform. And if they were asked, when they were asked if they're going to use telemedicine after COVID-19, and there was an answer on a whooping 73% agreed to use telemedicine. Well, because of the benefit that, uh, that they saw uh, over this technology. As a great change in the clinical trial process and uh, an unprecedented rate has been witnessed during the pandemic, uh, we can see that COVID-19 also um, shared to us um, an experience which we as human uh, being uh, would learn and uh, 
had challenged our innovativeness and our inventiveness. Here you can see um, in this uh, all, uh, slide, there is also an increased awareness on clinical trials. What is the importance of this? Why it, why, why is it is giving a positive impact on COVID-19 um, on clinical trials? Um, it's because awareness, if people are more aware of, uh, you know, one thing, you would gain more their, you know, participation, right, and cooperation. So with this increased awareness, uh, it is hope that in the future clinical trials, more, uh, there will be an easier and um, easier way of and more people to be enrolling for a clinical clinical trial as, as patients or, or, or subjects of clinical trial. So um, awareness to clinical uh, trial uh, shows that 62% of patients says that their clinical trial awareness has increased since the onset of COVID-19. Evolution is a matter of survival and many of the modifications that took place during the COVID-19 pandemic will last and be for the better. Uh, we lost millions of lives, um, some our loved ones, our relatives. This is part of human evolution. And uh, COVID-19 has brought us a lot of learnings, a lot of experiences and we should move forward, move forward towards new and improved normal. I will end uh, this um, lecture with this uh, with this message. Human are um, known for their uh, resilience, and as human as we are, we always stand up and move forward and learn from what happened and on the process we are um, improving and growing and developing with that i end this uh, presentation and these are my references thank you for attending this um, this presentation thank you for listening Okay, that ends my uh, presentation. I hope everyone had learned something. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, doctor. Next, um, I would like to invite our next speaker, a lecturer at the Department of Nursing Science, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. She attained her Bachelor of Nursing Science, Master of Education, Planning and Administration, and PhD in Nursing from University of University of Mal Malaya. She holds the research coordinator position in her department and involves in teaching and supervising undergraduate and postgraduate programs besides actively participating in clinical research. Her specialization and research interests include critical care nursing and nursing leadership and management. She has several publications in the international healthcare journals and a reviewer for international nursing journals. Let us welcome Dr. Vim Vimala Ramu. Doctor? Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much Clearly. for the introduction. Yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to present in this great conference. Okay, let me share my slides. Go ahead, please. 
Do you able to see? Yep. Thank you. Okay, able to see? Yes, Dr. Please proceed. Okay, thank you so much again. Okay. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Like within this given time, I will share, try to cover some of the contents related to knowledge translation and getting research findings into action. Okay, these are the contents that I'll be covering within the time. The nursing research has become the cornerstone of the nursing practice in line with the development in other medical fields. If we see the definition, nursing research refers to the systematic inquiry conducted to explore phenomena important to nurses and nursing, solve nursing problems, and guiding nursing practice activities. The ultimate goal of nursing research is to promote evidence-based practice in nursing with the intention the number of nursing research has been published and it has increased tremendously over the years. Okay. A recent study which aimed to develop, a, uh, to review the development of global nursing research from year 2000 to 2019, noted that the number of publication has increased five times. Fold from, you can see here in 2000, about 1000 publication to up to 8000 plus publication over the last two decades. This shows a tremendous increase in nursing research publication. And this has, with the intention of publication, improve patient, uh, patient care, the various development in research has come out. There's a multidisciplinary nursery research teams has been developed and emerged. They investigated nursing intervention and discovered new cares, delivery methods to address unmet, unmet patient needs and improve the outcomes. This has led to a lot of increased nursing led nursing, uh, nurse -led nursing discovery. Okay, we can see that number of nurses publishing has tremendously increased, and nurses are taking a lot of a role as a principal investigators. However, although there's a lot of research evidence being produced at increasing rate, but if we reflect at our current practice, how many of the evidence is being utilized in our daily practice? How many of the evidence are really that we really use okay, to improve our patient care? The change in clinical practice to reflect this evidence is actually lagging. Utilization of research finding has yet to become a routine part of patient care practices internationally and also across all disciplines. As previous studies suggested that it takes seven, an average of 17 years for new understanding and knowledge to be incorporated into a patient care. And the application of knowledge also varies. Another study noted that 18% of the clinicians reported using evidence-based practice frequently. Only 18% uh, percent of uh, clinicians reported using evidence-based practice frequently. And only 14% reaches patients. That means the evidence being applied to patient practice is only uh, 14%. Our unwillingness okay, or inability to apply what is known to improve patient care can result in significant health deficits and persistent inequalities. inequalities sorry. For example, a recent literature noted that 6 million children's lives could be saved each year if 23 proven interventions were implemented in 42 countries. This indicates lack of evidence uptake in many of the countries. If they could have taken that evidence to improve the patient care, the patient's lives could be 
better. So the emphasis here is that the creation of knowledge does not of itself lead to widespread implementation and positive impacts on healthcare outcomes. The knowledge must be translated into change in practice and policy for the benefits of the patient care. So bridging the research into practice is essential to improve the quality of patient care, which leads to better patient outcomes. And it is fundamental for healthcare system to optimize care outcomes and costs. The low rate of adaptations and limited use of research-based evidence is still a persistent problem. Okay, the challenge of reducing the knowledge practice gap remain a bit remain despite the research being conducted over the 200, uh, two decades. Those, it is something that we need to seriously consider as a lot of research. Sorry, something is okay, sorry. Those, it is something that we need to seriously consider as a lot of resources like time and money have been spent yearly on research related activities. While the call to address this gap is not something new, the first research was published in 1952 and Virginia Anderson, one of the earliest nursing theories has emphasized the need for nurses to go to practice patient care based on evidence-based practices late in 1950s, 70 years ago. While the term research translation and translation research appeared in the nursing literature in the late 70s in response to significant increase in basic and clinical nursing discoveries with little improvement in the provision of healthcare and health outcomes. This effort has helped to increase the research utilization in 1980s and into evidence-based practices in 1990s. However, it is generally acknowledged that moving the research from the bench to practice Bedside is not enough. It is not enough by just doing uh, basic research to uh, clinical research. It must move beyond. The utilization of research finding at population wide health is necessary. <clears throat> so one of the ways to address the gap is by identifying barriers. Various reasons have been identified as barriers for translating research into uh, practice. The barriers can be categorized into three major reasons, which is related to the research itself, the clinician's behavior, and organizational factors. A recent study conducted by, sorry, sorry, yeah. <clears throat> the barriers, the importance of research, okay, is I, Excuse me, just give me one minute. Yeah, some disruptions here. Sorry, despite the importance, barriers to understanding and conducted and evaluating evidence impede nurses from taking up research at individual level. Nurses lack of time and knowledge in appraising researchers and preventing them from implementing research knowledge into the clinical practice. Besides that, their attitudes and beliefs related to research prevents research being translated into practice. A recent study conducted by Virama highlighted that majority of respondents agreed that the every nurse and midwife should take a conscious evidence to guide their practice. Many of the respondents have access to relevant database and internet at their workplace. However, the usage was low. Lack of confidence in the critical appraisal and lack of dedicated time were the reasons reported for low take, uh, uptake of research evidence. But at organizational level, lack of supportive 
work culture, leadership, resources, policy and practices were identified as a reason for low uptake of researches, uh, research evidence or usage of research evidence into clinical practice. These are the, some of the common uh, factors that we need to look into we need to enhance the practice related to research. In addition to that, an Indonesian study highlighted that the limited funding, insufficient research evaluation and recognition, absence of government model, a consortium of research and insufficient communication among researchers, stakeholders as the reason for loss of trans uh, trans translation. Okay, so it highlights the importance for the researchers and stakeholders communication and cooperation okay, to enhance the research uptake, yeah, research finding updates. While Pearson et al. explained three main gaps for research, uh, gaps for translation of research practice in the healthcare system. The first gap is the need for knowledge and discovery of new knowledge. This, this means that what is really needed, okay, and what is really identified to overcome the problem. The second gap is between the new discovery and clinical application. That means from the basic research that you discovered, how to apply it at the real clinical setting. While the third gap was between the clinical application and development of routine clinical application or policy. Okay, this is how to move from the clinical, uh, applica, uh, uh, clinical research to real application at a broader scope. Okay, so understanding the reason behind this gap for low application of empirical evidence will help to initiate strategies to enhance the translation of research finding into clinical practice. According to the framework of promoting action on research implementation in health services, successful implementation of evidence in practice is depend on three key elements, and they are the credibility of the evidence to the audience. Okay, how important the audience perceive the evidence is, the research is, yeah? and the context of the unit or the team in which it is being implemented. This is mean the organization, the staff, the workforce, okay? How do they appreciate, okay? How do they see it is very important and how do they cooperate and work together towards it, okay? The last element is the way the process is facilitated, how the evidence is bring into the clinical, how it is being implemented, how it is being communicated, yeah? So this concludes that we need appropriate evidence right workforce, supports, and methods to enhance the translation of research finding into a wider context. So efforts to reduce the time lag, accelerate the pace of change, and to close the research practice gap is through knowledge translation or translation research concepts. So if you see the definition of knowledge translation, Knowledge is defined as a collection of experience, appropriate information and skill inside, which offers a structure for estimating and integrating new experience and information. While translation in research is the process whereby knowledge is passed everywhere along the translation phase. Okay? So this emphasizes that knowledge that discovered or created through research should not be kept within the academic context. It should be disseminated and translated into actual practice. So this is the call now. Yeah, we do not want all the research that we produce at academic university level just for the academic purpose. It should be moved into improved patient care, into the real uh, situation, real practice. 
But WHO defines knowledge translation in a wider uh, uh, context. It is defined as the synthesis, exchange, and application of knowledge by relevant stakeholders to accelerate the benefit of global and local innovation in strengthening the health systems and improving people's health. The knowledge translation is also at times called as a research utilization in Europe or as a dissemination or research uptake in US. It basically refers to the process of transferring scientific knowledge or what we learn through research into the actual practice. Based on the definition, there is four elements that, that covers the knowledge translation. First is synthesis, second is dissemination, third is exchange, and fourth is application. Synthesis is integrating, conceptualizing research finding into a wider, uh, wider body of knowledge. It is the process of identifying and deciding the best evidence to address the need. While dissemination involves communication and sharing knowledge and tailoring the context for the audience to enable to understand the evidence, we have to tailor the context so that people understand what does it mean. Yeah? It has to be tailored at local context. Exchange involves collaboration between evidence users, researchers, and stakeholders at any or all stages of the knowledge transfer process. It is essential to obtain collaboration and cooperation besides supports and to refine the research process. While application is implementing or putting the knowledge into action, taking the evident informed approach to inform decision-making, policy, and also practice. So in a similar, uh, simpler term, Knowledge translation is explained as the process through which the research is created. Sorry, the, through the uh, which the research knowledge is created, circulated, and adopted into clinical practice. It is a fundamental scientific paradigm aimed to close the gap between research and practice through the process of raising awareness of knowledge and facilitating its use, and through ensuring that. Stakeholders are aware of and use research evidence to inform decision making. So the objective for knowledge translation in simpler version is first to accelerate the process of finding from bench research or basic research to bedside practice. To utilize knowledge and expertise of personnel from various disciplines to focus on a common goal. It is to enhance collaboration between the researchers and also to promote optimal outcomes for patients. So in this, as a strategy, the key strategy to build the knowledge translation into research design, it includes having adequate resources and funding. Okay, so we must make sure our research project have enough funding apply for a grant and which needs appropriate uh, fund, okay, a amount, okay, it's well, well estimated amount, okay, and also we need adequate manpower to run the whole process. Involve stakeholders and end users, okay, stakeholders and end users are very important for effective adaptations. Key stakeholders is the one who will be involved in giving decision, giving supports, while end users will be the one who will be running the whole show, involving and participating in the research. While the, we also need to utilize multidisciplinary approach. We need the cooperation from various professionals for effectiveness of a project. By nursing itself, sometimes we can't move, okay, we need to have supports from other healthcare personnel. So think of all these people, all these resources when we plan for our uh, research projects. The journey of evidence into practice can be complex with at least five stages being recognized. The first is knowledge discovery to evidence summary. Then 
from translation of practice recommendation, integration into practice and also evaluation. Okay, so there are five stages that's involved in the knowledge transformation. And this can be enhanced by using a, a framework. So we can use a knowledge action a framework. Actually, there are various framework available to put knowledge into action. I, I choose to share the work of Pioneer Graham's work, which is more simpler and more easy to understand. Okay, so in this uh, framework, which is based on action research, which involves identifying the problem. Okay, starts here with action research, identifying the problem. You identify, review, and select the knowledge. Okay, here, the best way is look at the systematic reviews, scoping reviews, okay, because they have actually done a lot of work reviewing certain interventions, certain um, protocols or guidelines. Okay, from here, we can have a better, a clearer understanding. Then adapt the knowledge to local context. Okay, because sometimes if the, if the guidelines are from overseas or from other places, okay, it might be not suitable to local context. We have to adapt it to the local context. Assess what are the barriers to knowledge use. Okay, what are the, could be the barriers, foresee the barriers. Okay, so by foreseeing the barriers, we can, uh, what you call the identify measures to overcome it. Then select, tailor, and implement the interventions. After that, monitor the knowledge used, evaluate the outcomes, and lastly, sustain the knowledge. This is very important. A lot of research, once we've done, okay, it will stop at evaluation phase, and it disappears. Yeah. So most important, ensure it is sustained. It's been used. Okay. If it's a good uh, study, a good intervention, good protocol, okay, it should be used as a regular practice in routine care and it should be sustained. Okay, so this approach is vital for knowledge producers or the researchers to share and debate their work to the uh, practice or policy partners. So they are open to the ideas. Okay, so when we are to suggest some research, okay, use this framework, come up with all these foreseen uh, outcomes for each, each stage, develop it properly. Okay, and if we develop it properly, when we present, to the stakeholders, it will be definitely acceptable or open to the idea. Eh? They might be give some positive response to it. Okay, um, <clears throat> I, I, will into, I will go into a bit more detail about the model, how to use this model. Okay, if you see at the, um, when you identify and connect the end users, the first stage in the framework. What we do is the first of all, you identify the relevant interest, the end users for the research. Who should be the end users? Is the nurses, is the doctors? Okay, who identify them? Okay, and then build relationship and partnership with the end users, the main end users. Okay, and then develop research topics. Okay, when we develop research topic, jointly establish end users research priority and interest. Okay, together plan with them. Okay, identify what is the area needs to be developed and how to overcome this. Okay, jointly establish project goals and purpose. Jointly establish scope and methodology during the design and plan the project. During the project management and reporting, Project up, uh, updates, reports, and meetings with end user. Always use them together, yeah? integrate them. And then during interpretation of research findings, translate into a non-technical language, which they can understand. And jointly determine the practical meaning of the results. And communicate and disseminate the findings. End users appropriate publication and products. Okay, so the publication must be focusing on end users so that they understand it. Yeah? Have workshops or any talks, conference, share the findings, and it focus for end users. Yeah? 
and evaluating the success of the project and the partnership, have regular meetings with the end users, and jointly evaluate the scientific and practical impacts. Okay? And it's an ongoing process. So this is how we develop partnership with end users when we plan the a research outcome. As also we can, inter, it's not only an end user, we also can include the stakeholders here. So based on this, let me share uh, my experience of using a translation research. Okay, we are, we are conducting a few translation research recently. Okay, one of my experience that I shared that we have, we have completed successfully is this which is uh, <clears throat> related to critical care practice. And it is related to ICU uh, sedation management. We see that sedations are very widely used in ICU and it can affect the patient if it's not properly monitored or managed. Although evidence regarding sedation assessment and guideline, the monitoring protocols, nurses role has been published back in 1990s. But at our local context, it is not being used, routinely used. So we decided to adapt this protocol into our settings for safe sedation practice and to measure its outcome. This study was conducted around 2010 to 2014. Our study objective was to improve the sedation management practice and patient outcomes. And the stakeholder in our study was the ICU management team and also the nursing administrators, because these people's agreement, support, we need it okay, for the studies to be placed and to be practiced at the ICU settings. And our end users was actually nurses and medical officers who are the one who are going to use the protocol, okay, the protocol to manage the patients with sedations. Yeah? And we use a various study design. We use the experimental study design to assess uh, quasi-experimental study design, to educate the nurses, and we, we measure the outcome on knowledge, practice, and compliance. We use RCT to assess the patient outcomes, which includes the duration of mechanical ventilation, ICU stay, sedation, and energetic usage. And we use a focus group at the end of the uh, implementation, because we want to assess the nurses' satisfaction and challenges they faced. While the study procedures includes educational intervention and development of sedation protocol and implementation of sedation protocol. As a result of the study, we noticed that the nurses' knowledge, practice, and compliance really improved post intervention. We also noted over the one and a half years of patient outcome measurement, Duration of mechanical ventilation, ICU stay, sedation analgesic usage tremendously improved. And the focus group noted that nurses were very satisfied okay, because now they feel like they are taking active role controlling patient sedation in assessment of patient. And they also shared some of the challenges okay, which we refined it. And based on this, we, we published a few papers. And also currently now, Sedation assessment become the routine practice in our hospital and some of the hospitals in Malaysia. So while sharing this success story, it is not a very difficult for us to do a translation research or research to use for a wider context. It is all needs a proper planning okay, and integration of uh, various, various people, multidisciplinary team. So to build a good uh, knowledge translation into research design, always think, begin and plan with the end in the mind. Okay, do not think what you want to do only. You always must think what the outcome will be at the end of your study. Produce evidence that is useful, not just for interesting. That will in, that will aim is to improve patient outcome, okay? Resource knowledge translation and exchange. Look at the process, the framework that I showed, how to improve the research process. Seed outcomes that will last, that will improve patient care, okay? yeah? Involve end users throughout the research process, okay? As we know, the end users contribution, 
commitment is very important. If they do not understand the research process, if they do not understand the importance of the study, we will, will not get a good cooperation from these people. Yeah. So as a conclusion, I just hope that you understand the research uh, framework and how to transfer uh, research findings into a practice. So the research must move we must move from basic research. We, we are very contented with uh, doing basic researches. We must think of applicable or application research and that application should be at a wider context. So ensuring a good evidence, workforce with knowledge, skills and confidence to apply, the, to apply and produce evidence are very important. Organizational support, and leadership to enhance the research utilization culture is important. All this can be achieved by applying the knowledge translation framework. Okay, we must ensure that we use the stakeholders and end users in the process. So knowledge translation concept and process can be used to close the research practice gap and to enhance the research project. Okay, with that is my reference, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doctor. All right, and yes, thank you. And now let's welcome our next speaker. He's an emergency practitioner and lecturer in Jakarta since 1998 up to now. Since 2012 up to now as BLS, ACLS, ACLS, AHA, EMSB, and PHTLS, key coordinator and instructor, APCN program director, and instructor in Indonesia. Let us welcome Asti Pospitarini. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Jojo, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Always, be, always better. How is the COVID in India? Is it, is it decreased right now? Um, actually in the Philippines. Oh, you are in the Philippines. So that's good. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, to have me in this uh, conference and this opportunity. Have you make me a co-host so I can share screen right now? Oh, hold on. Can you show my presentation? Yeah, I do. Please okay, proceed. good. So uh, I will share about the clinical and translational research global health and emergency. Um, and I did the research uh, in December 2019 up to January 2020 in conjunction between 118 Emergency Ambulance Services and Cardiff University Faculty of Mathematics. We want to know is there any gap, what is the gap in emergency medical service system? Uh, this is Indonesian map by, by province. We have 34 provinces in Indonesia. And we are, as you know, we are the biggest archipelago country i think in the world because we have almost uh, not almost we have 17500 island throughout indonesia from west to east we have i think the population is similar like in india or in china we have 272 million population in indonesia but 50% of our population living in Java Island, living in here in Java Island, and the rest spread out 
from the west to east, from Aceh to Papua. And the research conducted in Jakarta, which is in Java Island, and Jakarta also is the capital of uh, Indonesia. This is the, the place where we have the research uh, in one month from December 4th up to January 2020. This is the Jakarta map by cities and villages. Jakarta divided into five regions. We have uh, here, the yellow one is uh, North Jakarta, the Northern part of Jakarta. And it's uh, nearby the face to face with the Samudra Hindia. And then this, the purple one is West Jakarta. The blue one is Central Jakarta. The green one, this, this is the populous region in Jakarta, this is Jakarta. And this one is South Jakarta. We have 261 villages in Jakarta only. This is the, like, like a pet, uh, if you have, or if we found a victim or a patient in Indonesia, this picture show that, uh, if you found one or multi patient in in anywhere in house in anywhere the first responder will be the layman so the big question in here is the first responder is well trained to handle the emergency problem in the pre hospital phase so if so if the the first responder well trained enough are they, uh, do they know how to call for help? I don't know um, your emergency number in Philippine or India, but in here, in Indonesia, we have a lot of emergency telephone number, such as we have 110 for the police and also the launch 112 also for the police. We have 113 for the fire and we have 118 and 119 for the ambulances. So, and this number make people confused. Which number should we dial if something happened with the family or with the society around? And then if they just confuse, usually they will ask for help to the police station, the nearest police station or the fire. And the, the big question in this phase is, are these officer well trained enough to handle the patient, especially the patient who has emergency problem in the field. If they're well trained enough, do they have equipment, proper equipment in their, in their bag so the patient can, can save and can, can arrive to the hospital with a better uh, prospect? If the patient lucky enough and then there is an ambulance, Mm. The ambulance, the well-equipped ambulance, well-trained officer, they will pick up the patient and they will manage the emergency problem over there and then bring the hospital, uh, sorry, bring the patient to the hospital, to the emergency department. So the next phase in the hospital phase, the question is, are these nurses and doctor well-trained enough? If they have good training, if they have good teamwork, good communication, loop communication between the doctor and the nurses, especially in the emergency. The next question is, are this hospital well equipped enough? Because as our experiences here in Indonesia, we train a lot of nurses and doctors in the ED. The next problem is, our ED is not well equipped. So it's only, it's very, very minimum equipment in our ED. So the, that, that is the, the real problem in here in Indonesia. This is the, the tech of uh, my institution, the right patient to the right hospital by the right ambulance at the right time. Okay, so why we choose the research in Jakarta? And it's lucky for us before the pandemic, the research already done. And I myself collected the data in five major hospitals in Jakarta and with Cardiff team, 
especially faculty of mathematics, they analyze the data after we input and send them the data and they just analyze. And I will show you some, uh, some of the results of our research in here. The healthcare system is in Indonesia is undergoing significant changes, including uh, emergency care, both in pre-hospital and in hospital. And the second thing is there is up to now, there is no law, even ministry law or president decree or anything, no law for emergency care. That's why we have we have we have police, we have firefighter, we have ambulance service in Jakarta, we have also search and rescue, we have even we have national disaster management body or province disaster management body who respond, who has authorized. Um, is it uh, the region is disaster or not? But we have no coordination. There is lack coordination in the field. We work by ourselves, but no coordination. There are 200 hospitals in Jakarta and 80 ambulances, actually not 80, almost 100 ambulances in Jakarta to serve 12 million people in Jakarta only. So if we compare this number with the other cities such as uh, New York, London, or Tokyo is not bad enough. But the challenges is we have no coordination, we not well trained, and we have no system. It's still fragmented, disorganized, and not well trained. It's like the UK in 1980, fragmented, disorganized, and not well trained. Number five, I took it from the Advanced Trauma Life Support uh, manual book, uh, 10 edition. It says that three model debt distribution will decrease if the trauma training center and bed, uh, trauma, cent uh, trauma training have standard, better pre-hospital and trauma, it means hospital have better services. And now, in, in Jakarta, in Indonesia, we have, we have services, but not coordination enough and no system, still fragmented. That, that is the problem. The objective of this research, uh, we want to know, is there any awareness of some people in here in Jakarta about EMS? Do they know there is ambulance services in Jakarta? And you will surprise if you know uh, the result of our research in here. And how do, uh, how do the patient reach the hospital, especially in the ED? Because we only did the survey, the patient come to the ED, through the ED. Is there any barrier, barrier in accessing the pre-hospital and emergency system in Jakarta? And is there any influences what we have to do in training, especially in emergency training through this with the system? We did the survey in five major hospitals in Jakarta, four government hospitals and one private. And this is the same level, five hospitals with same level. And the survey, we asked our colleague in hospital the nurses there to help us to fill in the survey. They will the interview the family or the patient, and then the data will give it to me, and then I just input and then analyze uh, with the Cardiff uh, team. We also do the survey in, uh, in two major emergency ambulance services in Jakarta, which are uh, one government and one private. This is the, there are two major emergency medical service in Jakarta. And we are using exploratory data analysis. And this is the result. This is the questionnaire. And this red dot, this is the hospital uh, location spread out into Jakarta and one hospital uh, nearby Jakarta. And we convert their name into initial into A, A, B, C, D, E. So, uh, like I, I mentioned before, the East Jakarta is the populous region in Jakarta. 
there are 2,884,000 people living in there with 38 hospitals to serve uh, the population. And then the second is West Jakarta. There are 2,282,000 people living in West Jakarta with two with sorry with 22 hospital to serve them and then 2 million 147 living in south jakarta this is the uh the hospital the number of the hospital 42 hospitals spread out uh, through jakarta and the north 1 million and 641 with the hospital 20. so we have almost 200 after this i will show you the, the the number of public health center or clinic belongs to the government the hospital only day there are 152 million to serve 11 million people in jakarta only this is the the data the diagram that show um we have public health center it calls uh, it's like a health clinic belongs to a municipal health office in each region. There are 321 public health center in Jakarta. And 28 of them, they have inpatient services and the rest only serve to only serve outpatient. And the ambulance with good condition, it means they can serve the people 24 hours for seven days a week there are 105 ambulances in good condition to serve 11 12 million people in jakarta i think this is good okay this is the result one of the result of our uh, research in jakarta transport modes used by the patient so from 1964 patient from five major hospital, 30.3% they are using their own car. 30.4% they are using ride sharing service cars. It's like uh, online transportations like Uber, but we have uh, Gojek and Grab in Jakarta. It's a, it's a lot number presentation over there, 30.4. Compare with ambulance, the patient who are using ambulance, only 9.3%. This is quite surprise, almost 20%. The patient using the motorcycle. So can you imagine the patient with the fracture or even appendicitis or the chronic or chronic disease, they are using motorcycle. And other, other, sorry. Others like, uh, we call it here bajai or tuk-tuk in Bangkok, tricycle like a motor. They are using also uh, bajai for patient transportation to the ED. So this is quite sad actually for me because only 9% patient go to the emergency department using ambulance. The rest by car, by online and by motorcycle. This is the reason why they are not choosing ambulance. The major reason is they do not aware. So this is a big homework also for the government and also for me who work in emergency medical service. The community doesn't know how to call the ambulance. They don't know how to call it. They, they, they don't even know that the emergency ambulance services is access in Jakarta. It's almost 40%, it's almost 38%, 37.86%, they do not aware. 20.75%, they thought the patient is not necessary to bring by the ambulance. So it's, you can use the motorcycle, you can use uh, your own car because the patient is with GCS 15, the patient aware enough, so no need ambulance. 70%, they thought that ambulance take a long time because the traffic in Jakarta is really, really, really bad. Even only within 10 kilometers, sometimes it takes for 44, 
40 until 60 minutes in the peak hours. So they think, okay, it's not, not okay to wait here in the hospital. So usually they choose the, the, their own car or even online car. 12%, the ambulances is not available. 7.80% they thought too expensive because uh, for ambulance services in Jakarta, not all the services covered by the insurance or by the government. So they must pay by themselves. And this is the reason why they are using ambulance. 23.20% 20 because advice from their doctors. 50% because medical condition, they have no choice because the patient need observe during the transportation, need oxygen, need monitor, ECG monitor, and something like that. So they have must, um, they must use the ambulances for, for the transportation. 14% 14, 14 it's their own initiative. Usually this patient or the family is, um, they know the services before, and it's easy and it's comfort for the patient. Usually they will call again. So it's their own initiative. The rest uh, affordable. And others. This is also a um, big homework for me and for the government. Do they know how to contact ambulance? 75% point 10, the answer no. So how they can contact ambulances to bring the patient, to transport the patient from the hospital to their home or even inter-hospital evacuation, usually through their doctor or the nurses. So from that survey, from that research, uh, we, we, we call it time to treatment. Time to treatment is um, since the patient have sign and symptom until the patient treated in the hospital how many minutes how many how many hours the patient get uh, well treated in the hospital and our our result usually take three up to four hour the patient treated in the hospital because one patient delay the patient feel okay i will okay in a few hours and then it's not it's not okay and then they they decide to uh, go to the hospital, but it takes it spend two until three hours before, and then waiting for the transportation, and then duration or time duration to the hospital travel time, and then arrive to the hospital after arrive the hospital, is there any doctor's delay? If the hospital full or busy, usually they will wait for non emergency for non-emergency patient in here, usually they will wait 30 minutes to get treated or to get uh, examined by the doctors or by the nurses. So we have time to treatment and the result three up to four hours, uh, they just get the uh, treatment from the hospital. This is the survey in our uh, participant in the, in the training, in the emergency training. Does the emergency training has influenced the system, even in the hospital or in their province on the in their area? It's uh, ninety percent. They said no, and only ten percent said yes. So the impact the emergency training is not uh, is not good enough. This is uh, the data that we have from our participants. So this is my closing statement we cannot handle disaster properly if day to day emergency care is bad due to indonesia is supermarket of disasters so we have to improve our day to day emergency and right now our emergency day to day emergency in jakarta is not good enough so we have to increase our emergency care and the second one is uh, do not move disaster to the hospital. Otherwise, we just make another disaster. And the right patient to the right hospital by the right ambulance at the right time. Before the patient go to the hospital, you have to do the trials in the field. 
And then the hospital must have disaster plan, not only in hospital, but also outside hospital. Cooperation, collaborate with the other hospital, with the fire, with the police. And the right team in the right place at the right time with the right knowledge, skill, and right logistics. So number five from the ATLS manual book, decrease the three model distributor, three model that will hopefully will will happen in here in Indonesia. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for listening. Uh, good afternoon, I think. Thank you so much for that presentation. All right, and now, All right, we will proceed with our uh, technical sessions. Now for today, we will have two scientific sessions. One will be the evidence-based practices. So please, all that is under evidence-based practices, please stay in the main room and I will be your moderator. Then the second one is pandemic crisis management. So there will be a breakout room for that session. On your Zoom meeting, just right below, you will see there a breakout room. Just click on breakout room. Yeah, one moment. I think, hold on, one moment. My apologies. Um, we will have two sessions, different um, topics. First is the evidence-based evidence, evidence -based practices, and this will be a continuous technical session. Next, uh, the ne after, uh, we'll follow pandemic crisis management. management. My apologies. All right, we will now start with our session one, evidence-based practices. Let us welcome... Our session chair, Mr. Janar Tanan, Jawal Harial Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research, India. Good day, sir. And now let's call on our first presenter. Before we proceed, I would just like to remind everyone, all the presenters, that you are allotted 10 minutes of your time, uh, 10 minutes per presentation. And we will have a minute or two for the question and answer if um, our session chairs will have questions. Right? And hi, sir. Day. Welcome once again.
Right, everyone, let's welcome our session chair. Mr. Janarthanan. You are on mute, sir. Oh, there you go. Hi. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yeah. Uh, shall we proceed with the presentations? Because it is getting delayed already. All right. Um, our first presenter for today is Suda, Sudarani Banapagudar, School of Nursing Science, ITM University, India. Topic is self esteem of undergraduate nursing students across sectional study. So, there any? So, there any? Uh, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I need to screen, uh, share the screen. Can you please uh, able me to uh, share the screen? Yeah. All right. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Please proceed. Good afternoon to all. Uh, myself, Dr. Uh, Professor Sudharani Panapkorda, Professor, School of Nursing, Science, ITM University, Galia. My uh, title of the study, Self-Esteem of the Undergraduate Nursing Students, and it is a cross-sectional study. The aim of the study mm. is to assess the level of the self-esteem of the undergraduate nursing students. Introduction. At the base of the personality uh, is the psychic balance, and we know that self-esteem is an inner attitude, and in addition to that, it is also responsible for any adaptive processes over our uh, complete lifespan. Self-esteem plays a very vital role in constructing the clinical development and personality and the social psychology, a concept that is used in several disciplines also. So the role of the psychological function has been studied since ages, and self-esteem is uh, generated through the research literature to such an extent, which is harder to summarize also. As we know, the self-esteem, it refers to the perceptions of an individual feeling worthy and the sense of the satisfaction uh, uh, by uh, Mahatma Swami, Nagatomi, and uh, Mandi and in 2018. Even uh, the value uh, with the self, that is the, how we can analyze ourselves, uh, how we think about ourselves uh, uh, by the in 2001. So yeah, by Mahatma Swami and uh, Nogayaf and uh, Mandi in 2008, they say that it means the individual is how close to his real self or how he can understand by ideal himself. So uh, there are two components in the self-evaluation and the self-opinion. And that is uh, the one is the self-opinion, other one is the self-knowledge according to the uh, Guardio in 2005. And it is uh, the one own views. Okay, the self-esteem is nothing but it is one own views which plays an essential role in the way how the person thinks, how the person behaves and how they feel. Uh, and one of the most factors that are affecting the mental so the one of the most factors which is affecting uh, the mental health of an individual is the self-esteem 
and uh, the self esteem is precisely uh, identified just how much pride this individual spot on themselves and it's an evaluative elements of the self knowledge also higher the self esteem it refers to extremely positive and the favorable analysis of the self while the lower the self esteem it refers to the low concept of the self so um in the review of the literature uh, i have just quoted few of the literatures here which uh, have been uh, conducted by ladakh gs in 2013 and uh, trani uh, spray uh, in 2003 they said that the nature of the medical needs the medical students they are facing uh, the different stressful uh, circumstances while they are in their uh, clinical practice and there is a relation between the quality and uh, that is the self esteem and the quality of the nursing care Uh, which is being uh, provided by the nursing faculty, and it is also unquestionable. Because if we if we have higher self esteem, uh, we will be more confident in our work, and we can be uh, giving the best possible care to our patients. So in nursing, it is recommended that uh, self esteem is certainly one of the major uh, element on the habits of the nursing students. During the course of the study, uh, the uh, from the initial stage, from the basic nursing by first year till the fourth year. so uh, they uh, gain the skills they gain uh, the, the variety of situations they come across so it makes them competent themselves so the study is mainly intended uh, to see how much the competent are how they can perform uh, their uh, care during the patients so if they have a good self esteem good confident they would uh, provide a greater care to the patients so students that think good about themselves have fewer sleeplessness even evenings uh, comes and they are less uh, quickly to get stress of the conformity by the colleagues and are usually much less likely to utilize the medications uh, recur and are also more persistent at the job difficulties they are much happier and more sociable and are lot notably they have the tendency to do much better academically also by melanio and bolio in 2012 so as we know the nursing profession is a career and that requires a psychological health at a very accepted levels so uh, the outcome of the research has revealed that the psychological health of the nursing students is additionally impairing the student uh, studying and the regular life but the more there are some features and which are been serious even affecting the, their quality of the profession practice during the training in the future also therefore there must be a continuing education in the uh, profession so for that reason determining the elements and the impact of the psychological state plays an unique importance according to nixie looks uh, uh, who and lua wong and van in the year 2010 so nurses who possess the higher self esteem are more confident and have their abilities they trust they lead to uh, their work and they work effectively with the challenging situations so as we know nursing is just one of the stressful work in the community according to sasetes at all in the 2002 and macpherson 2003 they all uh, provided even the role of the self esteem as a moderator of the stress individuals are having the greater self esteem even in uh, various stressful situation have a higher feeling of the self worth and the self sufficiency and these all affect uh, the operate and help more successfully in various situation by uh, paspa uh, 2012 so as uh, clear the main objective was to study uh, was to assess the level of the self esteem of the basic bsc nursing students in the rama college of nursing kanpur uttar pradesh so the methods uh, and the materials which i have uh, implemented the research approach it is a descriptive approach was used for the current study for the assessment of the knowledge and of the self esteem among the nursing students the sampling uh, the sampling technique used in the current study is about the non probability purposive sampling and there were 210 students which were included in the uh, current study so the inclusion criteria only the basic bsc nursing students who are willing to attend and uh, who are uh, present for, uh, at the time of the data collection were included then uh, prior for the data collection the permission was taken from the uh, principal college of uh, nursing so the researcher informed and clarified about the study its purpose and assured that the uh, information given by them to be kept confidential and a written consent was also taken from the participants uh, the tool which is been used in the current study has consisting of two parts that is in the section a which consists of the socio demographic variables and the section b it also consists uh, of a, a level of a self esteem assessment the scale which is developed by rosenberg so the rosenberg scale it is a 10 point scale that is identifying the participants feeling towards self and the scoring uh, item was done on the four point like scale that is from the three from strongly agree to zero to strongly disagree 
for the questions 1 2 4 6 and 7 uh, and uh, for the questions uh, 3 5 uh, 8 9 and 10 reverse scoring was done that is 0 is strongly agree and 3 is strongly agree so the scale was ranged from 0 to 30 with the indication uh, as 30 as the highest score and the scores below the 15 were indicating the low self esteem and 15 to 25 indicate the normal range and 25 indicates the high self esteem so in the present study, that attack which was analyzed was using the SPSS uh, 26 version, and descriptive statistics were analyzed used uh, on the socio-demographic uh, profiles and obtained uh, from the survey questionnaire also. Then in order to find the association between the demographic variables, the chi-square uh, test uh, was applied to find the association of the uh, self-esteem scores at 0 0.05 interval. So here is my results. Uh, here the distribution of the 212 samples according to the social demographic profile. So the demographic profiles which I have added here is the year of the um, study, the age, the sex, the area they come from and uh, the area where they are staying and which family they belong to and the type of the family they belong to, the level of the stress, the problem solving, uh, sharing, the suicide tendencies and the health problems. So the results of out of 210 participants, I received 28.6 were studying the first year and 17.6% in the second year and 22.9% in the third year and 31% uh, of the students of the fourth year. So the maximum number of uh, students belong from the fourth year BSc nursing program. So in the social demographic profile obtained from the students, deficit data. The majority of the participants, that is 81.9% for the females, maximum or belonging to the age group of 19 to 20 years, that is 61%. Then majority of the participants reported that they come from the urban areas, that is 91%. Then upon assessment, they were 50% uh, of the participants reported that they stay uh, or they reside in the hostel and 66% were staying uh, in their own house. When the family income was compared, the majority of the participants belong to uh, the income group of less than 1 lakh and majority belong to the nuclear families. When the stress level was reported, the re stress level reported was the mild was 42.4%, moderate uh, stress level was 43.8%, and severe was 13.8%. Uh, the problem solving um, uh, aspect, the many of the students said that they shared their problems with their uh, parents, that is 45.3%, and 37.2% with the friends, and 17.6% did not share with anyone their problems. Even the party participants revealed that 93.8% did not have any suicidal tendencies, but 6.2% of the students reported they have having the suicidal tendencies. So the, uh, the maximum participants had no health problems, but 32.9% of the students reported they had their, some of the health issues. So when I speak about the level of the self-esteem among the participants, so an assessment level of the uh, esteem has been tabulated in the above uh, table, and it shows the highest level of the students reported the normal level of the self-esteem, that is 73.3%, and 23.8% had low levels of self-esteem, and 2.9% had a high level of the uh, self-esteem. So the finding uh, of the present study reveals that the total self-esteem scores were 17.81 uh, uh, at the standard deviation of 3.2 double H. So when uh, the association with the social demographic variables with the um, uh, social demographic variables through the chi-square, so there was no any association found in uh, the social demographic variables, but I got uh, the um, uh, association at uh, one place, that is uh, the level of the stress, where it was uh, significant at uh, 0 0.05. So when I, uh, the discussion, uh, the part, the predominance of the female student, that is more over 81.9% were observed in the uh, study, which is the characteristics of the nursing courses worldwide. As we know that nursing is being more operated by the female students also. And the study is designed to assess the self-esteem of the nursing students regarding the st uh, student level of their self-esteem in the present clearly revealed that there were only six students, that is 2.9% student had a high level of the self-esteem, while 154 students, that is 70. 3% uh, reported the normal level of the self-esteem and only 50 students have uh, that is 23.8 with a low self-esteem level. So this is a disagreement with who has indicated that the highest present uh, of the student that is 88.6 had the high level of uh, Y11.4 uh, had low self-esteem uh, in a study done by ML2003. Uh, so the present study supports the results who have indicated that 97.5% of the students are having a moderate level of the self-esteem and 2.5% uh, had a, having a low self-esteem according to the study conducted by Mani yes, at 2006. 
So there are many similar studies conducted by Ibrahim R. F. 2015. Even they showed that both the male and the female student respondent showed a positive perception of the cell, their self-esteem, while perceived self-esteem of the male student was compared with the female uh, corresponding using uh, the t-test at uh, p um, level 0 0.05 and it was 0 0.948. Right? Additionally, the fourth grade shows even the high level of the self-esteem than the uh, fresher candidates than the other grades. So a study which was conducted by Lupus Chavez reported concerning self-esteem level at 68% uh, percent presented a high self-esteem and 30% average and 2% low. So a positive relationship was found between the level of the self-esteem and the professional perspective at uh, p is equal to 0 0.01 level. So my, I conclude here with my topic and the final that is the self-esteem is a term of the psychology that implies one's level of the confidence and respect to one's own at themselves. So self-esteem comprises a dignity, pride, shame and emotions. So it is the one's own experience where the self-esteem is highly being influenced. Positive experiences have a good self-esteem and the negative does not uh, does the opposite. So nurses are the ones who provide a comprehensive care for the patients for which a nurse should be a good high self-esteem. So self-esteem makes her to be committed and gives her the greater satisfaction. Um, thank you and thanks for providing an opportunity to be a part of uh, presentation. Thank you once again. If you have any questions, I can Thank answer. you so much. Good. Any questions from a chair? The ma'am, sir, is not unmuted, I think. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, that was a <clears throat> good presentation and the topic which you have chosen is also very much applicable uh, to the students' community. I just have one clarification. Um, you said that uh, nearly 6.2% of the students uh, were having suicidal tendencies. Uh, I mean, like, what did you do about it? I mean, have you done anything uh, to address uh, the suicidal tendencies of those students? I mean, like, because it is very important actually to address them. Uh, sir, uh, for that uh, particular students, uh, I have gathered the students at a place and uh, I have, uh, because uh, the suicidal tendencies, mainly the students face because they are not able to share their problems uh, with their parents nor with the friends. They uh, are uh, the introverted persons. So I suggested them uh, to that if uh, they are facing any problems, like for example, even in the study, because they all come from the rural areas and the rural backgrounds. So for that purpose, I suggested them that uh, in the initial cases, they might be uh, feeling uh, difficult or they might be uh, not coping with the uh, new uh, topics or the subjects. If they are having the problem, they need to uh, go to the teachers or the mentors or the parents or the best friends, and they can share their problems and get problems solved. So with that also, they can go with the uh, meditations and all. So that will be an additional help. And repeated practices also can uh, in, uh, increase uh, their skills also, which can influence uh, the best possible care for them. So uh, that is what I have suggested for only those uh, students. Thank you, sir. Anything, sir? Thank you so much. Ma'am, sir is not muted, I think. Sir has been kept muted. Yeah, okay, fine. Thank you so much, ma'am. We will move on to the next presentation. Thank you. That mute yeah. button is really acting weird. All right, so let's thank you so much for that presentation. Let's proceed. Our, to our next presenter, Anjali Kaushik, Rufauda College of Nursing, Jai Jamia Hamdard, Deem Siddhi University, India. Topic is about the knowledge on air pollution and its impact on health among young adults in Delhi. I Anjali? 
and you are muted too. Hold on. There or here. Okay, thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, I'll share my screen. Um, can you please allow me to share the screen? I think I have to do this to all the participants. Hold on. I'm not able to share the screen. There. Can you do now? Mm. No. Okay. Now, now, now I can. Yes. Thank you. So are you able to see the screen now? Yes. Yes. So thank you so much. I, I would like to thank the organizers and uh, um, the um, ITM University for allowing me to present this paper here on this platform. And uh, I'll be starting the presentation. So my topic is knowledge on air pollution and its impact on health among young adults in Delhi. So uh, I'll start the introduction with uh, the quote that air pollution is not a joke. Air pollution will make you choke. And environmental pollution is known as the main challenge of urban life and imposes significant health and financial losses to the countries. Among environmental risk factors, air pollution is introduced as the most important one. According to a report by WHO, indoor and outdoor air pollution causes 7 million deaths annually. The majority of these deaths occur in developing countries and acute and chronic exposures to air pollution lead to many health outcomes such as cardiovascular, respiratory, uh, cerebrovascular disorders. Air pollution originates from various sources but mainly caused by human activities such as vehicles, industries, etc. Solid, liquid, gaseous materials released into the air from natural resources or human activities impose damage to the human, plants and animals health and the ecosystem balance. The most polluted cities cannot be determined based on the available data, but yet, although according to the WHO database, air pollution is high in number of cities in China, India, Iran, etc. And uh, the most important health burden of air pollution can be seen in developing countries. Lack of knowledge about the health effects of air pollution is the biggest obstacle in defined activities and social organizations and international sources. The health sector plays a key role for leading a multi-pronged approach to prevent exposure to air pollution. It can encourage and support other sectors, that is transport, housing, energy, and industry in the development and application of long-term policies to reduce the health risk of air pollution. Pollution enter the earth atmosphere in many ways. Most air pollution is created by the people taking the form of emissions from the factories, cars, planes, or aerosol cans. Secondhand cigarette smoke is also considered air pollution. People experience a wide range of health effects from being exposed to air pollution, and effects can be broken down into short-term effects and the long-term effects. Short-term effects, which are temporary, include illness such as pneumonia, bronchitis, and they also include discomfort such as irritation to the nose, throat, eyes, and skin. Long-term effects of air pollution can last for years or for an entire lifetime. They can even lead to a person's death. Long-term health effects from air pollution include heart diseases, lung cancer, and respiratory diseases such as emphysema. Keeping in mind all the facts and, and to create the awareness regarding air pollution and its prevention, researcher conducted the study. So objectives of the studies what the, uh, to assess the pollution regarding, uh, assess the knowledge regarding air pollution and its impact on health among young adults studying in selected colleges of Delhi, and to prepare and disseminate health booklet on prevention of air pollution. Regarding the methodology, research approach, quantitative research approach with cross-sectional design was used, sampling technique was convenient sampling technique, and 200 samples were taken. And after obtaining ethical permission from the Institutional Ethical Committee of Jamia Hamdard, New Delhi, to conduct the research study. Informed consent were taken from each study subject, and they were short of anonymity and confidentiality of the information provided during the study. Structured questionnaire was used to collect the data. And the questionnaire consists of two parts, that is demographic information and knowledge regarding air pollution. Now the results. So here, this is a social demographic uh, data of the subjects. Here we can see that uh, in the age um, maximum, that is 68% were in the age group of 17 to 20 years, and 57% were male, and 20, here 72.5% were Muslims, followed by 26% uh, Hindus, 
And in the education, 42% were graduate, 40% were senior secondary, and the preferred mode of transport. Here, 51.5% students were using public transport, and 42% were using their private uh, mode of transport. And regarding the vehicle at home, here we can see that 81% they were having motorcycle at their home, and 64% they were having cars at their home. So next is the information regarding vehicle ownership. Only 43% of the subjects were having one motorcycle and 23% of the subjects had two motorcycles and 6.5% of the subjects had more than two motorcycles. 37% of the subjects had one car and 20%, 20.5% subjects had two cars and 6 or 7% had more than two cars. Information regarding fuel consumption. 87% subjects were using petrol as a fuel, whereas 11% of the subjects were consuming diesel. Then information regarding frequency of air pollution check. Here, 40% of the subjects said, uh, said that they did not uh, uh, did the uh, pollution check. And uh, like uh, they did only once a year. 36% said that they did twice a year. And 16.5% said that they never did pollution check. And 12% of the subjects not using personal vehicle. Regarding the knowledge score on air pollution. So possible range of score were 0 to 30. Obtained range of score were 5 to 25. Mean was 16.47, median 17, and standard deviation 4.48. Then frequency and percentage distribution of subjects by their knowledge score on air pollution here, adequate and inadequate. They were divided into two categories. So here we can see that 94% of the study subjects, they had inadequate knowledge on air pollution. Discussion, the findings of the present study are in line with those of al Kamis and Almari, where the knowledge of indoor pollution was poor and in the present study knowledge assessment about outdoor air pollution was done which was found to be inadequate also the two studies agreed that there was a little advancement in the education on this topic within the examined population a study conducted by sharma art to assess the effectiveness of structured teaching program regarding knowledge on effect of air pollution on health among high school students in selected high school in bangalore revealed that students had poor or inadequate knowledge regarding air pollution which is consistent with the findings of the present study where 94% students had inadequate knowledge about air pollution. Air pollution can directly or indirectly affect human health, causing physical discomfort and leading to disease or even death. Studies have shown that when the human to high polluted air or a long time, the mortality rate, rate increases. Therefore, there is a need to create awareness among people about air pollution as the air we breathe has a lot of effect on our health. People have more number of vehicles that not only pollute air, but also have serious health effects. Vehicles, if not maintained properly, not checked for pollution, create more pollution. Fuels like solar energy, CNG should be promoted. The conclusion, the present study revealed that 94% of the samples had inadequate knowledge on air pollution. And the study thus implies that awareness regarding air pollution, its ill effect on health and how to find an alternative should be created at all the levels. Air quality is becoming poor and poor day by day, especially in metropolitan cities like Delhi. So I would like to acknowledge here the uh, participants and the post-basic BS nursing students. For so these are the references. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have questions? All right, seems none. Let's go ahead and proceed with our next presenter. Let us welcome Jyoti Kadyan, N C I A I I M S, Jajar, Jajar, India. The topic is about feasibility study to examine the effect of yoga intervention on pain, fatigue, and quality of life among children receiving chemotherapy. Jyoti? Jyoti Kadyan. All 
All right, let's proceed with our next presenter. Oral presentation by Lalita R. on the Cherry Institute of Medical Sciences, India. Topic is a study to assess the effect of SDP on knowledge regarding the ill effects of alcoholism among college students in Pondicherry. All right, I think um, Jyoti is already here. Hello, good afternoon. There you go. Hi. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good, good afternoon, afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the disturbance. I'm ready to share my screen. Can I share, ma'am? Um, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, are you able to see me? See my not slides? Ma'am, are you able to see my slides? No, not yet. Not yet. I have, I have already shared. Ma'am, I have already. Uh... Ma'am, are you able to see? Yes, it's coming up. It's there now. Go okay, ahead, please. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to present my paper. Uh, I have done this study during my MSCPN course. And uh, my guide was Dr. Poonam Joshi, uh, Associate Professor, College of Nursing Ames. And presently, I'm working as a nursing officer in NCA Jajar Ames. My research title was a feasibility study to examine the effect of yoga intervention on pain perception, fatigue, and quality of life in children undergoing chemotherapy. Ma'am, am I audible? Ma'am, am I audible? Hello, ma'am. Ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay, yes, okay. we can hear Thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, regarding the introduction, cancer is one of the most feared diseases, starting from its uh, from the disease and its progression from metastasis to bone and. Uh, organs, diagnostic procedures of cancer and adverse effects of tre its treatment, such as uh, during chemotherapy, radiation and surgery, causing physical, psychological and emotional problems that adversely affect the quality of life of patients, especially the children. Around the world, cancer is among the leading cause of death, causing death of more than 8.2 million people. Worldwide, approximately 1,60,000 new, new cases are uh, reported and 90,000 deaths occur every year due to cancer in children younger than 15 years and it is the most uh, ninth most common cause of death among children aging between 5 to 14 years in children in India and most of the children undergo chemotherapy for two uh, two and a half to three and a half years along with uh, radiation therapy surgery and combination of these modalities and this chemotherapy is uh, given in three phases such as induction remission and maintenance and at the, uh, during the, uh, this treatment, uh, at the same time, this successful treatment outcomes may accompany high level of some, uh, symptom burden related to treatment side effects such as fatigue, sleep disturbances, nausea, vomiting, pain, sadness and other. These adverse uh, symptoms either caused by cancer or its treatment can be improved by yoga interventions and thereby improving their quality of life. 
and this yoga has shown good results in elevating the chemotherapy related neuro peripheral neuropathic pain and fatigue in cancer patients yoga has also positive effects on the psychosocial health outcomes such as uh, health related uh, quality of life cancer related distress symptoms and sleep however uh, limited researches are available on providing yoga intervention and catering to the patient's need and comfort uh, several studies on uh, of yoga in adult cancer practicing in this yoga while receiving treatment has reinforced the need of conducting more trial based on existing feasibility data and primary outcomes in pediatric and adolescent cancer patients and a very few uh, existing studies supported also the role of yoga in improving the mental well being fatigue sleep quality and other aspects of quality of life in children facing treatment related side effects so however more needs uh, more researches are needed in for exploring these additional benefits of yoga so objectives of this study was uh, it was divided into two that is primary and secondary primary was to see the effect of uh, yoga on pain perception in children undergoing chemotherapy and also to assess the effect of yoga on fatigue in these children and secondary outcome was to assess the effect of yoga on quality of life of these children undergoing chemotherapy uh, in the hypothesis the first hypothesis says that yoga will uh, reduce the pain perception at a level of, of 0.05 level of significance as measured by numerical pain rating scale and second hypothesis says uh, yoga will reduce the fatigue among these children at 0.05 level of significance as measured by the fatigue scale and the third hypothesis says uh, yoga will improve the quality of life of these children who are receiving chemotherapy at a level of 0.05 level of significance as measured by pql cancer module regarding the methodology uh, in this pre experimental study 42 children with cancer undergoing chemotherapy meeting the inclusion criteria were enrolled from daycare centers of aims new delhi and the data was collected using a pre validated subject data sheet and standardized questionnaire uh, you, uh, such as numerical pain rating scale for pain management, uh, pain measurement, Pete's facet scale for measuring the fatigue, and Pete's QL cancer module at a, uh, for uh, for assessing the quality of life at baseline. And then it was followed by a 45 minutes yoga therapy supervised and researcher facilitated yoga interventions for 12 weeks through physical and online mode. Because this study was conducted during COVID period, pre-COVID and COVID period. So it was uh, done physically and online both. And the additional yoga, uh, yoga module based video was also provided to the children for home practices for, um, for improving the compliance to the practices under the parental supervision and a child's logbook was also maintained by the researcher and a whatsapp uh, whatsapp social media whatsapp was also used for communication with children and parents for getting the pics of the pictures uh, from the home whether they are practicing and how they are practicing and doing at home the same yoga practices uh, yoga module that was ta taught to them at the aim setup and uh, the changes in pain and fatigue scores were assessed at uh, month one second and third month and the quality of life was assessed at the end that is the third month of the study these are some pictures of the yoga uh, that are showing the uh, how online sessions were taken for the children uh, by the yoga therapist and these uh, practice sessions were taken at aims and it was facilitated by the researcher and this practice is uh, these are some of the more pictures that were the practice session that were given to the children at 12 session at uh, uh, in the aim setup and this was the yoga module that was prepared for them uh, uh, to be practiced at home and this uh, this was the video that was provided to them for practicing at home this is the glimpse of that video that uh, in this uh, all the all the module uh, all the practices all the exercises all the 12 to 14 exercises were included and this was given to the patients when, when they were coming to the hospital uh, for the practices so that they can practice at home sorry uh, come in. next and these are the pictures of the practice sessions at home that were taken through whatsapp uh, through their parents and from them so uh, whether they are practicing regularly at home to have the maximum effect of the, the yoga intervention given to them and these are the uh, some more pictures and the data analysis was done using the appropriate appropriate descriptive statistics and inferential statistics and uh, frequency, percentage, mean, standard deviation, and range were calculated in the descriptive statistics. And pair t test was used to compare the same group at different times, that is, at was first, second, and third month, with a level of significance less than 0.05. Coming to the results, 
according to the subject data sheet and socio uh, demographic details majority of children who were enrolled were males 73.8% within uh, standard deviation of uh, of 1.62 years uh, taking primary education most of the parents of the children who were coming were in the age group of 36 to 40 uh, 36 to 40 years and educated up to senior secondary level and nearly 60% of the children were residing in the area located more than 10 kilometers from aims and majority of children who were enrolled were having leukocyte tumors coming for the chemotherapy and uh, hemo hemogram was also assessed for all the enrolled children done before intervention and that was uh, found to be under acceptable range and uh, this is the table showing the comparison of pain scores at baseline first month second and third uh, and uh, there was a significant uh, difference was seen at, uh, from baseline to the third month and uh, showing a p value of less than 0.01 which was found to be very effective and the second table shows the comparison of fatigue scores at base, uh, base baseline first month second month and third month this was also found very effective that the yoga intervention was effective with a p value of 0.0, uh, less than 0.01 and uh, the third table was showing the comparison of baseline uh, baseline quality of life at the at baseline and third month and uh, the the various domains of the quality of life or overall quality of life was also assessed that was also found very effective that it has improved and uh, other domains such as pain hurt nausea perceives anxiety treatment anxiety other domains were also found to be having significant changes with a p value of less than 0.01 so the major finding says uh, can be uh, analyzed such as uh, pair t tests indicate a significant reduction in pain scores with a p value of 0.001 after practicing yoga and fatigue levels also reduced with a p value of less than 0.001 and quality of life also also improved significantly in various domains such as pain hurt anxiety cognitive problem communication and perceived physical appearance coming to the discussion uh, in the discussion uh, linder and hooke in 2019 did a study on uh, ch same children receiving this uh, treatment uh, chemotherapy that that was uh, part of our study also and he also assessed uh, done a systemic review and the result shows that pay, uh, he uh, he also addressed that pain is highly distressing very prevalent and distressing in where varying in trajectory across the cycles of chemotherapy across the multiple cycle of treatment ultimately causing the poor functional status which was in agreement of uh, of the the present study and noon et al in 2017 also did a cross sectional study to examine the relationship of fatigue and quality of life of the children receiving uh, of cancer having cancer this uh, that study also shows that majority that 66.7% of participants were uh, having problem with uh, with cancer have a problem with fatigue and was associated with poor quality of life this was also in agreement of this study and jens et al in 2009 they also did a uh, uh, descriptive study related to complementary and alternative med uh, medicine used in pediatric uh, used by pediatric patients with cancer which shows that 75% of parents use this alternative medicine that is yoga and other acupuncture and other um, therapies for these patients and this was also in agreement with the with present study and hb et al in 2019 did a study to see the feasibility study to examine the therapeutic effect of yoga in uh, pediatric brain tumor patients and provided a development of an rct and the results of that this study their study shows that there is a significant reduction in pain that is 0.001 and reduced uh, fatigue level also reduced by 0.007 uh after uh, practicing the yoga use uh, using the yoga and have a uh, uh, overall significant and uh, promoting the use of yoga in the in patients having cancer and receiving the cancer treatment this was also in agreement with the present study the recommendation of my study uh, says all the type of uh, all type of uh, pediatric oncology patients should be included uh, uh, receiving chemotherapy should be included because uh, in in the present study only solid and liquid tumors were included other tumors also can be included and can be given yoga therapy and randomized control trial should be planned to assess better outcomes of the uh, yoga on quality of life receiving cancer treatment because the present study was only single uh, um, 
what was not rct it was a pre test and post test design so rct would give a better results and larger sample because only 42 children were assessed for the effect of yoga so larger sample study should be conducted for longer duration to examine the benefits of integrating yoga into the cancer treatment uh, regarding the conclusion uh, yoga intervention was found effective in reducing the pain fatigue and consequently improving the quality of life of these children undergoing chemotherapy and building the foundation of yoga in to be used in pediatric oncology settings and nurses play a provider role in coordinating and collaborating yoga with conventional treatment that is given that is chemotherapy radiation and other therapies in the hospital setting so that they can have maximum effect and can the adverse effect can be reduced and their quality of life can be improved so nurses can play a vital role if uh, she uh, she she can coordinate well and provide them better care if they integrate this thing with the conventional treatment thank you so much thank you so much do we have questions All right, seems done. Let's go ahead and proceed with our next presenter. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Rubella, you're very much welcome. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Next, an oral presentation by Jamal Fatima, Rufaida College of Nursing, Jam Jamia Hamdard, deemed to be University India. The topic is about a descriptive study to assess the knowledge regarding the first aid measures among school teachers in selected school of New Delhi. Jamal? Jamal Fatima. All right, it seems next presenter, all our presentation by Jaikwad Sujata Govindrao, MGM Mother Teresa College of Nursing India. The topic is about a study to assess the knowledge regarding diarrhea. Sorry, I lost my screen. Hold on. Yes, ma'am. There, regarding diarrhea among the mothers of under five children in selected area of Aurangabad city. Sujata? Yes. Hi. Hi, ma'am. Go ahead, please share your screen. Yes, ma'am. Can you visible now? Yes, it is. Please proceed. Okay, ma'am. Um, thank you, ma'am, for giving me opportunity to introduce me. First one, uh, so in, in that uh, international conference on reforming the health system in transition of clinical research into the clinical practices. In that my uh, statement of presentation, a study to assess the knowledge regarding the diarrhea among the mothers of under five child in selected area of Aurangabad cities. In that first one introduction, the child are our most and precious resources in other world. 
child are building human resources future citizen of nation healthy child are not only asset but also the stepping stone to build the strong and propitious nation there is survival protection development prerequisite for development of humanity protecting the health development of the child is a very long term contribution to growth and development of country as a whole in that as a child constitute one third of the total population it become the imperative to monitor the health status of the child in country and also taking care of the child is very important issue because the child are most vulnerable to malnutrition morbidity and mortality diarrheal diseases are major public health problem among the under 5 child and diarrheal diseases constitute one of the major cause of the morbidity and mortality especially in the child below the 5 years of age the morbidity rate in the term of diarrhea episode per year per child under the age of 5 years of the uh, about the 2 millions of the child therefore there is a need for the mothers to enable to take care of the child in suffering from the diarrhea that is home homemade fluids continuous feeding during the uh, diarrhea so need of my study diarrhea is a major killing disease in under 5 child in the india thus the important public health problem the alarming situation created by delay in initiation of treatment inadequate hydration in high morbidity worldwide diarrheal diseases is second leading cause of the death in child under 5 years of old that is according to who that is world health organization more than 10 millions under 5 child die every years about 1.5 millions are diarrhea related death in the world bacterial viral parasite agent ingested through the contaminated drinking water food can result in diarrhea numbers of the people lack access to improve the water and sanitation 884 million and 2.6 billion respectively in that aspect a statement of my study a study to assess the knowledge regarding the diarrhea among the mothers of under 5 child in the selected area of aurangabad city objective of my study to determine the knowledge regarding the diarrhea among the mothers of under 5 child to find the association between the knowledge of mothers of under 5 child regarding the diarrhea with the selected demographic variables assumption of my study diarrhea is a one of the major problem which affect the health of under 5 child second one the mothers of under 5 child have inadequate knowledge about the diarrhea third one assessment of the knowledge of mother can help to identify the level of knowledge regarding the diarrhea area of knowledge is lacking fourth one the knowledge of mothers regarding the diarrhea may prevent the diarrhea among under the 5 years of child in that uh, next one research methodology in that research approach descriptive approach research design is descriptive study design setting up my study in selected area of aurangabad city sample size mothers of under 5 childs sampling technique non probability purpose sampling technique i have used sampling size that is 30 mothers of under 5 childs in description of the tool that is section a and section b in that section a is demographic variable and section b is self administered knowledge questionnaire in that for correct answer scoring zero as uh, correct answer is one and incorrect answer is scoring is uh, uh, one so in that first one the result of my study the data is collected from the mothers of under 5 child are organized and presented at the following headings in that section 3 is divided first section is frequency and percentage of distribution of demographic variable second an analysis of knowledge of core on diarrhea third one association of knowledge score of mothers of under 5 child with the selected demographic variables in that section first frequency and percentage of distribution of demographic variables this is deal with the data pertaining to baseline performance of mothers of under 5 child the data analyzed by using of the descriptive statistics and presented in the form of frequency and percentage the majority of the respondents were 23 were the between the age group of 18 to 25 26 belong to hindu religion each having the one child and two child respectively were from the nuclear family remaining were from the joint family of the family where the uh, 16% of mother were the secondary education and 28 of the mother is housewife and 13 from the monthly family income that is and utilize the private hospital in that uh, section 2 in analysis of the knowledge score on the diarrhea first one knowledge score that is inadequate uh, moderately adequate and adequate that is inadequate that is 10% moderately adequate that is 76.66% and adequate knowledge that is 13.33 percentage 
Section three, association of the knowledge score of the mothers of under five child with the selected demographic variables. There was no significant association between the knowledge score and selected demographic variable. That is age, type of house, and religions. In discussion of this study, the present study, despite the majority of the twenty-three mothers of under five child had moderately knowledge about the diarrhea remaining 4% of mother had in, uh, had adequate knowledge and 3% have inadequate knowledge there is a no significant association between the knowledge score regarding the diarrhea in selected demographic variable at 0.05 level of significant the similar study was conducted to assess the knowledge of mother of under 5 child regarding the management of diarrhea in pediatric opd at government medical college and hospital chandigarh in the finding of this study 260 subject had Uh, 23 had the good knowledge 73 had average knowledge and 4 having poor knowledge regarding management of diarrhea in under 5 child there was association between the knowledge score marital status the study concluded that the majority of under 5 ch child having average knowledge regarding the management of diarrhea in the conclusion of my study from the present study result revealed the majority of 23 having the mothers having moderately adequate knowledge remaining 4% having mothers having adequate knowledge and 3% having inadequate knowledge in that nursing implication of my study first one nursing practices a nurse can be role, important role in prevention and management of diarrhea nurse should create the awareness among the people that is diarrheal diseases it is preventive measure and management the nurse has to motivate the uh, to proper the follow diarrheal management measure should be taken by nurse to motivate the mothers to maintain the healthy environment in around the community next one the mother should be made aware the diarrhea and its complication nursing education the student nurse should be well prepared and adequate knowledge to give the prompt information to mothers and public on the diarrhea management and its prevention among the under 5 childs by motivating the nursing student they can motivate the public in area of residents to bring about the awareness regarding unhealthy environment next one nursing administration the nurse administration is highly authority uh, must be hold discussion and meeting on the preventing health status of the people based on the knowledge of the people assess and awareness prevention and program can be plan and implement the nurse administrator at various healthcare delivery system should focus in last one the nursing research the finding of the uh, study showed the majority of mother had moderately adequate knowledge regarding the diarrhea among under 5 child they will be motivated being the research group to conduct the same study with the different variable in rastered uh, ref in the references i have used and thank you ma'am thank you so much do you have any questions all right let's proceed we have an oral presentation by pragna narayan rao masram maharashtra university of health sciences in india a study to assess the effectiveness of self self instructional module on knowledge regarding effects of junk food on mental health and among the undergraduate students at selected colleges pranya pranya Go ahead. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Firstly, uh, uh, thank you so much for giving me opportunity on this huge platform. Let me share my PPT. thank you so much for third international conference on nursing science and healthcare and the theme of today's conference that is reforming the healthcare system transition of clinical research into the clinical practice this is the scientific paper presentation thank you so much first of all thank you so much to all the organizers for giving me the room in the scientific paper presentation 
for today's scientific paper presentation topic is to assess the effectiveness of self instructional module on knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health myself pradna masra i'm currently working as a nursing tutor in one of the institute of jawahar medical foundation dhule maharashtra title of the study a study to assess if this of self module knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate student at selected colleges as we all know that the uh, undergraduate uh, um junk food uh, eating junk food is one of the fashion nowadays everyone wants the junk food no matter what's the age group but they are still craving for the junk food as it attracts all of us introduction if the junk food is the devil then the sweet orange is the scripture in today's world scenario junk food has become the prominent feature in today's world scenario the junk food has become a prominent feature of diet for adolescent student many adolescent like to eat junk food but they aware unaware of harmful effects of junk food but they unaware of harmful effects of junk food on their health as well as the mental health world as adolescent population it is uh, 1200 million person about 20% of total population faces a series of serious nutritional challenges as this stages caloric uh, and uh, as at this stage the calories and the protein requirements are minimal but poor eating habits leading to the nutritional challenges the main nutrition problem affecting to the adolescent population worldwide include under the nutrition and obesity there are various effects of junk food on mental health as well as on the physical health the findings of new study out of oxford dictionary in uk which revealed that the processed junk food consumption can lead to the aggression irritability depressive tendency and even violent tendency the consumption of junk junk food has become the global phenomena need of the study as the adolescent is the most crucial period of transition for the overall human development nutritional requirement in the proper portion is needed particularly in this stage clinically it has been proved that of junk is well the required level and it its intake leads to the many disorder hence the study was undertaken to generate the awareness among the people especially uh, especially on especially in the adolescent about the harmful effect of junk food consumption which leads to the improvement in the health of people furthermore furthermore it will provide the adolescents on any options to invest their pocket money in by buy, in buying the nutrients rich food then the objective of my study to assess the pretest knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate students at selected colleges second objective to assess the effectiveness of self instructional module on knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate students at selected colleges then third objective to assess the post uh, to assess the postest knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate students at selected colleges and fourth one to find out the association between the pretest knowledge score regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate students with their selected demographic variable at selected colleges then the hypothesis of my study that is null hypothesis there is no significant difference between the pretest and postest knowledge score regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate student then first hypothesis that is um, re research hypothesis uh, there is a significant difference between the pretest and postest knowledge score then second uh, research hypothesis that is there is a significant association between the pretest knowledge score regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among their selected demographic variables with their selected demographic variables among the undergraduate students in the research methodology in this study pre experimental computed research design i was uh, was adopted based on the problem statement and objective of the study evaluative approach was used the purpose of evaluative approach to study the effectiveness of self instruction module on knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate students at selected colleges here the investigator identifies and evaluate the effectiveness of self instruction module with the help of 30 self 
uh, structured questionnaires related to the effects of junk food. The population and the sample were undergraduate students who are who were fulfilling the inclusive and exclusive criteria, and sample consists of hundred undergraduate students. The sample, uh, the sample random, the simple random sampling technique was used. Tool used for the study collection include two sessions, namely the demographic variable and structured questionnaire on the knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate students. Then uh, in the selection criteria, inclusion and exclusion criteria, in the inclusion criteria, undergraduates uh, include in the study who were are able to read, read, uh, read and write uh, English language, then willing to participate in the study other than healthcare professions, present at the time of data collection. In the exclusive data, undergraduate excluded from the study those who are having any kind of health issue at the time of data collection. Then the finding of the study, I discuss the finding of the study at the four sections, that is section one, section two, section three, and the section four. Section one, it deals with the analysis of demographic data of the undergraduate students at selected colleges in the terms of frequency and the percentage. Second section, it deals with the analysis of the it deals with the analysis of data related to the assessment of knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate students at selected colleges in terms of frequency and percentage then second section deals with the analysis of data related to the effectiveness of self instructional module on knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate students at selected colleges in terms of average pre-test uh, pre and the post-test. Then fourth section, it deals with the analysis of the data related to the association of knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate student with the selected demographic cat. Sorry, it deals with the analysis of the data to the association of knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health with the selected demographic characteristics of the undergraduate students at selected colleges. This is the section one description in the form of frequency and percentage description where the variables are age, gender, education, education of the father, education of mother and the occupation of father. In the age section, uh, in the age group, mostly the students who were belongs from 20 to 25 age group in the gender, 53% of male, 57% of female, then in the education, uh, only 12% are illiterate primary school education of 80%, secondary school education of 38%, and graduate and above were 32%. In the education of mother, literates, uh, illiterates were 9%, primary school education is of 57%, then secondary school education is of 34%, and graduates and above were no, uh, no any no woman from graduates and above. Occupation of the father. In the occupation of the father, go government service were 37%, private sex sector were 51%, business persons 10%, labor person 0%, and unemployed were 2%. Uh, moving to the next, occupation of the mother, government servants were 14%, private services were 13%, uh, business 19%, and homemaker were 54%. Family income and the month, uh, family income per month below uh, below thousand per uh, below ten thousand it is of two percent ten thousand to twenty thousand it is of forty percent twenty thousand to forty thousand it is of twenty one percent and above forty thousand it is of thirty seven in the type of uh, family nuclear family where sixty nine percent sixty seven sixty nine percent joint family where thirty one percent extended family zero and the single parent family were zero. Area of the residence in that urban area and the rural area. Urban area, it is of 69% and the rural area, it is of 31%. Monthly pocket money uh, given to the given to the undergraduate student by the parent in that zero to thousand per, uh, rupees, it is zero. Thousand to two thousand, it is also zero. zero. And two thousand to three thousand, it is 43% and three thousand and above, it is 54, 57%. In the sec uh, section three, the description of general assessment of knowledge regarding the pretest that is, uh, 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 I described the pretest knowledge score in the form of poor knowledge, average knowledge, and the good knowledge. Poor knowledge were about uh, 10 to, uh, I divide the poor knowledge from 10 to um, 0 to 10, which is of 30 
8% of undergraduate students have the poor knowledge regarding the junk food effects. Then 22 uh, average knowledge, it is grouped in 22, uh, 11 to 20 and 62% under, uh, of undergraduate students have uh, average knowledge regarding the junk food. In the pre-test, no one have good knowledge score. And the average knowledge score of pre-test, it is 11.19 with the standard deviation of 1.44. And this one is the demographic uh, presentation of the whole pre-test data assessment. Then the assessment of the post-test in that also the same pre-test, uh, poor knowledge, average knowledge, and the good knowledge. Average knowledge uh, in the post-test, no, uh, no one having the uh, poor knowledge score and the average knowledge score of 12% and good knowledge square uh, score of 88% with the standard uh, the average score of the post is 2.15 which is of with the standard deviation 1.75 and this one is also similar as the post test diagrammatic presentation this is the post pre test versus post test in the pre test the average knowledge score of all the undergraduate students which is about 11.19 which is with the standard deviation of 1.44 and in the post test 23.15 which is with the standard deviation of 1.75 there is this increase and there is an improvement in the knowledge of students Then the final result of the study, uh, a comparison of the pre-test and post-test mean of the knowledge were done by the pair t-test. Uh, pre-test average score was 11.19 with the standard deviation of 1.44 and the post-test average score were post-test average score were 23.15 with the standard deviation of 1.75. The test statistic value of pair t-test was 63.99 with the p-value of 0, 0. The p-value is less than 0 0.05. It indicates the H1 is accepted. The H1 of the study is significant difference between the pre-test knowledge score and the post-test knowledge score. Shows that self-instructional module was self-instructional self module on the knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate students was effective. This Chi-square test was conducted to see the association of knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the on mental health with the selected demographic characteristics of undergraduate students at selected colleges. The chi-square test was conducted at 5% level of significance. Then the significant association for the demographic variable, the P value for the demographic variable gender, gender. P, only the demographic variable gender is significant. The p-value of the association test of knowledge was less than 0 0.05. Hence, the H2A is accepted. And the H2 um, hypothesis, second research hypothesis of my study, there is a significant association between the pre-test knowledge score regarding the effects of junk food on mental health with their selected demographic variable. It concludes that, it concludes that there was a significant association of the gender with the knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health with the selected demographic variables with, of the undergraduate student at selected colleges. Then not significant association for demographic variable age, education of the father, education of the mother, occupation of father, occupation of mother, income per month, family types, area of residence, and the pocket money of the undergraduate student given by the parents. The p-value of the association test with the knowledge was more than 0 0.05. Hence, it, there is a null hypothesis was accepted. It concludes that there is no significant association with other demographic variable except the gender. The conclusion of my study, I conclude, the mess, I conclude my whole study. In the study, significant improvement in the knowledge of uh, knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health after providing self-instructional module. So the self-instructional module on knowledge regarding the effects of junk food on mental health among the undergraduate students was effective. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now the part is open for question. Any questions? 
Anyone would like to ask a question? None? All right. Um, all right, let's, let's have our lunch break. All right, let's go ahead and go on lunch and Guys, please be back at exactly 2.15. Again, our lunch, or we are having lunch, and let's all be back at exactly 2.15 p.m. in the time. Hello.
Welcome back, everyone.
Welcome back, everyone. Right, we'll go ahead and start. Another, let us welcome an oral presentation by Usha Yusha Shendi. Kasturba Nursing College, India. The topic is about a descriptive study to assess the knowledge and attitude of, of parents regarding prevention of minor accidents among under five children in selected rural areas. Usha? Yep, go ahead, please. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Please yeah. proceed. Good afternoon, madam. Myself, Mrs. Susha Shende from Kasuba Nursing College, Sevagram. So my presentation, my topic of uh, presentation is a descriptive study to assess the knowledge and attitude of parents regarding prevention of minor accidents among under five children in selected rural area. So injuries in the middle of children are uh, are a of public disorder. Accidental injuries are one of the big cause of death, hospitalization and disabilities across the world. So in developing countries, injuries are one of the major cause of death in children between the ages of age group of one to five year. Injury among children can happen anywhere, the road, home or playground. Studies on childhood injuries have observed that the majority of accidents occur inside the home. As reported by the World Health Organization, the injury specific death rate in the below five age group was 73 per 1 lakh per people and 3,654 years of lives was lost per 1 lakh people, according to the WHO. Below uh, five, the age group children are more at risk for household accidents because of their normal interest, passion, and desire to master new skills. And children imitate adult behavior from early age, and boys are more probably to have accidents than the girls. Most injuries take place in or near a child's home where unsafe place area and playthings may often be found. Age, sex, and economic factors are the main determinants of injury occurrence in the in and severity. Although the home is a place that is safe and secure for the children, unfortunately, home is where many injuries and deaths occur. The main source of hazards in the home are fall, fire, drowning, suffocation, choking, poisoning, and cuts. They learn to walk, run, jump, and survey the physical atmosphere by fall down, which is the usable part when growing and most fall, uh, falls are uh, of little consequences. But some go beyond the resilience of children, child's body, making them the fourth largest cause of unintentional injury, death for children. Any form of injury can lead to the significant physiological, psychological, social, environmental, and financial burdens, thereby affecting the day-to-day -day routine of children as well as their families. The World Health Day 2004 also provided a forum of advocacy in alloc allocating more attention and resources for prevention of the accidents. The objective of the study was to assess the knowledge of parents regarding the prevention of minor accidents among under five children and selected rural areas, to assess the attitude of parents regarding the prevention of minor accidents among under five children in selected rural areas, and to find out the association, to find out the relationship between the knowledge and attitude with demographic variables of parents regarding the prevention of accidents. 
methodology was to assess the knowledge and attitude parents regarding uh, the prevention of minor accidents among under five children. The research approach was ad adopted as descriptive in nature. The study was conducted in a rural area, which has granted permission to conduct the, uh, this study. And the sample consisted of parents of under five children residing in a rural area. Purposive non-random sampling was used to select the uh, samples. Tools, socioeconomic demographic sheet, it contains the data regarding age of parents, sex, income, uh, res residence, number of children under five years, and um, type of family. Knowledge questionnaires. This section contains 29 questions to assess the knowledge of parents regarding the prevention of minor accidents among under five children. Attitude scale. This section contains 14 points and five steps to analyze the attitude towards the prevention of minor accidents. Statistical analysis description of demographic characteristics of parents of under five children using percentage analysis was done and parents' knowledge regarding prevention of minor accident analyzed through the mean standard deviation and casper attitude regarding prevention of minor accidents analyzed through the mean standard deviation and casper Methods of selection of study subjects were in inclusion criteria, study subjects present at the time of data collection, study subjects who are willing to participate in the study, study subjects who can read and write Marathi, in exclusion criteria, subjects who attend the educational program regarding the minor accidents and their prevention, subjects from medical fields. So, so total 195 sample subjects were there. The result was majority uh, that is 41.5% of subjects had good level of knowledge score. 31.8% of subjects had very good level of knowledge score. 18.5% of subjects had average level of knowledge score and 6.1% subjects had poor level of knowledge score. 2.1% of subjects had excellent level of knowledge score and mean knowledge score of the subjects was 15.93. Minimum knowledge score was zero and maximum knowledge score was 27. The level of attitude which was categorized in poor, average, good, very good and excellent majority of 57.4% of subjects had agree level of attitude and 135.9% had unfair and 6.7% had strongly agree level of knowledge score, 0% had disagree and strongly disagree level of knowledge score. The mean knowledge score was uh, 45 to 45.73, and uh, uh, that is plus minus 6.16. Minimum knowledge score was 32, and maximum knowledge score was 63. So in this session, we have seen that total of 195% uh, parents of under five children were evaluated for their knowledge and attitude regarding the prevention of minor accidents among under five children. I assess the knowledge and attitude of parents regarding the prevention of minor accidents among up to five-year children. I also strive to analyze the relationship between the knowledge and attitude with the demographic variable of parents regarding the prevention of accidents. Several similar studies were conducted regarding the prevention of minor accidents among up to five years children. So, Bimla Adhikari Tal was conducted the study to recognize the practice of mothers having under five children regarding prevention of childhood accidents. So, she can, uh, she observed that injuries are the first leading forecasting of avoidable and preventable cause of morbidity and mortality among uh, up to five year of children globally. And other study which was conducted uh, by the Dopte, BK Tiwari and et al. Epidemiology of Pediatric Burns and Future Prevention Strategies in New Delhi. So result was uh, the study highlights the several causes that is overcrowding, lack of awareness and dangerous cooking practices. Improper use of kerosene oil are the leading cause of the home uh, accidents. Dr. Pradeep R. Deshmukh and uh, Sri uh, Ram V. Gosavi. The epidemiology of injuries in rural uh, area, Vardha, 
which was conducted in Karangna uh, village in uh, PSC. The leading cause of injury were found to be falls, road traffic crashes, and occupational, which are uh, all preventable. So age, sex, and socioeconomic status, occupation, and less education were significantly associated with the injuries. So in my study summary, summary uh, and conclusion, the total 195 parents of under five children were assessed for their knowledge and attitude regarding the prevention of minor accidents among under five children. The significant findings of the study were as follows. The majority of the subject, that is 120, 61.5% were 25 to 29 years age group. Uh, the 120, 155 subjects, 79.5% were educated on a secondary level. The subjects at E8, that is 45.1% were housewife, and 94, that is 48.2% were one to three year age group having the children, and 120 subjects, that is 61.5% was the nuclear type of family. And the 43.6% was having the income that is 7,500 to 10,000. And 192, that is majority of the subjects, 98.5% was residing in the rural area. In the level of knowledge score on the questionnaires, 41.5% subject had the good level of knowledge score. And 31.8% of subject had very good knowledge score. 18.5% of subjects had average level of knowledge score and 6.1% uh, subject have the, who had the poor level of knowledge score. 2.1% of subjects had the excellent of level of knowledge score. So in the level of knowledge score, on attitude scale in is majority, that is 57.4% subject had agree level of knowledge score, 135.9%, nine, uh, had an unfair level of knowledge score and 6.7 had strongly agree level of knowledge score. Zero percent disagree, strongly disagree level of knowledge score. The association knowledge scores with the occupation. The tabulated F value was 2.26, that is, which was lower than the calculated uh, tabulate, calculated value, that is 3.29 at 5% level of significance. Also, the calculated p-value at 0 .0, 0 0.007 was lower than the acceptable level of significance, that is 0 0.505. Hence, it was interpreted that occupation was statistically significant with their knowledge score. The association of knowledge scores with the age of children, the tabulated f-value was 3.04, uh, that is 2. Uh, um, which was lower than the calculated F, that is 5.866. At 5% 5 level of significance, also calculated P value was 0 0.003, was lower than the acceptable level of significance, that is P value is 0 0.05. Hence, it was interpreted that the age of children was statistically significant with their knowledge score. So, the conclusion of the study is that, hence it is important that interventional studies can be conducted to prevent the home, uh, home accidents, which will reduce the burden, financial burden and uh, which can minimize the disability which are occurring in the children. We can save the lives uh, uh, of under five children. So I acknowledge the thanks to the participants and, and uh, a source of funding is none. Even so, thank these are the references. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation. Do we have any questions? No questions. All right, let's. Go ahead and proceed. Um, yeah, before I call in the next presenter, I would just like to remind everyone, all the presenters, the remaining presenters, to please be mindful of the allotted time, which is 10 minutes per oral presentation and um, a minute or two for the question and answer.
please be mindful of the time so that we can be on schedule. Thank you so much. Next is an oral presentation by Deepika Kumari. Kumari. Rufaida College of Nursing, Jamea Amdard, deemed to be University India. The topic is a cross-sectional study to assess the internet gaming addiction, problematic uses of internet, and sleep hygiene among young adults of selected College of Nursing, Delhi. Deepika? Good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you so Hi, much, ma'am. Ma Interesting for... topic. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Thank please. You share your so screen. Much, ma yes, ma'am. Ma'am, is my screen visible? It's coming up. Good afternoon to one and all present here. Thank you so much for giving me such an opportunity to present my paper. Uh, my study is a cross-sectional study to assess internet gaming addiction, problematic uses of internet, and sleep hygiene among young adults in a selected college of nursing, Delhi. My guide is Ms. Veena Sharma, principal of the College of Nursing, Chami Hamdar. And my co-guide is Ms. Tomi Bala Thokchum, assistant professor at the College of Nursing, Chamiya Hamdar. So as we are well aware that with this trending era of COVID-19, because of this crisis which took place now, uh, we are very much prone to usage of internet. And because of using internet, we are very much fascinated towards internet addiction, internet gaming. So starting with the introduction of my topic, many uh, surveys has been done. Uh, according to International Telecommunication Union, global internet usage increased from 1990 million in 2010 to 3,385 million in 2016. There were about 42 million active internet users in urban India in 2008 as compared to 5 million in 2000. So in a year 2019 also, 300 million of online gamers were reported in India and estimation may reach to 440 million in 2022 which is a large number and and most of the gamers are multiplayers that's why these games are very much fascinating and missionaries and real time so uh, people are students are very much fascinated towards this game and play uh, games and use internet uh, article came on 8 september 2020 in hindustan times uh, on gaming addiction in which a 15 year old boy in north in uh, north delhi he you transferred amount of 2.3 lakh from his grandfather account to pay the PUBG amount for at least two months until the account was hacked. So uh, to such an extent, it may lead to. Why my study has been done? There's very much need to do this study in the medical profession. Many studies has been done, but not in nursing profession. On nursing students, no study is there. So I have done this study to seek the association and seek the level of internet gaming addiction and uh, problematic uses of internet among nursing students. As because of emerging COVID-19 era, all nursing education has been shifted to online education with this SARS-CoV-2. -CoV this affects their academic as well as their other physical, social, and mental aspects of life also, which lead to disturbed sleeping, eating, bar, bladder, and other circadian rhythm patterns also. So therefore, there is need to study pattern of internet usage and online gaming among young adults in Indian setting, which is affecting sleep hygiene. Certain studies have been done. Uh, so my uh, review of literature has been divided into two sections, literature related to internet gaming disorder and sleep hygiene. The first section, in this, the Previous studies has been done on focusing on the gaming and the sleep hygiene, along with other disorders like depression and other. So um, Javi and S. et al. had done the study on the sample population of high school in Lebanese. And he found that uh, many students are having academic disturbance because of internet gaming. Then uh, section B consisted of problematic uses of internet and sleep hygiene. So Kayat M. A. has conducted a study in has conducted a study and he found that there is a 
there is a relationship between sleep problems and the internet usage so problem statement for my study is a cross sectional study to assess internet gaming addiction problematic uses of internet and sleep hygiene among young adults in a selected college of nursing delhi objectives were to assess the level of internet gaming addiction among young adults then to assess problematic uses of internet among young adults to assess sleep hygiene among young adults to find out the association between internet gaming addiction and sleep hygiene among young adults and to find out the association between problematic uses of internet and sleep hygiene among young adults assumption was that the young adults of selected college of nursing delhi may use internet or play internet games to such an addic- uh, extent that they may be addicted or cause problem such as sleep hygiene sleep issues so operational definitions related to internet gaming addiction it, it is characterized by tolerance withdrawal and conflict problems in the age of 18 to 30 years which will be assessed by internet gaming disorder scale short form igds9 sf and problematic uses of internet which is uh, characterized by social media overuse or internet addiction disorder which will be assessed by generalized problematic internet scale u scale gpi us2 then sleep hygiene assessment scale then it is one's level of satisfaction related to sleep experience quality quantity sleep initiation maintenance and refreshment after awakening which will be, which will be assessed with the help of five point likert sleep hygiene assessment scale and young adults is from late teens to early 30s that is 18 to 30 years of age to be precise both men and women the conceptual framework for my study was used by uh, is the advanced form of bio psychosocial and contextual model of sleep by becker langber and bears in 14 2014 uh, this model consisted of biological factors psychological factor contextual factor along with sleep hygiene and all these three is related interrelated and it is interrelated with sleep also so biological factor normally consists of genetic makeup age sex and history of physical trauma psychosocial factor consisted of anxiety depression suicidal ideation behavioral problems like aggression then contextual factor consisted of the employment extracurricular activities and cultural aspects so in my study the biological factors are not considered in the are not included into the study whereas the uh, internet gaming addiction is considered as psycho social aspect and the contextual aspect is the problematic uses of internet which uh, and its relationship is assessed with the sleep hygiene the methodology methodology of my study is research approach is quantitative research approach with a descriptive survey cross sectional research design the research variables were internet gaming addiction problematic uses of internet and sleep hygiene in the selected college of nursing delhi among young adults studying in selected college of nursing delhi of age 18 to 30 years uh, sample size was 196 with a purposive sampling technique the survey was conducted through the online google form and uh, inclusion criteria was the young adults who have smartphone access with the internet access uh, and are approachable electronic during this covid-19 era and uh, the exclusion criteria is they should not be se- uh, if there is any self reported diagnosis of other psychiatric problems then they are excluded for data collection tools and techniques the questionnaire for demographic profile was used and further standardized tool for internet gaming addiction and standardized for problematic uses of internet and a structured rating scale was used for sleep hygiene assessment among young adults so the standardized rating scale uh, to assess the internet gaming addiction was given by uh, pons and griffiths in 2015 a uh, likert scale of nine, uh, scoring 9 to 21 Uh, 9 to 45 among which 9 to 21 was non disordered gamers and 21 to 45 are disordered gamers if they get this much of score with the reliability of 0.87 by pons itself then a standardized rating scale gpi us2 was given by kaplan in 2010 a 8 point likert scale with 15 questions and scoring range of 15 to 120 with a reliability of 0.88 by the developer the structured rating scale uh, was formed as a sleep hygiene assessment scale with a 5 point likert scale and 25 questionnaire uh, with a scoring range of 0 to 100 and the tool was assessed by, uh, the content validity was checked by giving to nine experts in the field of psychiatry and psychology then reliability was assessed by cronbeck alpha formula formula and we got 0.86 ethical consideration was taken into 
ethical committee uh, permission was taken from institutional ethical committee of jamia hamdard for the research and confidentiality was kept and the participants were coded instead of giving the names further the results and the analysis was done on both descriptive and inferential statistics then the result was from further organized into six sections first one the findings related to the background data of the population that shows the distribution of demographic characteristics most of the young adults in the study were 18 to 21 years of age female and urban living in urban area and other background data which was considered was their smartphone availability available mode of internet source of gaming gaming played on smartphone laptop or desktop source of recharging data and average wake up time and average sleeping time the section 2 consisted of internet gaming addiction level so we have found that 75.5% of young adults were found to be non disordered gamers then 86 uh, of young adults among 196 were found to be mild internet addict having mild internet addiction then uh, around 48% of young adults were having moderately maintained sleep hygiene then the in the section 5 we have seek the association between internet gaming addiction and sleep hygiene and this scatter diagram can show that, show that the positive relationship was there at the significance level of 0.05 then uh, the uh, in section 6 the uh, find association was found between problematic uses of internet and sleep hygiene among young adults and again a positive moderately positive significant relationship was found and at 0.05 level conclusion of my study was it was found that about one fourth of young adults from selected college of nursing was having internet gaming addiction almost two third of them were problematic users of internet and most of the young adults have the waking up time of 6 am to 8 am and average sleeping time of 8 pm to 12 pm so also 42.9% of young adults had well maintained sleep hygiene a significant but weak relationship was found between internet gaming addiction and sleep hygiene among the young adults and significantly but moderately positive relationship was found uh, among the uh, young adults it was found it was found that the calculation of carl pearson co through the calculation of carl pearson's coefficient of correlation that the sleep hygiene had more robust association with problematic uses of internet as compared to the internet gaming addiction girls were more prone to the social media addiction as compared to internet gaming addiction and boys were found to be having gaming addiction more then in the discussion we can see that previous uh, it was consistent the results were consistent to with the previous study uh, like a cross section study was conducted by wong which was investigating the internet gaming disorder and problematic social media use and uh, the study findings revealed that internet gaming disorder and social media addiction addiction associate with psychological distress along with the poor sleep quality similar to my study that uh, that shows that the uh, a positive relationship or association is there between the internet gaming addiction and social media addiction along with the sleep hygiene and present study also revealed the significant association between problematic uses of internet and sleep hygiene uh, as consistent and, and the result was similar with the scott and a previous study of scott et al which was seeking the association between social media addiction and multiple sleep parameters in adolescents and they resulted as girls spend more time on social media addiction than boys and the study indicates a association between significant association between social media use and sleep patterns so nursing implication are there in nursing practice it is very much uh, a mental health nurse has a crucial role to promote the healthy practices among young adults in relation to the gaming along with the uses of internet and sleep hygiene so many uh, uh, campaign and awareness classes can be conducted to spread awareness on the internet gaming addiction so that problem and problematic uses of internet and uh, Uh, seeking awareness uh, awareness can be promoted regarding their impact on the sleep hygiene in nursing education this internet gaming addiction has been included into dsm 5 and icd 11 criteria uh, nowadays so in the uh, future uh, it uh, this topic can be included in 
the counseling so the counselor should be uh, seeking this topic and the awareness and the teaching should be given in schools and colleges in rega colleges regarding the internet gaming addiction and problematic uses of internet in community sector also we can spread awareness so that people uh, the young adults may should know about the beneficial use of internet and their impact of uh, on their physical mental and social health in nursing research further studies can be uh, can be done on, on the long and uh, the larger section uh, larger uh, sample uh, so that to, it can be generalized to larger area my limitation for my study was it was performed on us uh, young only on young adults in selected college of nurses so generalization is very much uh, is not possible and uh, it is a cross sectional research design so it relies on a self reported data then the recommendation are further for more practicability and convenience uh, the study can be done on the longitudinal basis also for larger samples for better generalizations and uh, uh, as present study has not included the relationship between demographic variable and the sleep hygiene or the internet gaming addiction so in future secondary analysis or can be done on this statistical calculation and present study has been done in selected college of nurses so further research is can be done in different settings so these were the references so i conclude that use internet wisely for not just petty enjoyment of your senses but for the development of your mind as well thank you uh, madam deepika are you there yes sir yeah i just have a, a small query um, uh, you yes know, sir sir, you have uh, had 196 young adults from selected college of nursing isn't it is yes sir um in the sense like uh, how many nursing colleges you have chosen or is it uh, from your own university i mean nursing college attached in your own university so only my university okay and you you have taken 196 isn't it like why exactly 196 i mean like you have uh, taken all the nursing students or few were left what were the reasons so i have given the uh, uh, the survey uh, the questionnaire to the google forms to all uh, the samples which were not included in other studies like i have okay. given to different sections in msc nursing students in post basic in bsc also so that okay. one one okay. section for each of each section all right um and your results are uh, shown that nearly one fourth of young adults were having internet gaming addiction isn't it is can you repeat Hello? the question can you repeat the question sir Sir, can you please repeat? No, your findings revealed that one fourth of young adults were having uh, found to have internet gaming addiction. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Uh, okay, so uh, of course, like that is not going to be a part of your study. You've already done it. If given an opportunity, like what do you think could be done for these uh, these uh, set of people who are having addiction towards internet gaming? so first of all uh, in my, according uh, because of this result i can say, uh, say that in future we can promote awareness regarding the gaming sections and schedule can be made among the young adults so which is it is very much necessary nowadays they need to perform various exercise at home they need to mingle up with their family members so that they will not go towards gaming more and more if they feel like uh, they want to play game and again and again then they should report they should talk to their parents then they should talk to counselors or the psychiatrist if they want so that they will not seek further physical problems in their life so according to me scheduling can be done they can uh, uh, interact with their family members they can interact within their friends and uh, they should do exercises and other activities in their life because of this covid 19 era they have more much adhered to the online classes and online usage very much so they can shift their pattern thank you sir um we can 
I also have a question with regards to that. Yes, um, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The, the questionnaire was conducted pre-COVID? During COVID. During COVID, all right. Yes, ma'am. During lockdown period itself. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? Any more questions? All right. Thank you so much, Tipika, for that. Thank you so much, ma'am. <laughs> All right, and let's go ahead and proceed with our next oral presentation by C.T. Lestari. Health Polytechnic, Polytechnic Kesehatan Kemengis, Indonesia. The topic is implementation of early warning scoring system in an attempt to improve ICU without wall. C.T.? Okay, thank you very much uh, for the time given to me. Um, I share my screen. Okay, good uh, afternoon, everybody, because we have different times, so I'm uh, rather confused about the time. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Titra Sari from Surakarta, Polytechnic of Health in Surakarta, uh, Central Java, Indonesia. So in this opportunity, I would like to present my study. It's about the implementation of early warning scoring system, or EWSS, in attempt to improve ICU without wall. Okay, the content uh, but, but, uh, I will be uh, present today is uh, our recent background and then research purpose, research method, result, discussion, and uh, conclusion. About the research background, uh, the principle of critical nursing is to provide care for patients with rapid pathophysiological deterioration that can lead to death. As we know that the word uh, for handling critical patients in hospital consists of uh, emergency room or uh, ER and then intensive care unit or ICU, intensive coronary care unit and other uh, intensive services. Along with development, the need for intensive room in the hospital tend to increase, increase so that the services cannot be accommodated well enough because of limited space. In this situation, uh, encourage the development of the concept of ICU without wall. Uh, ICU without wall is an emergency services system by optimizing services in patient ward by utilizing human resources uh, and then equipment and hospital policy. ICU without wall refer to innovative management in intensive care based on the two key elements. The first is collaboration of all medical and nursing staff involved in the patient care during inpatient treatment, and then technological support for protocol of early detection on safety by identifying patient at risk of worsening at all hospitals on the assessment of vital science and our laboratory test value with a clear purpose of improving the safety of critical patients during the process of inpatient uh, treatment. So, uh, the purpose of the research is to investigate the influence of the implementation of the early warning scoring system, EWSS, on the improvement of ICU uh, without fail. The type of research used was the experimental with analytical descriptive sign. 
and then we study identify thing in the level of deterioration condition based on the early warning scoring system before and after the action of clinical response were presented. The sample of this study just uh, 34 respondents that taken by total sampling of inclusion criteria such as in patient in the world, patient with medical surgical cases, and patient age minimum uh, 18 years old. Data analyze, uh, we use univariate for demographic data and we vary using a chi super for relationship between uh, EWSS and improvement of ICU without wall. The result, the first I would like to present about the uh, characteristic of respondent based on the age and gender. The mean of uh, respondent age was 51.6 years with a deviation standard 9.78. The youngest was 35 years and the oldest was 74 years. And then uh, between female and female, uh, I think the most of the respondents are, are, are male, yeah, about 64.7%. And then uh, the characteristic of respondent is on the care unit. Uh, in the initial AWSS uh, measurement, yeah, in the initial measurement, uh, all respondent were uh, patient with uh, AWSS score in the high risk category. For respondent, our elephant uh, point eight indicated that they were treated in the non-ICU and then actually 8.2 indicated that, that they were treated in the uh, ICU. And then uh, I'll continue with the characteristics of respondent based on the score of final, uh, final uh, EWSS uh, measurement. In the final measurement, 60, uh, I mean, it conducted uh, in the six 30 minutes. Yeah. 17 respondents were patient with medium high risk. 20, 17, yeah. Uh, 16 of them were treated in the non uh, IC ward, and then just uh, one uh, respondent. Uh, treated in the ICU. And then a uh, patient with a uh, high risk, the total is uh, 13, and then 61.5 uh, uh, treated in the ICU, and then uh, just five uh, respondent uh, treated in the non ICU. And then about the correlation, uh, I didn't write that. Any uh, about the analysis of correlation between the score of uh, EWSS and the care unit, uh, the results show that uh, 70 respondents were patients with a medium risk category of EWSS, and whom 60 percent, uh, 16 people, uh, I mean 90 for. 0.1% were treated in the non ICU ward and 1% was treated in the ICU. And then 30 people were included in the high risk category of uh, AWSS. And uh, five people were treated in the uh, non ICU. The result of the analysis is the correlation between the uh, of EWSS and the care unit of giant p value 0.001. That means there is a correlation between EWSS score and the place of care unit. This is, uh, sorry, I write in the Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, I mean, the first initial, we can see that uh, all a respondent are in the high risk, and then after 30, min uh, 30 minutes, 
uh, assessment, uh, the number of respondents who are in the high risk uh, decrease after uh, six, 30 minutes. And then uh, for the respondent in the medium risk, And then in the low risk also increase. Uh, about the discussion, uh, as I said before, that there was a relationship between EWSS and the place of uh, cardiac unit. Yeah, one more minute, tell you. Okay, oh point oh oh one. So the result of this study are in line with the research conducted by Paris. Uh, 2012, yeah, showing that EWSS could reduce patient referral to the ICU. This is also similar with study conducted by Moon that the application of EWSS to patient clinical change decreased ICU admission in the hospital. Uh, this is due to the accuracy of the application of medical treatment as a response to the deterioration of clinical condition in patient so that they uh, do not require treatment in the ICU and the treatment can just be given in the ward or uh, high care unit. Only uh, application of EWSS to patient will be able to identify worsening condition and then be able to provide reference to implementing medical ad algorithm to prevent massive worsening of the condition. However, if the EWSS monitoring find a serious clinical problem, the patient will be immediately referred to the ICU promptly and uh, accurately. ICU without call is an emergency services system by optimizing services in patient work by utilizing human resources and then equipment and hospital uh, policy. So not all potential critically patients are admitted to the hospital. However, by empowering the resources and technology in the ward, such patients can be treated in the ward with close monitoring and intensive action. So patients are admitted to the ICU only in very urgent circumstances. However, the result uh, is different from study from uh, Bukhari that the application of EWS to patient in clinical thing increased the number of ICU admission in hematological case. They also conclude that uh, the causes of the increased admission to the ICU were delayed response, assessment error, and inadequate therapy during the application of the w AWS as to patient uh, clinical thing. As a conclusion, uh, the first, there was a relationship between the AWS score and the care unit of the place uh, of patient treatment, and then the AWSS monitoring periodically every 30 minutes for three hours, followed by implementation of action algorithm could lower the EWSS category from high risk category to medium risk category and low risk category. The decrease in the EWSS score could reduce ICU referral from uh, this one, and the patient could still be treated in the non-ICU ward. And then the implementation of EWSS could minimize the number of ICU care referral and the length of ICU care by optimizing the use of non-ICU work in dealing with patient clinical emergency, meaning that non-ICU work were able to function as ICU without work in caring for critical patient. I think that's all. Thank you. Uh, Thank I you so much okay. for that presentation. Do we have any questions? Once again, thank you so much for that presentation. Next, would like to call on an oral presentation by Jayanti M. R., Government College of Nursing, Kojikodi, India. Topic is about the parenting skills among mothers of children with conduct disorder and normal children. Jayanti?
Hello. Good yep, afternoon. I can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Please proceed with the presentation. I only have ten minutes. Hello? 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 Yes, please proceed. I'm audible? Yes, you are. Okay, okay. Um, good, afternoon. good afternoon to all. I am Jayanti from Government College of Music, Kodikot. And my um, uh, study is, the title of my study is Parenting among mothers of children with conduct disorder and normal children. Next. <clears throat> About the introduction. Sorry. Conduct disorder is a repeat and persistent pattern of behavior in which the basic rights of others and the major norms or rules are violated over a period of 6 to 12 years. So parenting is a process of promoting and supporting the, about the physical, emotional, social and intellectual development of a child from the, the like adult, adulthood and important role in improving the performance of children and their families. So the parent is, uh, parenting is a, the need of my study is the parent responsible and at times unrewarding is, is that So there is a lack of data regarding the parenting skills among mothers of children with contact disorders in Kerala. So objectives of my study is to compare the parenting skills among mothers of children with contact disorder and normal children. And another objective is to find out the association between the parenting skills among mothers of children with contact disorder and normal children with selected variables. So about the methodology, the approach used is quantitative research approach, and the design used is descriptive cross-sectional design. And about the population, mothers of children with the children diagnosed with conduct, dis conduct disorder and normal children between the age group of uh, between the age group of 10 to 18 years. And uh, the setting of my study is Institute of Institute of Mental Health and Neuroscience, Polkot, and also Government Health Higher Secondary School, Polkot. And the technique is used is consecutive sampling, and the total number of samples is 150 from uh, um, for mothers of uh, conduct, uh, conduct disorder children and 50 from normal children. And the tools used is uh, first one is a semi structured interview schedule to collect the social personal data that includes uh, um, total items, include 15 items. 
and second tool is this alabama parenting questionnaire in order to assess the parenting skills and in that uh, total 42 items uh, from uh, which is very from one to uh, five points and uh, under sub uh, five sub scales in that uh, sub scales included as uh, positive involvement positive parenting poor monitoring and inconsistent discipline and corporal punishment these are the five sub sub scales about the analysis uh, distribution of uh, mothers based on the age in years that is um, 46 percentage of uh, mothers of children with conduct disorder and about 40 percentage of um, uh, normal children belong to the age group of uh, 36 to 40 years next is the distribution of mothers based on uh, religion reveals that 62 percentage of mothers of children with conduct disorders belong to islam and whereas 80 percentage of uh, children with uh, belongs to the <coughs> normal children belongs to uh, hindu religion then about the socioeconomic status that is um, uh, shows that 66 percentage of mothers of children with conduct disorder belong to below poverty line category and whereas 100 percentage of mothers of normal children belong to above poverty line then next is, is a distribution of mothers based on the place of uh, living of mothers of children with conduct disorder uh, were residing in uh, panchayat area, whereas 90% of mothers of normal children residing in cooperation area. Then distribution of mothers based on age of the child in that 50% uh, of children with conduct disorder and 52% percentage of normal children between the age group of 13 to 15 years then next is distribution of mothers based on the gender of the child in that uh, 90 percentage of children with contact disorder and also 78 percentage of normal children were males and distribution of mothers based on the academic performance of the child then in this 46, per, uh, 46 percentage of conduct disorders are having the poor academic performance and <coughs> sorry whereas 80 percentage of normal children have good academic performance of uh, the children with conduct disorder and normal children that is mm, the the mean parenting skill scores of mothers of normal children were higher than that of the parenting skill score of mothers of children with conduct disorder. And also the data revealed that there was a significant difference in the mean parenting skill scores of mothers of normal children and children with conduct disorder. And about the association between the parenting skills of mothers of children, normal children and selected variables in that the, uh, there was a significant association between the parenting skill scores of mothers of normal children with religion and the academic performance. And there is no association was found between the parenting skill scores and other variables, uh, the variables such as age of mother, age of children, economic status, occupation, place of living, type of marriage, type of etc. Then uh, about the nursing implication, the flat parenting skills can be corrected timely with proper training and education of mothers. So about the conclusion, the findings of my study, it represents that the mothers of children with conduct disorder had poor parenting skills goals compared to mothers of normal children. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Right, if it's done, let's go ahead and proceed with our next oral presentation by Monica Sharma, Universal Institute of Nursing, Balopur, Lalru, Lal Mohali. Topic is about the study to evaluate the effectiveness of educational handbook on knowledge and attitude towards nursing ethics code among nursing personnel in selected hospitals of Shimla. Himachal Pradesh. Monica? Oh.
You can now unmute yourself. Uh, go ahead, please. Okay, good afternoon uh, to everyone. So first of all, I would like to say uh, thanks to SFNP for giving us opportunity for sharing our research paper. So first of all, uh, my problem statement was a quasi-experimental study to evaluate the effectiveness of educational handbook on knowledge and attitude towards nursing ethics code among nursing personnel in selected hospitals of Shimla. So next is the objectives of the study. So the first objective was to assess the knowledge regarding nursing ethics code among nursing personnel of selected hospitals of Shimla. Second objective was to assess the attitude towards nursing ethics code among nursing personnel of selected hospitals of Shimla. Third objective was to evaluate the effectiveness of educational handbook regarding nursing ethics code among nursing personnel of selected hospitals of Shimla. And fourth objective was to find the correlation between knowledge and attitude regarding nursing code ethics among nursing personnel of selected hospitals, Shimla. So next is the need of the study. So nursing is considered to be the noblest profession, but its nobility can be sustained only if members of this profession are able to maintain this. The nurse has to follow the orders of the physician along with maintaining the correct and proper documentation of the records of the patient. Thus, with an increase in responsibility, she has to keep in mind the legal aspects of nursing. So next is research methodology. So in research methodology, the research approach was quantitative research approach. Research design was quasi-experimental research design. Research setting was Indira Gandhi Medical College and Hospital Shimla and Kamla Nehru Hospital Shimla. So my design was quasi-experimental design. So I have taken two groups, that is control group and experimental group. So I have uh, taken experimental group from Indira Gandhi Medical College and Hospital Shimla and experiment and control group from Kamla Nehru Hospital, Shimla. Next is the target population. So in target population, all nursing personnel working in Indira Gandhi Medical College and Hospital, Shimla, and Kamla Nehru Hospital, Shimla. Next is sample and sampling technique. So 60 nursing personnel were selected by convenient sampling technique. Next is data collection. So data was collected from 60 nursing personnel uh, by, uh, I have prepared a tool which consists of uh, three portion. First portion was social demographic data profile. Second was self-structured questionnaires to assess knowledge. And third was self-structured questionnaire to assess attitude. And data analysis was done by using descriptive and inferential statistics. So next is a major finding of the study. So majority of the nursing personnel, that is 50% in experimental group and 57% in control group were in the age group of 24 to 32. Next, most of the nursing personnel, that is 50% in experimental group and 53% in control group were having GNM as professional qualification. And with regard to nature and type of job, 67% in experimental group and 63% in control group were regular. Next, regarding working area, 20% in experimental group were working in CTVS, ICU, and 27% in control group were working in labor room. Next, with regard to the pre-test, 73.3% of the experimental group and 76.6% of control group were having average knowledge regarding nursing ethics code. And regarding post-test, 80% of the experimental group were having good knowledge and 83.3% of control group were having average knowledge regarding nursing ethics code. According to pre-test, 66.7% of experimental group and 70% of control group were having positive attitude towards nursing ethics code. And if we talk about 
about post test so 86.7% of experimental group and 70% of control group were having positive attitude towards nursing ethics score next by using carl pearson correlation coefficient it was found that there was significant correlation between the pre knowledge versus pre attitude in experimental group and between pre knowledge versus pre attitude and post knowledge versus post attitude of control group towards nursing ethics score so by using chi square test it was found that there was significant association between pre test knowledge of nursing personnel of experimental group with nature type of job and working experience and also significant association of post test knowledge of experimental group with work experience locality and source of information last is a conclusion so on the basis of total mean score finding reveals that in experimental and control group the knowledge of nursing personnel was average and attitude of nursing personnel was positive towards nursing ethics score in pre test and knowledge of whereas in control group knowledge remains average and attitude also remain positive in control group nursing personnel regarding nursing ethics score increased significantly after giving information booklet to experimental group and attitude of nursing personnel become more positive after giving information booklet to the experimental group next the level of knowledge was significantly associated with nature type of job and work experience in pre test and with work experience locality and source of information in post test in experimental group so this is all about my research presentation thank you thank you so much are there any questions Right, since then, let's go ahead and proceed with our next oral presentation by Poonam Sharma, Universal Institute of Nursing, Balupur, India. The topic is about a descriptive study to assess the knowledge regarding prevention man management of puerperal breast complications mm -hmm. among pre mm -hmm. Creamy postnatal mothers in selected government hospitals of District Mohali, Punjab. Punam. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi, ma'am. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, ma'am. I'm too good. So good afternoon to all. So uh, let's we should not waste much time because the time is really very precious for all of us. So uh, I would be uh, first of all I would like to thank uh, to our SNP group uh, who has given me an opportunity to present my research paper. And uh, let me uh, share my screen. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Uh, due to technical error, I could not uh, share my screen, so I would be presenting this thing like this. First of all, I would move with, uh, move with my problem statement. It was a descriptive study to assess the knowledge regarding prevention and management of epidural breast complications among primary postnatal mothers in government hospitals of District Mohali. My objectives of the study were to assess the knowledge regarding prevention and management of epidural breast complications among primary postnatal mothers. Second was to find out the association between knowledge regarding prevention and management of epidural breast complications with socio-demographic variables. 
Then was to prepare health education pamphlet in order to enhance the knowledge regarding prevention and management of epidural breast complications among primary post mothers. Introduction uh, part that will be covered. So that will be the one of the important and special characteristic features of a mammal is giving birth and feeding the baby. Breast milk is centrella substance of the decade and is the nature's most precious gift to the newborn and equal to the uh, to which is yet to be innovated by a scientific community, community despite tremendous advances in science and technology. The main causes of failure to remove breast milk especially in the first few days after delivery. So this is the main pro, uh, things that the females, they get complications for the breast complications. So when the milk that comes in and fills the breast, at the same time, the blood flow of the breast increases, causing congestion. So these are the common reasons that why the milk is not removed adequately and are delayed initiation of the breastfeeding in frequent feeds poor attachment, ineffective suckling, a sudden change in breastfeeding routine, suddenly stopping breastfeeding, or if a baby suddenly starts breastfeeding is less than usual. So what was the need of the study that behind that takes me to, to uh, go through this breast complications? So that was when will not happen easily, when the baby is not sucking enough to completely drain all the milk glands, then there is a chance to get breast engorgement and other breast complications. If nipples become flattened during engorgement, it can be difficult for the baby to latch on to the breast properly. At the same time, baby's attempts to latch on will cause the nipples to become sore and cracked. If the breast complications are severe, it can lead to other complications and affect the health of the baby too. The National uh, Family Health Survey that shows the breast pain is most usually reason, reason to give breast feeding in two weeks after the birth. In, it is reported that 80 to 85 percent of the mothers they are affected by the breast engorgement. So this is the main complication that we come across, and this having this kind of problem. So engorgement of the breast is one of the potential problem that may rise due to delay in starting of breastfeeding and usually starts from third or sixth postnatal and usually disappears in within 48 hours. The research methodology, that is the important aspect of the research. We all know that in my research approach, my research approach was quantitative research and uh, research design that was non-experimental descriptive research design. I selected the setting. The research setting was Civil Hospital Phase 6, District Mohali, Punjab. Then my population was primary post and mothers in Civil Hospital Phase 6, District Mohali, Punjab. Then my sampling technique was convenient sampling technique. And in my sample size, I have taken 100 primary postnatal mothers in Civil Hospital Phase 6, District Mohali. In research tool, that was divided into two parts. Part one was related to the social demographic profile of study participants. Then second part was co covered under the self-structured quotient to assess the knowledge. Then in data analysis, descriptive inferential statistics was taken in the mean, standard deviation, and chi-score was calculated. And in my data presentation, it it was in the forms of the tables and the graphs. Then I moved to the social demographic uh, means frequency and the percentage distribution. That is the most important part in the demographic variables. I've taken age and religion and others. First age in age, the age group 23 to 27, that scored a maximum knowledge score. And the females, those who are under this age, 23 to 27, they had more knowledge than the age above 33. Then in the religion, if I talk about the religion in the same uh, Hinduism, uh, they have 50, uh, they have 55 uh, uh, of the ratio that covered that they have good no amount of knowledge regarding the breast complications. Then uh, in education status, it is in a joint family, the, uh, the females, they have the primary most mothers, they had good amount of knowledge than the other extended family and up to metric. Then in uh, educational status, uh, up to metric, they have less amount of knowledge and we, uh, the most of the females, those who are graduated, they had a good amount of knowledge regarding the 
primary postnatal breast complications. Then in occupation, the private uh, employees, they were working in the private industries. So they had a good amount of knowledge than the other employees. Then in a, a, play, a place of residence, rural and urban, the rural people or the rural, rural uh, primary postnatal mothers, they had 79% uh, of knowledge and then, then in the urban. So then the parents and the family members, friends and relatives. So parents and family members, they were the most uh, important source of information they were found in my study. So the people, they had good amount of knowledge. The parents, if the family members, they guide them, the primary parents, postnatal mothers. Then in the knowledge level, uh, frequency, the adequate knowledge that was 4%, moderate adequate knowledge 85%, and inadequate was 11%. Then, in recommendations, similar study can be undertaken on the large scale, generalize the findings of the study. A comparative study can be done between urban and rural community to assess the knowledge of prevention and management of pupil breast complications among primary postnatal mothers. Then the nursing implications, they are quite important, that plays an important role in the research. First, in the nursing education, nursing students, they are a future references for us in staff nurses, administrators, and educationalists, and supervisors, nursing teachers should put emphasis on the health education method of imparting the education regarding the prevention and management of the pupil breast complications during the training of the students. Then students should get an opportunity to give health education in an appropriate way during the clinical practice. This will be helpful in planning of health campaigns for primary postnatal mothers so that they can be made aware about prevention and prevention and management of imperial breast complications. The nursing practice, we can imply the nurses, they are the most important members of the healthcare team who are continuously with the patients since the time of admission to the discharge. As a nurse practitioner, nurse should assess the health status of the primary postural mothers and increase the awareness regarding prevention and management of pupil breast complications. In nursing administration, nurse, nurse administrators should conduct health campaigns related to prevention and management of breast One problems. minute more. Then in conclusion, the present study concluded that out of 100 primary postnatal mothers, 85% had morally adequate knowledge and 4% had an inadequate knowledge and 11% they have adequate amount of knowledge. The study depicted that the age of respondent, age, religion, type of family, educational, place of residence, source of information, they are the key associate factors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have, are there any questions? Well, it seems none. I would like to thank our session chair. Thank you. Dr. Janarthanan. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. And now we will proceed with our session two, pandemic crisis management. Now uh, we would like I would like to welcome our session chair. Oh, hi! I would like to welcome our our session chair, Dr. Harmeet Kaur, Professor Cum Principal Department of Nursing, Chitkara School of Health Sciences, Chitkara University, Punjab, India. Good day to you, Doctor. All right, I think we'll go ahead and proceed with the presentation. Our first oral presentation by Pushpam Sharma, School of Nursing Science, ITM University, India. The topic is about a study to assess impact of COVID-19 on family relationships among the families residing in the rural areas of Begusarai, Bihar. Pushpam. Hi. Good good afternoon, ma'am. Yep, you can go ahead and share your screen. Yes, ma'am.
I already gave you the co-host access. Go ahead and share your screen. Yes, ma'am. Man, be civil. Good afternoon, ma'am. My ma'am, can I be civil? Hello. Yes, it is. Go ahead, please. Okay, okay. Uh, my, my, my topic was the impact of a study to assist impact of COVID-19 on family relationship and family the overcome all order in life, all has been like no matter how people have been facing the happy face perspective. A family is made of another and have similar emotion, bounds, and beliefs. Member of a family might be linked throughout birth, marriage, or adoption. It gives us to confirm of having friends by our side during difficult moments, assisting us to assessing in us in a stress management. Despite our flaws, a family allowed to feel safe, protected, welcome, and loved. Families serve as the foundation for teaching young children and about relationship. Children who are raised in healthy family are more likely to build a strong ties outside of the home. As family members share both happiness and travel moment, a strong relationship each us how to create trust in other. A strong family is a all person need to grow confident in life. Family confident each children a respectful method to handle problem in future. Each family is difficult, but all a strong family have some common futures. Have good communication, share a feeling of togetherness, spend time togetherness, also concern and compassion for each member, lead by explain, provide support to each member, create crisis as an opportunity to grow, priorities, the well-being of each other family member, domestic relationship, need, next need for the study. The COVID-19 pandemic has realized to upper period shut down sources of stress of for families across the world. The India central and the state government introduced an increasing strict reminding of social distance and isolation home measure to slow the rate of infection early in the pandemic March to April 2021. The, the epidemic of COVID-19 does not limit to affect people, health conditions on the soft people. With the dramatic increase in the number of cases, many religions and people experience a high level of public 
Excite anxiety and warrior. Objective of my study. The objective of the family relationship among the families residing in the and the association between the selected demographical variables and impact of COVID-19 on family relationship among the families residing in the rural area of Begus, Begusarai. A uh, hypothesis. The following are formulated and will be tested at the 0 .0 0.05 level. Hypothesis 1, there will be significant association between the family relationship among family residing in the rural area of Begusarai demographical variables. Exceptions. Exceptions of the study, the impact of COVID-19 and stay-home order can increase parenting stress. The daily transformative and abnormality for the indirect effect sampling distribution. Delimination. The study is delimination to the Data will be collected within six to eight weeks. Who those families are is re residing in this selected rural area. The study was limited to people know to read and write Hindi. A review of literature. The, the, the review review of literature for the per, present study is organized and presented under following section. Section first. Literature related to the impact of COVID-19 on life of general population. And second, literature related to the impact of COVID-19 on family relationship. Uh, sample and sample techniques, uh, sample comparison of family members uh, of rural families. Uh, my samples I received were selected for my study. Uh, sampling technique, the known probability purposive sampling technique was used in present study in purposive sampling sample are selected because of the Meet the crisis and promptly to the research. Criteria for selected sampling, including available during the period of data collection, and second, willing to pre participate in the study, third, for present patient who can speak exclusive criteria, family member who are first having serious illness at the time of data collection, not willing to participate in the study. Sociodemographical profile. My sociodemographical main I was chooses age, gender, and religion, family, income, and type of family, and the number of family. Finding related impact of family relationship participant, total number of 60. Impact of impact of family relationship, relevant finding related to impact of family relationship, a score of participant living in a rural area, it relieves that participant mean was 57.65 and medium, median was 59. And the mode was 53 with a standard division 5.51. Range was 45 to 68. Uh, continue frequency and percentage distribution of participants according to level of family relationship. A uh, level of family relationship poor, fair, and good. Uh, the data personal in table 3. So that majority 31 means 51.57% were had good level of family relationship and 29 means 48.3% of participants were had fair level 
of family relationship during covid 19 our summary the present year study was conducted to assess impact of covid 19 on family relationship among the families residing in the rural area of begusarai bihar with the following objectives to assess the family relationship among the families residing in the selected rural area of begusarai to finding the association between the selected demographical variables and impact of covid-19 on family relationship among the families residing the rural area of begusarai hypothesis formulated in the study where hypothesis there will be significant data between the family relationship among families residing in the rural area with their selected demographical variables uh, continue in the study variable literature was reviewed which includes literature related to impact of covid-19 on life of general population and literature related to impact of covid-19 on family relationship the research uh, the research design selected for the study was descriptive design and the survey approach was used the variable the variable where family relationship among people living in rural area where family relationship among the people living in rural area and the extra nature barrier variable where age religion and gender family income type of family and number of family member the sample of a study comprised of 60 rural population living in selected district of bihar known probability for posing sampling technique was used to draw and sampling for the study the tool developed and used for the data collection was a rating scale for assessment of family relationship seven expert validated the connect valid of the tool and tool were found to be reliable and feasible reliability of the tool was tested by testers method by using car person co effective of correction formulation the the reliability of rating score for assessment of my family relationship and bibliography thank you ma'am thank you so much for that presentation do we have any questions oh um yeah let's hear from our session chair again let's welcome dr ham harmeet Kaur, Professor Cum Principal Department of Nursing, Chitkara School of Health Sciences, Chitkara University, Punjab, India. Hello, Dr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Juju. My apologies for earlier. Introducing me. Uh, uh, I would like to congratulate all the organizers for this conference and uh, all the best to all the presenters who are presenting today. Pushpam, I'm having one question to you. Uh, Pushpam, are you there? Pushpam, push, push, Pushpam. Uh, she's <laughs> okay. Okay, no problem. Uh, I just wanted to ask if she's there, if she can answer. What are the nursing implications of this study? If you can explain simply in one line. Okay, no problem. I think we can move forward to the next presentation. All right, um, Dr. Chair, would would you mind um posting the question to our chat box? Yeah, right. So that when she comes back, she can read it. Thank you so much. Right. Right. All right. Um, let's go ahead and proceed to our next oral presentation by Deepak, SGT University, India. The topic is maternal health in view of COVID-19, women's awareness, attitude, and self-reported behavior. Deepak? There. 
Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. I would like to thank all the organizers for giving the opportunity. So I will not take much time. Let me share the screen. Go ahead. Okay, ma'am, is it visible? Yep, it is. Have it in presentation mode and proceed. Thank you. Okay, so my study is maternal health in view of COVID-19. Uh, so we have uh, assessed women's uh, awareness, attitude, and self-reported behavior. So the objectives of the study was first to assess the women's awareness, attitude, and uh, regarding impact of COVID-19 on maternal health, then to assess the self-reported behavior during COVID-19 pandemic, and then to find the association between awareness score and selected demographic variables. And uh, lastly, we find the correlation between women's awareness and attitude regarding COVID, uh, regarding the impact of COVID-19 on maternal health. So as we all know that novel uh, coronavirus was uh, started in uh, uh, December 2019, and after that, it spread all over the world. And uh, pregnancy itself imposed many physiological changes in the immune and cardiovascular system, making the women vulnerable to uh, many illness, illnesses or infections of particularly respiratory uh, tract. And the impact of COVID-19 infection on pregnant women is a matter of concern, particularly because we have to see whether it is affecting the baby or not. So on the effect of COVID-19 on pregnancy, ICMR sees that there is currently no data that suggests there is increased risk of miscarriage or early pregnancy or early pregnancy loss or uh, on the or uh, in terms of medical termination of pregnancy. And uh, several studies have been conducted regarding how this infection spreads in all, but there is limited data regarding its effect on the health of a pregnant woman as well as the newborn woman. So this is the previous studies, uh, like uh, some of the studies, all the, uh, most of the studies shows that there is no uh, particular effect of uh, COVID-19 on pregnant women. And most of the studies stated that the effect are same as that of a non-pregnant women. One study, which is by S and Koreala, uh, they state that many of the women, they stopped seeking health care uh, because of the fear that they may or, they or their maybe baby may catch the COVID uh, virus. And so, uh, moving back uh, to the research methodology, uh, it was a cross-sectional study. And the setting, uh, the study was conducted by online uh, survey because of, uh, as the physical contact was not possible because of like national lockdown in India. And sampling 500 women was who were over the age of 20 years were selected by total illuminative sampling. All the women who have internet uh, connectivity available and they're able to understand the content of the questionnaire were enrolled in this study. And uh, the tool for the data action used was first is questionnaire to uh, assess the social demographic variable, then self structured questionnaire was used to assess the women's awareness regarding impact of COVID-19 on maternal health. We use four uh, point Likert scale to assess the attitude of the women and self structured objective type questionnaires were used to assess the self reported behavior about COVID-19. And all the tools were prepared on a Google form and the link was shared with the participants via mail and WhatsApp groups. Ethical permission was taken from the Institutional Ethical Committee and informed consent was taken from the participant prior to collecting data. So we have shared the survey link with approximately 7, 746 women and we obtained around 574 responses out of which 52 was removed because of the duplicate response. And those responses who were not fulfilling the criteria was around 22. So we ended end up with 500 uh, samples. After that, we closed the form once we uh, reached the target of 500. So next is analysis. So this is the distribution of subject according to social demographic variable. As most of the participants were within the age group of 22, 30 per, uh, years of age, that is 84.2%. Uh, most of them were graduated. 64.8%. Uh, then 69.8% uh, of the subjects were uh, doing private job and 66.8% of uh, them belong to urban area and mostly the subjects were unmarried. That is 71.6% who responded. So this is the distribution of subject according to awareness score. As you can see, we have divided them into good average and 
were good those uh, there was total 10 questionnaire which were being asked so good who uh, like uh, scored uh, between 7 to 10 average who scored between 4 to 6 and poor who scored between 1 to 3 so most of the participants were uh, uh, having average score that uh, that is 66.4% and the mean score was found to be 5.52 with standard uh, deviation of 1.608 so uh, next is uh, regarding the attitude uh, as uh, they, it was assessed with the help of a likert scale four point likert scale most of the pregnant women they believe that pregnant women seem to have same risk as a uh, non pregnant women and that is uh, around 36.8% of the women and uh, all the pregnant women need to be tested for covid positive nine this was believed by mostly women to around 40.4% uh, of the women and uh, 34.6% of the women they believe that pregnant women should limit their routine health checkups because of the fear of covid and 66.4% of the women they believe that conf uh, confirmed or suspected covid 19 women should uh, touch hold and breast feed uh, baby sorry should not touch uh, it's not then 34% uh, uh, of the women they believe that women should be discouraged to conceive during uh, the covid 19 outbreak and a hand washing should be done to keep the child uh, protected most of the women believe that then moving to the self reported behavior uh, we found that uh, approximately 40.8% of the women they were afraid that someone in the, uh, uh, sorry uh, they were not afraid that anyone in the family will catch this covid virus and the uh, 22.6% of the women they were uh, in this fear that someone in their family will catch this virus and uh, uh, when asked how much has covid-19 changed their daily routine most of the women responded that a lot of uh, their lifestyle has been changed because of this covid pandemic then uh, uh, next is uh, sorry uh, uh, then uh, some of the women they have changed their lifestyle uh, and uh, when asked whether they are using whatsapp or uh, other information regarding covid 19 so we have asked them how accurately this media provide the information so most of the women said the somewhat and uh, when uh, when asked that whether they are using who health alert about covid 19 infection and travel most of the people said that they are using them a lot so uh, next is finding the association of awareness with socio demographic variable uh, none of the uh, socio demographic variable show any significant association except the area of residence so they uh, we checked it with the help of uh, one way over test and uh, p value was around 0.0% which shows a significant difference between urban and rural areas then we check the correlation between awareness and attitude uh, so it uh, the, as the correlation value was Uh, we found a weak positive correlation between the awareness score and attitude it was assessed with the help of a carl pearson formula so the conclusion shows that most of the women were having average knowledge regarding covid-19 and impact of covid-19 on maternal health so there is need to reach more of the campaigns so that we can update the women regarding this uh, effect of covid-19 on maternal health as it is not yet over so this is all about my presentation thank you. these are the references thank you so much thank you so much do we have questions yeah uh, about Uh, Deepak, uh, yes, I'm having one question. Uh, you you said that you use the total enumerative uh, sampling. Yes, ma'am. Uh, how 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 are you saying that you have used total enumerative sampling? Because you said that total uh, there were seven forty six, and you got uh, the response from five seventy four. Yes, we got around four. Ma'am, actually, we anticipated that if we share this Google form with many people. uh we yes ma'am but uh, 
we uh, try to uh, take all the women who are available in the vicinity we share them in different states those who are having age more than 20 years so that we try to call it that is not called total enumerative sampling you can just go through once again it's okay your study is a good study but i think here you have to be a little clear about that yeah thank you um, thank you so much Thank you so much. Oh, by the way, Dr. Chair, I'm push. Anam answered the question. Uh, consequences between family relationships, those are living in rural areas. All right, are there any questions? Other questions? All right, let's proceed with the next oral presentation by Dr. Shalini Singh from BJ Medical College and Civil Hospital India. The topic is about a descriptive cross-sectional study to assess the impact of personal protective kits on working life of nursing staff. Dr. Shalini Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are audible now. Go ahead and share your screen, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, is my screen visible now? Yes, it is. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Shalini Singh. I am a resident doctor from the Department of Community Medicine, BJ Medical College. And uh, today I will be presenting my oral study on the title, A Descriptive Cross-Sectional Study to Assess the Impact of Personal Protective Kits on the Working Life of Nursing Staff. As we have all just witnessed the pandemic of the decade, the COVID-19, which created a chaos not only in the medical system, but also in the adjoining sectors of health. However, in the face of formidable challenge of dealing with this pandemic, the personal protective kits undoubtedly have provided us with a shield of protection for the healthcare workers, be it the doctors, the nursing staff, or the frontline workers, and have also served as a tool to mitigate the risk of hospital transmission. Now coming to what are those PPE kits? They comprises of respiratory protection, protective clothing, protective barriers, which protect us from the viral exposure. As you can all see on my screen, these are the various components of the uh, personal protective kits. However, various difficulties have been found to be associated with their usage that needs to be highlighted for their timely and effective redress. Now, the objectives of my this study is identification of the difficulties and challenges encountered by the nursing staff while working in the PPE kits during their pandemic time posting, and also to determine various factors that have posed challenge to the usage of PPE kits among the nursing staff members. Now, for my study, uh, the methodology that I have adopted I have conducted a cross-sectional study on the nursing staff members having performed COVID-19 duties and don't PPE kits. It was a hospital-based study conducted in the civil COVID hospital using a non-probability method. The sample size. The study was conducted using online questionnaire survey from which 121 valid responses were recorded in a three-month duration. The study tool used was a semi-structured questionnaire prepared and shared using the Google Forms. Then study analysis was done by using SPSS 26 and MS Excel. Now coming to the result, the sociodemographic profile. Uh, sorry. In my result, the maximum respondents, about 83% were females and 17.3% were the male nursing staff. The average age group was 38 plus minus eight years and about 38% of the major respondents belong to 40 to 49 year of age group. Coming to marital status, about 78% were married, rest were either single or widowed. Coming to the staff cadre, 
now among the staff cadre uh, the again i'm so sorry coming to the staff cadre the majority were uh, about 67% were uh, the uh, staff nurse followed by the infection control nurse which were 21% and rest were the resident nurses belonging to second and third year coming to the duty type they were equally divided in both opd and ipd duties now coming to their covid posting now working hours in hospital per week on an average it was found to be 38 hours plus minus 6 hours and about 51% of the nursing staff had done 30 to 39 hours of uh, like duty in hospital per week now coming to covid posting in months on an average, it was eight uh, plus minus four months. And coming to night shifts in the number of weeks, so about 86 percentage, they had about three to five night shifts. Now coming to PPE kit usage, about 54 percentage of the nursing staff, they had used single PPE kit per duty. And just 10 percent of them had used three or more PPE kits per duty. And coming to the duration, of uh, using each PPE kit. So about 68% had used it for five to eight uh, hours and only 32% had used it for less than five hours. Now, actually coming to the problem, what were the difficulties faced after donning the PPE kit? The major issues they had was the size issues with the PPE kit or its component. About 69% of the respondents had problem with that. It was followed by the problem of communicating with their staff members or the colleagues working in PPE kit or even difficulty in recognizing their colleagues. Some other problems faced were PPE kit like getting torn at one or more places, which was 59% and slipperiness of the shoe cover. Now, few adverse health effects that were actually faced by the nursing staff members about all of them. 100% had the problem of sweating and dehydration. That's quite obvious, actually. Then it was followed by the problem of ear pain and nasal pain, which was 76 to 79%. Then it was followed by pressure marks on the skin or the skin soreness, which was 64%. Now, this was followed by the issues like headache, breathlessness, suffocation, fatigueness, and even allergic rashes. Now, some other issues. Now, some other issues that were found was among the female nursing staff, about 54% had problem due to the PPE kits during their menstruation period. And almost uh, rest of the people, like staff, they, had, uh, they were forced to remove their PPE kits because of the urge of like urination. So that was again putting them to use more number of PPE kits. Then others, like in uh, the senior nursing staff, there were problem of adult diapers use among 4%. And among them, 1% almost had an issue with those adult diapers. Now, some few results were problem related to these kits were found to be more associated with the senior nursing staff in comparison with the resident nurses, owing to the prolonged working hours and the age factor. Now, this was found significant with the uh, chi-square being 8.91 and p-value being less than 0 0.05. Now, pressure marks on the skin or the skin soreness again was found to be significantly associated with increased number of PPE kits. Now, this was again found like p-value with less than 0 0.05. Some other like significant findings that were found was the issues of like fatigueness. There was quite gender-wise difference in this problem, which was found to be statistically significant. Now, other problems of like forced to remove PPE kit due to urination urge or problem during their periods or the issues of like nasal pain, ear pain, all these problems, they were found to be more associated when the kits were wore, worn for five to eight hours as compared to less lesser duration and all these findings when applied or when chi-square test were found to be significant now coming to the results of like knowledge assessment when we had asked them that what was the actual time taken by them for donating the ppe kits about 56.1 percent told that they took more than 15 minutes like 20 to 25 minutes 
for doning and doping and about 44% responded that they took less than 15 minutes now coming to like whether virus dispersion occurs more during doning stage or doping about 78% told that this happened during the doping stage and now coming to the ppe kit disposal by the nursing staff members about majority of them they chose that they disposed of the ppe kit or its component in both the yellow and the red bags the different components in the different bags and uh, about very less had responded that they used only the yellow bags or only the red bags so the overall implication and the conclusion from my study comes out that there are various areas of concern related to working in these ppe kits which have an implication on the working life of the nursing staff and this can be avoided by use of appropriate technology now this may involve improving the quality of equipment ensuring optimum supply using face mask with plastic connectors to reduce the ear pain then by using moisturizers and emollients one can improve the skin barriers and avoid the skin pressures then encouraging the staff members to shift to diets rich in more fruits and vegetables and also cutting off like caffeine and sugary items from their diet can prevent them from the problem of like dehydration and sweating while they work in ppe kits so my study enumerates like various uh, we have seen the good part and my study is now depicting some of the like cons of working in these ppe kits but within their remedial scope so in the coming future i don't hope for a pandemic of course but like in the coming future uh, whenever we have to work with those ppe kits one can be aware of these problems that we have faced and could use some of the measures to prevent them now these are the few references that has helped me in my studies and thank you thank you so much do we have any are there any questions Dr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shalini. It is uh, a good study, and it was the need uh, of need of the hour to do this study. I just want to ask whether you did this study uh, when uh, the nurses were using these uh, um, kits or afterwards. Now, because now the COVID pandemic, the number of patients are less in the hospital. So, uh, whether you did it at that time or afterwards. Ma'am, uh, I did it during the second wave. Obviously, after the first wave, my study was like okay. conducted during April, May, and June. The during the second wave of COVID nineteen, when and in my respondents, many were like currently they were doing, the, they were working in those PPE kits, right. and many had already worked in the first wave itself. Okay, so based upon your studies, with I, I I'm sure that you might have presenting your find uh, presented your findings to your management also of your hospital. Whether there were any policy changes or some specific measures taken, so that these concerns related to PPE kit can be reduced. Yes, ma'am. Like measures, like uh, there was a talk on like improving the quality of those PPE kits, especially the elasticity which which uh with. Which those PPE kits are manufactured because of the pressures and all that is being uh, the injuries and those happens on the face and all. So there was actually a talk on improving the quality, uh, keeping sufficient number of PPE kits, and of course they were also given proper training, like uh, so that there can be less exposure with those PPE kits and more of like nutritional support to them. Like there was right. canteen, there is sufficient amount of good foods, uh, fresh fruits uh, could be supplied to them, and more of like uh, drinks, so that they don't get dehydrated while they are performing their duties. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you, Doctor Shah. Ah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, and let's go ahead and proceed with our next present oral presentation by Doctor Nimisha Cheruko. Overwatch Neuro USA. The topic is about the infection control measures during COVID-19 for healthcare professionals. Nimisha? Oh. Oh, um, yeah. Oh. Our next presenter will proceed with our next pre presentation. Oral presentation by 
Diana Lalifabai from King Fahad Medical City, Riyadh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The topic is about the concerns, perceived impact, and preparedness during COVID-19, the nurse's perspective. Um, Diana? Yes, I'm, I'm trying to share my screen. Go ahead, please. And I also given you co-host access so that, can you try it again? Can you try it again? Doctor? I mean, Diana? Uh, yes, I'm trying to share my screen. Oh, I couldn't. You can see the share screen below. Yeah, yeah, yes, I know, but I couldn't. What do you mean I couldn't? Um, when you click on share screen, you will see another window. Yep. Please choose your presentation, then click on click the window where your presentation is, then click on share button. Diana, do you need more time? Uh, can, can I do next, please? Sure, no problem. All yeah, right, so let's you. proceed with our next oral presentation by Ashima Rashid from Rufaida College of Nursing, Jamea Hamdard University, India. The topic is about the assessment of knowledge regarding preventive measures 
and identification of coping strategies related to COVID-19. Ashima? Oh. Oh, thank you. Go ahead, please. Ma'am, is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Okay. Please have it in presentation mode, then proceed. Um, is it visible? Yes, it is. Please proceed. Good afternoon to all of you. Myself, Asima Rashid from Rafeda College of Nursing. And today I'm going to give my oral e-paper presentation on assessment of knowledge regarding preventive measures and identification of coping strategies related to COVID-19. Under the guidance of Ms. Seema Rani, Associate Professor of Rupeda College of Nursing, and my co-guide, Mr. Naseem Manjeri, Nursing Tutor, Rupeda College of Nursing. Uh, as we see that this outbreak of COVID-19, it has been declared a public health emergency as the virus has spread to many countries and territories. The virus is mostly transmitted through direct contact with respiratory droplets of an infected person, generally through coughing and sneezing. An individual can also be infected from touching the surfaces, contaminated with the virus and by touching their face. While it continues to spread, it's important that communities take action to prevent further transmission, reduce the impacts of the outbreaks and support control measures. Uh, why I need to conduct this study was that uh, this COVID-19, it affects people every day. So there was a need for awareness regarding the preventive measures of this COVID-19 as uh, we can see the persons who are at risk of getting this infection are mostly elders and who are the comorbid already having the other diseases like diabetes or any heart diseases. And also it has also affect the physical and mental health of the person. There is a feeling of isolation, depression, anxiety, and other stress during this pandemic time. And also the implementation of lockdown and movement restriction, it has also affected the financial condition of the individuals. And this financial problem, it has affected the person's physical as well as mental health. Hence, hence need of the study. Uh, the objectives of my study were to assess the knowledge regarding preventive measures related to COVID-19 among adult population in a selected area of Kashmir, to identify the coping strategies related to COVID-19 among adult population in a selected area of Kashmir, to seek association between knowledge regarding preventive measures related to COVID-19 with selected demographic variables, age, gender, educational qualification among adult population in a selected area of Kashmir. The hypothesis will be there will be a significant association between knowledge regarding preventive measures related to COVID-19 and when selected demographic variables, age, gender, educational qualification among adult population in a selected area of Kashmir at level of significance less or equal to 0.05 as measured by questionnaire. The assumptions of my study were there will be awareness among adult population regarding preventive measures of COVID-19 Adult members adopt certain coping strategies to deal with stressful situations like anxiety, fear. Adult members give frank and honest opinion regarding coping strategies. My study was delimited to adult population between 18 to 50 years of age and those who were residing in stadium colony. It was delimited to adult population who were using internet and smartphones and who can, uh, and who, uh, can comprehend forms and know English. The methodologies used were my, in my uh, study, the research approach was called a quantitative research approach and descriptive research design was used. Study population was adult population in the age group of 18 to 58 years using smartphones and study setting was in home or office setting. Uh, samples where there were 100 adult members uh, using non-probability convenient sampling technique. Data collection tools here were divided into three uh, parts. First was a questionnaire related to sociodemographic data where age, gender, and educational qualification. Second was a questionnaire for knowledge assessment where 35 questions were given uh, and each correct answer was, score, was being scored one and wrong answer was given a score of zero. And third was a brief for which was a standardized tool for identification of coping strategies which was divided into two categories, approach coping and avoidant coping. 
and it was a 28 item uh, scale in which 12 items were in approach coping 12 in avoidant coping and two items were uh, the neutral or independent coping variables in my study were research variables which were assessment of knowledge and identification of coping strategies and demographic variables which were age gender and educational qualification data was analyzed to descriptive and inferential statistics uh, validity of the tool were uh, the tool was given to seven experts from field of nursing and medicine and their suggestions were incorporated in the tool the reliability of the tool it was checked by test retest method that is pal call person correlation coefficient and it was found reliable at 0 0.97 uh, ethical permission was obtained from jamia hamdard institutional ethics committee new delhi to conduct research study uh, and informed consent were uh, given to the study subjects their confidentiality of the sub subjects were maintained the following were the results First was related to social demographic variables. We can see out of the 100 study subjects, most of the study subjects belong to the age group of 18 to 27, uh, that is 41, or we can say the 41 percent. Uh, out of 100 study subjects, more 51 were male, and that is 51 percent. And out of 100 study subjects, we can see the maximum people were graduates, that is 45 or 45 percent. Second was related to the assessment of knowledge regarding preventive measures of COVID-19. And here we can see the out of 100 study subjects, 65 or 65 percent people had educate knowledge that it, they obtained the score between 28 to 35. And out of 100 study subjects, 35 or 35 percent had inadequate knowledge that is they had obtained the score between 0 to 27. Second was related to the identification of coping strategies. Uh, by uh, looking at the table, we can see out of these 100 study subjects, the most adopted coping strategies used by these uh, used by the adult population was approach coping, then avoided and then avoidant coping. That means their coping strategy was better. And the last, which was the association of uh, which was regarding the association between the knowledge and the uh, selected demographic variables. We can see from the table that uh, the calculated chi-square value and the table chi-square value. Uh, calculated chi-square value is greater than table chi uh, table chi-square value. Hence, the value. Hence, uh, this. Uh, hence, uh, it is the highly significant association. Discussion uh, in uh, the uh, in my study. The, it really revealed that the subjects had adequate knowledge that is about 65 percent and that may be due to the better access to internet and widespread information through data uh, media uh, and this study it was in partially line with the uh, study that was conducted by Rani S. et al to assess the uh, knowledge regarding prevention of coronavirus disease where the results were that 98.98 percent of community have adequate knowledge uh, the low score in my study may be due to the scoring criteria, which was 80% and above. Second, also my findings reveal that the most adopted coping strategies used by study subjects were approach coping, then avoidant coping. Uh, this study, it was also similar to the study that was conducted by Sinar S. et al. to assess the coping strategies of chronic hemodialysis patients, where it was revealed that the uh, mostly, most uh, yeah, most uh, used coping strategies were turning to religion, active coping, and suppression of competing activities that are included in the approach coping. That means your coping strategies was also better. Uh, implications where I uh, we can I can use my studies in education. Uh, this study can be used to provide opportunities to prepare nurses who would play a key role in the community to taught individuals about prevention of COVID-19. In nursing administration, the study can be used to provide the necessary facilities for nursing staff to equip themselves with knowledge and to deal with patients in their needs and problems. Uh, in nursing practice, this study can be used to conduct a skill training program in community regarding prevention of COVID-19. And this research, it can be used with special reference to particular needs and problems 
of the individual members regarding COVID-19. This study can be recommended um, like a planned teaching program can be conducted to assess the pre-test and post-test knowledge regarding prevention of COVID-19 or a comparative study can be conducted between the coping strategies adopted from the pandemic and other illnesses between rural and urban population. These were the references of my study. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Dr. Chair, do you have any questions? Dr. Chair? No, I don't have any questions, okay. Jojo. Thank you. Thank you. Then let's go back. Um, oral presentation by Diana Lalisa by Diana. Oh, one uh, yes. Hi. Are you ready? Hi. Yes. Perfect. Uh, can you see my screen? Almost. There you go. Yes. Go ahead, please. Thank you. A pleasant afternoon to all. So I'm Dr. Diana. I'm working as a nurse manager. Um, I'm the head of nursing research and evidence-based section at King Power Medical City in Saudi Arabia. So today I'm going to present one of my research. And in today's session, I'm going to talk about these aspects. So coming to the introduction, so as you all know, COVID-19 is a new public health uh, crisis that affected the international healthcare system. So as of January uh, 2020, WHO has determined or announced COVID-19 as a public health crisis. And according to WHO bulletin, 22, uh, September 10, 2020, the number of confirmed cases stood by 27.848 million and number of deaths were around 9 lakhs. So this was the statistics while uh, we were conducting our study. So coming to the background of the study, so healthcare providers uh, are expected, or the key people uh, to confront COVID-19 pandemic because they are highly susceptible to the infection from constant exposure to patients. So unfortunately, they face a lot of challenges so the research community is interested in this particular group to do a lot of researches. Now, if you see the literature, there is a lot of research done on COVID-19 among healthcare professionals, but most of the studies are concentrated on stress, anxiety, and depression. So we went into a different perspective uh, to look into the concerns of healthcare providers, mainly the frontline healthcare providers, hence the study was initiated. So this study was conducted to assess the frontline healthcare providers' um, concerns and the impact of COVID-19 on their work life and personal life, and also the preparedness, both individual and institution, in handling COVID-19. So the below were the objectives set for our study. The first was to assess the uh, concern, both work and non-work-related concern. The second objective was to assess the perception of the impact of this COVID-19. And third was the institutional and in individual preparedness in handling COVID-19. So this was a descriptive cross-sectional study and the research site is a multicultural acute healthcare setting which is King Fahad Medical City. And the study was conducted among 534 nurses chosen by convenient sampling technique. And the study was approved by the Institutional Review Board of our setting. And the researchers followed all the ethical principles uh, as mentioned by Declaration of Helsinki. Consent was obtained by, from the participants and anonymity and confidentiality was assured throughout the study. So we used a 38 item questionnaire from a previous study done by WOM. Uh, the tool has three dimensions. 
the dimension one was on work-related and non-work-related concerns, which had eight and four items respectively. The dimension two uh, assessed the perception of the impact of pandemic on the personal and work life of the healthcare providers, which had 10 items. Uh, third dimension was on the personal and institutional preparedness of regarding uh, for, pand for the pandemic COVID-19. So it had 16 items. So coming to the demographics, the majority of the participants were female and majority were in the age group of 26 to 40 years. And if you look into the job title, majority of them were frontline registered nurses who were caring directly for the COVID patients. So here I'm going to discuss uh, the results under the dimension. So the first dimension was work-related and non-work-related concerns. Uh, regarding the work-related concerns, majority of the participants, 93.63% of participants expressed concern over acquiring the infection by caring for patients. And regarding the non-work-related concerns, 97.19% of respondents felt they, that relations, their relations, dependents and friends were worried about their health. And the second dimension was the impact of pandemic on the personal life and work life. So here, a good number of participants, that is 69.85% of the participants felt they, they felt more stress at work than before. And 62.73% of the respondents felt that the acquaintances, the people might distance them, avoid them because they work with COVID patients. These are the impact. And all these findings are supported by studies uh, regarding the personal and institutional preparedness. So we have, our institution have a well uh, established infection control department. So you can see in the finding, 96.88% of the respondents uh, affirm, confirmed that the infection control committee was available and 92.51% of respondents received training for infection control. And, Majority of the participants, you see 88.2% of the respondents felt adequately prepared on a personal basis. And 89.3% uh, mentioned that they were able to handle the pandemic. But we also looked into the association between the impact of COVID-19 and the demographic variables. Uh, but uh, as chi-square analysis did not reveal any association with the impact of pandemic with either concerns or preparedness, but there was a significant association with the perception of impact of pandemic on the personal and work life. So here, if you see uh, the registered nurses, the nurses who are closely working with the patients and the inner age group were more affected in their personal and work life compared to the other. So all our findings were supported by studies. So based on these results, we come to the conclusion. The study found that most healthcare professionals who responded to the survey felt that they worked under conditions of significant personal risk. So during this emergency of COVID pandemic situations, so because our institution was one of the center who cared for COVID patients in Riyadh. So the healthcare professional face physical and mental exhaustion, and they express their concern, uh, not only occurring the illness, but also they express their concern about coping with additional workloads and related stress due to this COVID-19. So this study has recommended that it is crucial to, uh, to plan for psychological support of healthcare providers during any pandemics. So our study had some limitations. So this study was limited to only one setting, healthcare setting uh, in Riyadh. So it is a cross-sectional study and survey. So these are the limitations we, uh, we had in our study. So to make the study better, this research of any research uh, which accompanies this research can include a larger sample with various healthcare providers. And also this study recommends, uh, this list, based on the findings of this study, we recommend the provision of psychological support of healthcare providers. So this can take the form of counseling, provision of PPG, 
is incentives infection control education also you can conduct studies to see the effect of these psychological support measures on the well being of the healthcare professionals caring for covid patients so this is the end of my presentations these are some of the reference thank you thank you so much and any questions yeah are there any questions let me ask our session chair I'm sorry, I deleted my final presentation, so that is was a confusion. Hi, Dr. Diana. Uh, it was a nice presentation. Yes. Uh, I just want to ask one question. If you play, you can answer. Uh, you yes. have used the self-prepared uh, tool. Have you got the reliability established for that tool? Yes, because this is a standard tool, even in our study. Uh, this study, it was a it standardized was tool. Yes, yeah, standard tool used in China. But still, we had our own, we conducted our reliability testing. It was 0.8. Okay. So which method you used? Test free test method. Okay. okay, thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Right. Since none, let's go ahead and proceed with our next oral presentation by Sorchi Sorchi Smita Pahan Tasting from Sum Nursing College, SOA University, India. The topic is about impact of digital media on quality of sleep during COVID-19 amongst the nursing students of selected college, Bobaneswar. Odisha. Sur Hold on. Sur Chismita. There you go. Hi. Go Hi. ahead and share your screen, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, all the organization, for uh, giving me uh, this opportunity uh, because this is a very uh, big platform uh, to present a scientific paper. So my uh, topic is impact of digital media on quality of sleep during COVID-19 among the nursing students. So, you know, uh, uh, World Health Organization in uh, March 2020 declared that uh, uh, the world pandemic disease is COVID-19 is the world pandemic disease. And in this context, and in this context, uh, this uh, COVID-19 has become an aggressive agent uh, which trigger the uh, negative psychological effects that can raise the level of anxiety, stress, and depression among the individual. This negative emotion contribute to affect the quality of sleep and which leads to different kinds of sleep disorders. So uh, this is all about the uh, generalization. If we do the generalization, this is all about the general people. While they are coming across the COVID-19, they have lots of psychological issues and that leads to quality of life. So this, during this time, we should not forget about the healthcare workers. So we, uh, we should not forget about the healthcare workers because they are coming in contact with the patients. They have lots of stress. They are using the PPE. Some, uh, sometimes they uh, may not be getting the enough PPE to protect themselves. They are having overtime. They are coming across the COVID infected patients. And they have lots of symptoms which are similar to COVID-19, but uh, they may not have. But And they are simultaneously detached from their family members and they are remaining in the social distancing. We have to follow the social distancing. So with these, all those uh, dilemmas, they may have lots of stresses. And to overcome these stresses or to get rid of that stresses, they are coming, uh, they are, you mostly they are using the internet. So how to get rid of that uh, these uh, symptoms or these uh, uh, issues, psychological issues. So they are using more and more on the internet and they are using the digital media. So that leads to sleep disturbances or difficulty in sleeping. So uh, this is about the healthcare professional. And if sometimes we are forgetting about the students because uh, students are the most of the time they are coming in contact with the digital media because during this COVID-19, they are confined in the home. They are socially isolated from each other. 
then um, fear of they also have the fear of getting infected with COVID-19. And most important thing is they are having the online classes for which they are using the mobile or any kind of mobile laptop, tel um, uh, any television, any kind of digital media, most frequently they are using. And which leads to overuse of social media, um, social media platform, bedtime use of digital media, uh, that leads to internet addiction and that affect the quality of sleep. So with this context, I chose the topic, the uh, impact of digital media on quality of sleep during COVID-19 among the nursing students. Because the nursing student, if you consider about the healthcare population, so the students are nursing students, basically, they are the majority population. So with this study, the objectives are to assess the quality of sleep during COVID-19 among nursing students. And second objective is to find out the association between quality of sleep and selected social demographic variables among the nursing students. There are some assumptions during COVID-19, nursing students may have increased use of digital media. Nursing students may be using digital media in the bedtime. Digital media may have some negative impact on the quality of sleep. These are some assumptions. In my study, uh, the research methodologies are like a research approach I have used, that is the quantitative research approach. Design is descriptive survey type research design. Research variables are digital media and quality of sleep. Setting of my study is some nursing college. Sample, BSc nursing students. Sample size is 100. And sampling technique, non-probability progressive sampling technique. And the uh, tool I have used for this study, First tool is self-structured socio-demographic questionnaire, and the variable is demographic variables. The method I have used for assessing the demographic variables is the Google form. Then a uh, second, uh, the tool I have used for assessing the quality of uh, uh, sleep, that is Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index Scale, which is a standardized tool, and it's having 19 items. Then uh, the variable of this tool is uh, quality of sleep, and I have used this tool in the Google form to collect the data. And the pilot study, I, I conducted the pilot study to check the feasibility of the study by taking the sample, 20 samples at Mother's College of Nursing, Kalinganagar, Ghatikya, Bhubaneswar from 14 1st uh, 2021 to 17 1st 2021. And permission was also obtained from the authorities. So after that, I conducted the study and uh, I, uh, I did the data analysis. So first data analysis I did, that is a frequency and percentage distribution of the subject according to socio-demographic variables. So when I was assessing the data, so I found the most of the samples were be, uh, belonging to 21, that is 65 percentage, belonging to 21 to 23 years of age. And majority of the participants were uh, female, that is 82 percentage, and 99 percentage of the participants were on marriage. So uh, they have mostly a majority of the study uh, participants, they have used the uh, mobile, that is 94 percentage. They have used this uh, digital media, that is mobile or cell phone, they have used. And uh, time use of digital media before lockdown, that is uh, less than five hours, 54 percentage of the participant, their majority are 54 percentage. And they use the digital media less than five hours during the period, uh, before the lockdown period. And time use of digital media during lockdown period, that is 61 percentage. So it is less than five hours. So it is in that most of the uh, participants are using the digital media during the lockdown period due to the confinement, due to the isolation, due to the uh, uh, what, uh, due to the loss of pressure, due to the loss of psychological consequences, they use the social media mostly during the lockdown period. <clears throat> then frequency and percentage distribution of the subject according to quality of sleep. So from the analysis, I found that 50%, 57 percentage of uh, participants had good sleep, but uh, uh, 43 percentage of participants of the subject, they had poor sleep or poor quality of sleep or difficult, they're uh, having difficulty in the sleep. While doing the chi analysis to find out the association of quality of life, 
uh, of sleep with selected socio-demographic uh, variables. I found only the digital media use, type of digital media use that is the mobile and uh, uh, hours of using digital media use during lockdown was uh, these two of uh, factors or these two variables are significant or associated with the um, uh, with the quality of sleep. Others are not significantly associated with the quality of life. So in conclusion, the study concluded that COVID-19 pandemic has a greater impact in uh, um, a greater impact in the uh, psychological part and excessive digital media use among the nursing students, which leads to poor quality of life. And this need, this is the need of the hour to work on this context to prevent the physical and psychological health issues among the students and to give a, a to give a quality life to them and to encourage them them to how to utilize their time fruitfully without spending their time in the digital media. So these are all my references uh, through which I have done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me get Dr. Chair. Dr. Chair, do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Suchi Smita, for your presentation. You. Uh, do you think that quality of sleep is affected by digital media only? It can be affected by... Uh, uh, the... No, no, ma'am. Lots of factors may be responsible, but... Uh, now, the youngsters or the adolescents mostly they are coming across the digital media or blue light emission that is uh, mainly is the now that this is the major factor for the sleep disturbances but if, if in relation to covid 19 you are talking then there are so many other factors fear of disease uh -huh. other stress factor may be there no. that that can be recommended that can be recommended for the future study you, you could have just uh, uh, try to find out the association with those yeah. things also. Ma'am, actually I have done this study as a, in a very small, uh, by taking the small variables. So this is my plan that I will conduct the study in uh, right. by taking other variables. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is my okay. future plan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And now let's go ahead and proceed with our next oral presentation by Amandeep Kaur from Chitkara School of Health Sciences, Chitkara University, India. The topic is about a dis descriptive study to assess the prevalence of physical and psychological problems due to virtual teaching, learning activities during COVID-19 pandemic among students. Hold on. Hi. Hi. Hello, ma'am. It's uh, Ramandeep Kaur. Oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm the last presenter, ma'am. My apologies. Amandeep. Amandeep. She's not here. All right. Let's wait for here for her for that presenter. Let's go ahead and proceed. Now to our next oral presentation by Pragati Das from FGT University, India. The topic is about a descriptive study to assess the knowledge, attitude, and belief regarding COVID vaccine among non-teaching staff working in FGT University, Gurugram. Pragati? All right, I think Pragati is not in the audience. Let's, Ramandi, <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> I, oral presentation by Ramandi Kaur, Government Medical College and Hospital, College of Nursing, Chandigarh, India. Her topic is about a COVID reverberation, resilience, and coping among ICU nurses, a cohort study. Ramandi, There you go. Okay. 
Right, you can go ahead and proceed. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Ramandeep Kaur, PhD scholar from College of Nursing, Government Medical College and Hospital, Chandigarh. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience, but we go, please go. My problem statement is COVID revivation, resilience and coping among ICU nurses, a cohort study. Introduction of my topic is fear and anxiety are quite common in unseen circumstances like COVID-19, which testify the healthcare capacity. Nurses remarkably proved to the strongest pillar all over the world. Nurses who worked in the COVID unit, especially the COVID intensive care unit, dealt with the fear of the unknown because Corona being the novel virus imposed doubts in everybody's mind in the initial phase. So need for my study in March 2020, when the first case of Chandigarh was admitted in our facility, that is Government Medical College and Hospital Chandigarh, it triggered anxiety regarding exposure to the virus, worries about nurses, family being at risk, fear of limited resources. These fears were predominant even before working in the COVID unit. In addition, literature reflects that those who work directly with corona, uh, coronavirus patient witness suffering and death resulting in emotional fatigue and mental distress and even the post-traumatic stress manifestation were also experienced. So objectives of my studies to first was to assess the fear and anxiety caused due to the posting in the COVID ICU. Second objective was to compare the fear and anxiety level before, during and after the posting in the COVID ICU. Third is to identify the level of resilience among nurses and resilient coping among nurses. Last objective was to find out the association of socio-demographic variables with fear, anxiety, and resilience and coping. Assumption for my study was the level of fear and anxiety will be high before posting than during and after posting. So research methodology. So here we have assessed the three variables. First was fear and anxiety. Second was resilience. And third was resilient coping. So fear and anxiety was assessed in three phases. First was before posting, during posting, and after posting. Before posting was on the day of the duty roster sharing. During posting, that was on the third day of the posting. And after was on the third day of the rest. And resilience was assessed only one time, that is after the a posting, which means on the first day of the rest, whereas the resilient coping was assessed on the after posting, which was on the third day of the rest only. Research design. So research design here used what that the cohort study was conducted among the nursing officers at COVID dedicated IC of the South Campus of Government Medical College Hospital, Chandigarh. An online survey was created using Google form and sent to the nursing officer to describe the fear, anxiety and resilience and coping related to the COVID-19. Sampling technique adopted was the total sampling. Ethical approval was obtained from the institutional ethical committee. And tool used for the data collection was first of all modified fear and anxiety COVID-19 scale. Second was modified brief resilience scale. And third was brief resilience coping scale. Research intervention was that during the routine rounds of COVID ICU, it was observed that the staff nurses had a fear and anxiety to work in the COVID area. Some of the staff resisted and refused to work in the COVID ICU. Thus, a psychiatrist posted for the counseling of the COVID patient was also involved in the counseling of the nursing officers as well. The counseling session was carry, carried out on the day of the starting of the duty, followed by the need of the nursing officers. In addition to this, day-to-day -day apprehension were dealt with by taking the round of the assistant nursing superintendents. Also, a training and induction program was conducted two days before the posting. Analysis and the interpretation. So table one, the social demographic uh, profile of the frontline nurses. So according to the age, 50.9% of the population belong to the 21 to 29 years of age group, 40.2% will belong to 30 to 39 years of age group, and 8.9% belong to the 40 years and above. According to the gender, 
24.1 percent of the nursing officers were male and 75.9 percent were female according to the educational status 23.2 were having gnm as a qualification 67.9 were having bsc and 8.9 were having msc as a qualification as per experience 44.6 were having experience less than five years 36.6 were having experience within a, a year of 5 to 10 years and 18.8 .8 were having experience more than 10 years. As per marital uh, status, 42% were single and 58% were married. Second section, assessment of the fear and anxiety caused due to posting in the COVID ICU. So before COVID posting, 18% uh, of 18 of the number were having no fear and anxiety, whereas 37 were having mild fear and anxiety, 36 were having moderate, whereas 21% uh, of some sample were having severe fear and anxiety. During the COVID posting, 44.6% were having no fear and anxiety, whereas 41.1% were having mild fear and anxiety, and 143 were having moderate fear and anxiety, and zero number of sample were having a um, severe anxiety similarly after covid posting there was a 30 33.9 percent were having no fear and anxiety whereas 51 were a uh, 0.8 were having mild and 14.3 were having moderate and in the category of the severe there is zero so the reason for the, uh, such decrease in the anxiety uh, was due to the uh, posting of the counselor as well as the induction training conducted uh, for them. Table third, resilience and resilient coping among the nurses. So 17% were having low resilience and 82.1 were having moderate and 0.9 were having a high resilience with the mean of 3.22 with standard deviation of 0.48. And resilience coping, uh, 20 number of the sample were having low resilient cop uh, copper, whereas 64 were moderate and 28 were high. Association of the social demography variables with fear, anxiety, and resilience and cop uh, coping. So in the present research study, it was found that young nurses, that is within the age of 21 to 29 years, single and female nurses demonstrated severe fear and anxiety. However, there was no statistically significant association was found between fear and anxiety with age, gender, education, experience, and marital status at P less than 0 0.05 value. But there was a statistically significant association of resilience with age and marital status at P value less than 0 0.05. Plus, there was also a statistically significant association of the coping with gender, experience, and marital status. So discussion, we can say that resilience depends upon the adaptation efforts and it is commonly influenced by factors like marital status, years of experience. Nurses with the good resilience successfully adopt proactive method to deal with the stress, fear and anxiety. Literature reveals that healthcare team members need to have an essential skill of resilience to adapt and recover from physical as well as psychological trauma and damage. This is the only skill that helps them to overcome and adapt to work-related fear and anxiety. Thus, inference was drawn that with age, the resilient and coping ability improved and married nurses were more resilient and were able to cope up faster than others. A similar statistical association was observed for the gender and years of experience with resilient coping. So, conclusion. So, the study identified fears like risk for exposure to the novel virus and then carrying the same to their family. So the uh, with the help of the organization support, like by uh, providing the surplus resources like PP kits, managerial supports by avail available of sorting issue and monitoring the area closely, plus by training and induction program conduction, telephonic counseling session, fair distribution of staff and unbiased approach on making duty roster. These were the few organization, managerial and social support provided for the nurses in the institution so that fear anxieties are overcome. Resilience is gained and adapt adaptation occurs smoothly. This research did not receive any specific grant from funding agencies in the public, commercial or the non-profit sectors. So implication, the finding of this study will provide input for the policymakers and nursing administrator on how to effectively support the mental health of the frontline nurses and sustain a well-engaged nursing workforce, particularly during unpredicted situation and identify the factors that may 
influence resilience among nurses so these were the references i have taken thank you very much for the patient listening well thank you so much all right hold on let me get it hold on Dr. Chair, do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ramandeep, for the nice presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ramandeep, uh, you found that there was fear and anxiety and uh, some nurses, they, they were less resilient also. So did you, uh, did you present these findings to yes, your management and did you do something? for improving the re resilience of nurses well, actually uh, when for uh, when before the posting higher level of anxiety and fear got there then we informed to the medical superintendent due to which the counselor was posted in the covid hospital south campus in sector 48 ma'am uh, a plus a timely round was taken by the ans as well as a uh, few of them uh, were having like uh, mm. they were uh, having problem like this having a kid is small, like uh, some uh, problems like this. I mean, in fact, we, the faculty of the College of Nursing were posted in the COVID ICU too. So we were uh, posted, we were all on the post of the ANS. So we personally took the rounds, including our uh, principal madam. So we managed their problems, like alternative, uh, as per their convenience, some of the, them were refusing to do the night duties especially in the covid icu uh, this study was conducted in the time of august to october 2020 when for the very mm -hmm. first time uh, south campus was opened in sector 48 okay. mm -hmm. uh, ma'am then uh, during the when the second wave came in the month of april again in the month of april uh, this sector 48 hospital was opened so at that time a proper there was a proper room for the counseling of these uh, staff nurses to deal with this anxiety so, ma'am, uh, we can say that the uh, counselor provision from the organization side and that uh, another was the proper medical supply, like they were complaining PP kit uh, are not efficient. So, the procurement procurement of the PP kit from some another agency was done. So, these mm -hmm. were the some uh, minor changes which I have personally seen. Yeah, that's great to listen. And... Uh... Uh, I think uh, you can also plan for the resilience training because re resilience can be improved with the training also. So that can also be done apart from counseling. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Thank you so much. Now we will have um, next is a pre recorded presentation um, by Nimisha Chiruko. Overwatch Neuro USA, the topic is the infection control measures during COVID-19 for healthcare professionals. Hold on. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Nimisha Charuku and I'm Dr. Nimisha Charuku and I will be speaking so to you why today is infection about infection control important? measures for According healthcare to the professionals. And this is a very important topic and by no means a small one. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Nimisha Charku and I will be speaking to you today about infection control measures for healthcare professionals. Now, this is a very important topic and by no means a small one. My aim here is to provide an outline and highlight some major factors which I think every healthcare professional should know. So why is infection prevention important? According to the Joint Commission here in the US, 
non-compliance ranks third in the list of citations, and 74% of these are non-compliant in infection control and prevention. So why do you need to know about infection prevention? To protect ourselves, our patients, our family, we need to know where to look for information, what types of precautions we can take, and the government organizations which provide us the guidelines on how to prevent transmission and provide control. So what makes the chain of infection? There's a source, there's transmission, and there's a host. The sources are the reservoirs of infectious organisms, and they can be people, usually patients, personal visitors, or even inanimate objects. Transmission is spread and it can be through contact, droplet, airborne, common vehicle, or vector bone. And the host is a susceptible person or organism. Now a host needs an opening or a gate for an infectious organism like bacteria or fungus to enter. And it's usually wounds, which are easy, easy openings. So what are the sources of infection and what are their modes of transmission? The most common sources of exposure are internal hospital sources, which leads to nosocomial infections, which are usually contaminated equipment or coworkers or vendors, and even uh, small objects like common use items like pencils and tablets and cell phones. The other one are the external sources, which are food, general public and uh, environment pollutants, even cash and headphones and cell phones. Uh, these are all the major sources of exposure. So what are the modes of transmission? We have airborne transmission, usually chickenpox, measles, meningitis. It's a big one for tuberculosis, droplet for uh, influenza, diphtheria, vector for Lyme disease, contact transmission, the most common of which is MRSA. So what kind of precautions can we take for to prevent this transmission? We have standard precautions and transmission-based precautions. So the standard precautions are used for all patients in all healthcare settings, and it applies to blood and body fluids, not for sweat and non-intact skin. And this one so serves as the primary basis for the infection control practices, and it assumes that every person is potentially infected. So these precautions are standard for everybody, regardless of their infection status. And then we have the transmission-based precautions, which are used in addition with standard precautions. And these are specific for patients or conditions that are highly transmissible. And these provide supplemental practices for airborne or droplet infections. So here is an outline of the standard precautions that are suggested by WHO. And you can get more details of, of these on the WHO website. So hand hygiene, hand washing, hand sanitizer, gloves. You got to change your gloves between tasks and procedures, even if it is on the same patient, if they are in contact with infectious material. And hand hygiene after removal of the gloves is important. Then there's facial protection, gowns for splash protection, and you have to remove your soiled gowns as soon as possible and perform hand hygiene prevention of needle stick injuries, respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, environmental cleaning, which is routine cleaning and disinfection, linens, waste disposal, and patient care equipment. You have to clean, disinfect, and reprocess reusable equipment before use with another patient. So highlighting the most essential precautions, uh, hand washing and PPE. Uh, hand washing, or hand hygiene, as we know, is a major component of standard precautions and is also one of the most effective methods to prevent transmission. In addition to that, there's the use of PPE or personal protective equipment. And this should be guided by risk assessment and the extent of contact you anticipate with blood and body fluids. For hand hygiene, it's necessary that you wash your hands or do hand hygiene before and after leaving the lab or patient room or before or after using gloves. Uh, and you have to wash your hands at least for 20 seconds with soap and water. That is the minimum requirement. Uh, so for PPE, you have to assess the risk of exposure to body substances or contaminated surfaces before any healthcare activity. And you have to make this a routine. So you, then you select PPE based on the assessment of risk. 
uh, use gloves and gown and uh, face protection and eye masks and make sure you remove the PPE before you leave the work area and then perform hand hygiene after that. Okay, so what about cleaning? Cleaning is used to remove the soil or dirt, which may or may not be visible, and it's usually done with water and detergent. So, and we need to remove it because that is a favorable environment for the microorganisms to grow in. And it is important to note that cleaning alone does not remove or affect the microorganisms. It requires water, friction, and detergents. And you have to follow the manufacturer recommendations for cleaning the instruments. And you have to clean thoroughly because presence of any of this organic matter will affect the ability of the disinfectant to do its job. Therefore, cleaning is mandatory before doing any sort of disinfectant. So disinfection is based on the level of usage and the classification of the items, which is provided by CDC. So according to CDC, the disinfection levels are based on contact. So we have non-critical items, semi-critical items, and critical items. So the non-critical items are items that have contact with intact skin, like a bedpan or blood pressure cuff. And this requires low-level disinfection. You can use phenolics or chlorine-based compounds. The semi-critical items are items that are exposed to non-intact skin or blood and body fluids, like anesthesia equipment, endoscopes, laryngoscopes. And for this, you need high-level disinfection using chemical disinfectants like hydrogen peroxide. Then we have critical items, which are items that enter tissue or vascular spaces or that which blood flows through. So these are instruments like scalpels, chisels, and uh, forceps, things like that. These require the highest level of disinfection, which is sterilization, done through autoclaving, which is steam. And do not start disinfection without wearing PPE. This is absolutely essential for prevention of infection. So you have to wear your PPE before you start the disinfection process. So applying what we have heard so far to the COVID-19 situation, what do we know about COVID-19? We know a lot more than we knew before, for sure, and we're still learning how the virus spreads and the severity of illness it causes. We know that it spread, may it spread mainly from person to person, but we do not know if it spreads by a common vehicle, but we know that people without symptoms can also spread it. So standard precautions are a must. In addition, you also use, have to use transmission prevention precautions, like avoiding close contacts and following cough and sneeze etiquettes and washing your hands. So what about PPE? PPE in COVID is absolutely recommended. And according to the CDC, you use it with an N95 uh, respirator or a surgical face mask as an alternative. So you have gloves, you have goggles, and you have a gown. And there's a proper technique to wear the PPE. You gotta do hand hygiene and wear gloves then wear your N95 or surgical mask, disinfect your face shield or goggles and wear them. Then wipe down the equipment with the appropriate disinfectant. Then remove the gloves and do hand hygiene again. Then wear your gown and new gloves. Then you enter the procedure room. This is the proper way to make, to wear a PPE. So what about eye protection? So eye protection is often neglected, and this is also absolutely essential for infection prevention. So in addition to the mask covering your nose and mouth, face shields or goggles are recommended for eye protection. And this is strongly recommended for patient interaction where there's droplet exposure. So these should be designated to one staff member and should not be shared. They need to be properly disinfected and stored uh, for reuse if needed and proper hand hygiene should always occur before and after contact with the face shield or goggles. Care also has to be taken while removing the PPE. So to remove the PPE, following the procedure, you exit the room, remove and dispose of your gown or gloves in the anteroom if you have one, and then uh, perform hand hygiene, wear new gloves, clean and disinfect your face shield or goggles, and then change your mask if you're using a face mask. 
perform hand hygiene again, wear new gloves, and disinfect your equipment twice. This is important. You have to disinfect your equipment twice. And lastly, you remove the gloves and perform hand hygiene. Do not remove your face shield or goggles or mask in the patient's room or in the anteroom. Wait until you exit the environment into your hallway before you remove your face shield or goggles or your mask. Okay, so what about cleaning and waste management? Most equipment that is not disposable can be gas sterilized. And the recommendation is obviously to use disposable, but where it's not available, the equipment that's not disposable can be gas sterilized, not just steam, it has to be gas sterilized. And don't reuse equipment that has been contaminated, um, especially your masks and gowns, if they're contaminated with blood or body fluids, discard them when you're in co close contact with an infectious disease patient. The medical waste that's coming from the healthcare facilities treating the COVID-19 patients is no different than the waste coming from facilities without the COVID-19 patients. So same precautions have to be taken to dispose of the material. So according to the CDC, the healthcare workers should be aware of the regulations surrounding the disinfectants and the sterilants that are used, and they should also know how and when to apply these, pro uh, these products and some of the major organizations that can provide us with significant information are here, the major of which are CDC and WHO. So in conclusion, the most basic transmission-based uh, precautions have to be taken, like following cough and sneeze head tickets, frequent hand washing, social distancing. But for every patient, you need to use standard precautions. I would like this to be the takeaway today. And we have to, every member of the healthcare team needs to follow the guidelines so they can help break the chain of infection. And we have to be vigilant and continue to follow these precautions. Earlier the implementation, earlier the prevention of spread. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And I hope I could give some information about Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we cannot cater any questions since they are pre-recorded videos. And we will proceed with another pre-recorded from Mrs. Lalita, Associate Professor of the Department of Mental Health Nursing, C-O-N-P-I-M-S, Puducherry. Um, the topic is about Structured teaching program and knowledge regarding the three effects of alcoholism. Morning to all. First, I thank to God Almighty. Uh, thank you very much for giving this opportunities. Organization Secretary. Secretary, Management Administrators and Principal Ma'am. I am Lalita, Associate Professor, Department of Mental Health Nursing. I am going to present the um, uh, research paper, Outlines of the Study, Title of the Study, Introduction, Need for the Study, Objectives, Statement of the Problems, Research Methodology, Results, Discussion, Conclusion and Reference. And now we will see the title of the study, Structure Teaching Program on Knowledge Regarding the Ill Effects of Alcoholism. And next we will see the introduction part, Adolescence is a very uh, sensitive
active period because of biological, hormonal and uh, psychological changes super added with increased responsibility. Alcohol use is a major effect problem affecting the school and college students with the influence of the globalizing economics and changing the cultural norms. More and more young people are experimenting with alcohol at a very early age in India. In India, every year millions of college students are affected by alcoholism. The college years are some of the most popular times to experiment with alcohol. Roughly 80% of college students, 4 out of 5, consume alcohol to some degree. Coming to the need for the study was, alcoholism is a worldwide problem, not confined either to developed or to developing nations. The adverse consequences of alcohol not only affect the individual's uses, but the society as a whole. Creating an awareness regarding the alcoholism and its adverse effects will reduce the morbidity and mortality related to alcoholism and saves more lives and families. Nowadays, college students are more prone to alcohol addicts. Since Pondicherry is a place where the liqueur drinks are cheap and available, the numbers of shops are more to get sources to celebrate birthday, parties, fun, enjoys and peer pressure. So coming to the uh, statement of the problem was study to assess the effect of structured teaching program on knowledge regarding the ill effects of alcoholism among college students in selected college at Puducherry. Objectives of the study was to assess the knowledge on uh, ill effects of alcoholism among college students to find out the effect of structured teaching program on knowledge regarding the ill effects of alcoholism among college students to determine the association between knowledge on ill effects of alcoholism among college students with selector with social uh, demography variables so next we will move to the research methodology research approach quantitative approach research design one pre uh, group pre test and post test was used setting of the study motla nehru government polytechnic college last bit at puducherry target populations diploma mechanical engineering college students sample college students between 18 to 22 years of age studying in selected college who fulfill this inclusion criteria sampling technique convenient sampling sample size was 60 data collection pre-test structure teaching program and um, after the seventh day is a post-test structure teach uh, self administered questionnaire was used data analysis and a dissemination of research findings scoring interpretation knowledge level score percentage adequate knowledge less than 75 percentage, moderate knowledge 50 to 75 percentage, inadequate knowledge less than 50 percentage. Description of intervention, the structured teaching program was prepared by the investigator, 20 minutes duration which includes the selected aspects of Ill, Ill effects of alcoholism such as uh, charts and blackboards are used, audiovisual aids, lesson plan pamphlets like introduction, definition, incidents, and main causes of signs and symptoms, risk factors, side effects, complication, medical management, nursing intervention, and preventive measures. Ethical consideration. Proposed study was conducted after getting approval from institutional review board. Written concern was obtained from participants and confidentiality. Data collection procedure. Main study was conducted from one week, 60 mechanical engineering students. On the first day, pre-test was conducted and next using the structured teaching program and 10 to 15 minutes question was spent to for each participant. After pre-test, all participants were gathered in the classroom. The structured teaching program was given for 20 minutes on the same day. Average eight to nine students were participated per day. And seventh day is the investigator visited each participant in college and post-test was conducted in the same area. Analysis of the data, there are four uh, section A and B, C and D and distribution of college students according to socioeconomic variables, level of knowledge regarding the ill effects of alcoholism among college students and the effectiveness of stru uh, structure teaching program and um, association between the level of knowledge on ill effects of alcoholism among college students.
after uh, pre uh, post is the moderate uh, knowledge of 40 percentage of they had a moderate level of knowledge discussion of the study was and first objectives a pre test and inadequate uh, adequate knowledge of 53.3 percentage after post test after interventions and 60 samples 57 percentage have adequate knowledge and the second using the self structured administered questionnaire post test was done plan teaching program was given pamphlets were distributed to the students and third objective is post test 57 percentage had adequate knowledge now conclusion of the study was 57 percentage had adequate knowledge there is a significant improvement in knowledge among the college students pamphlets were distributed to the all the students effective appropriate and feasible mode to develop the knowledge regarding the effects of alcoholism among college students a reference from the book uh, uh, sources of that adequate uh, reference from this content and journal website thank you for listening right and that was our last um pre-recorded video that was sent to us and yeah i believe ram dip will be yeah we'll be presenting tomorrow all right um thank you i would like to thank our session session chairs for today and also congratulations to all the presenters who shared their valuable time and um, researches with us and we will continue tomorrow for a day two of this conference um see you all same time tomorrow guys once again your moderator jojo see you tomorrow bye bye